you know, we don't know those demons. So I, I just ask, like, hey, go go grab your battle buddy. I know the previous, uh, you know, Staff Sergeant McCade was on prior to, and he, he stressed us as well. But we've all got a battle buddy. We've all got several. You know, go talk to him. I know I, I sent a text to a, a brother of mine um, just because we had not been able to contact each other. We've kind of been hit, missing each other for the last couple of weeks. And I just said, hey, brother, I love you. You know, I'm looking forward to, to talking to you when, when I get to. But, man, it's just life's so short. And, and we've all been through different stressors in our lives. And um, we've all gotten that phone call. And, you know, for me to get that phone call today, you know, really sucked. And, and you know, I, I just, you know, I just stress like, hey, it, nothing's too bad that you can't live through it alone. And, you know, you're not going to be at a place where those decisions is these irreversible decisions need to be the solution to your problem because they're not. So, um, Hey, for, for what it's worth, you know, I, I really appreciate what you did. Um, you wore the uniform or, or you didn't, you, you decided to tune into this podcast. Um, but Hey, we love you. And, and there's no, there's no real good reason for you to, to make a permanent, a permanent um, solution to a, uh, to a very temporary problem. So that's really all I want to say. And, and I really appreciate Andrew giving the opportunity to, to speak a little bit. Uh, I was definitely distracted with that on this, but I know we got through some really good, uh, some good content when it came to uh, talking about what you have to offer in the civilian world and then to get someone's personal experience as to how they transition and what happens when your plan doesn't quite go um, exactly um, as, as thought. So uh, lo love you all that have worn the uniform and, and those that haven't that are joining us. Uh, appreciate everyone. And Andrew, thanks for giving us the time to talk today. Hey, you bet. Hey, thanks for uh, that was a that was let me just come on real quick that that I actually wasn't expecting. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good audio. OK, Good. Uh, I wasn't expecting that that PowerPoint that that, that was amazing. I, I mean, I really want to actually follow up on that. That's some powerful information you gave. And, and uh, thanks for bringing Reed on. It just really helps connect the dots uh, and really brings, you know, truth to the situation and uh, so I'm sure a lot of people were watching and, you know, and thanks for sharing that last bit right there. You know, we've started the day actually with irreverent warriors. And so definitely talking about, um, about that subject. And so, uh, yeah, sorry to hear that. Um, yeah. And, uh, glad to hear the word love, you know, cause we try to, to love all our brothers and sisters and those in, in, uh, uniform and out. So, but yeah, man, I'm looking forward to being out in Arizona. You know, I'm not a big gun shooter i'm sorry uh uh but definitely you know we can uh meet up and uh, i look forward to meeting you in person so thanks for being on the parade deck if you guys want to learn more about nishan and his his business gunfighter.com which wow how did you get that domain for one that's amazing um yeah how did you get that was it just available no it was not available it took us uh it took us about three years to convince the person that owned it that they needed to sell it to us um oh it was a, it was gosh. a three-year so process yeah <laughs> wow that is okay good to know i was gonna say because I, I i was looking it up and i was like oh couldn't this be gunfighter.com i mean that's an amazing website and i'm like oh my gosh it is so um but you know i was just texting with regan out there at gallup and uh i'm like hey i'm on with the gunfighter and he's like oh my gosh i i wish i would have remembered that was going to be on so all right brother have a good right uh, evening um we're gonna run some uh, clips on american warriors and then we've got four or five we've got jackie coming on kelly coming on courtney uh from okinawa is coming on gonna talk about some ocs fitness prep uh we've got joey leading this you got meech coming on so a lot of amazing people left for the evening so all right brother i'll talk to you later thanks andrew see you all right so all right so that was great that was a lot that was a wonderful information uh i'm definitely going to see if he'll let us get that powerpoint that he went through because that you know he put a he put a lot of work into that uh, i'm not sure how often he uses it uh, i feel honored if he just did it for us but um but yeah what a powerful powerpoint and presentation uh he really brings an a game you can you can tell that he's you know a marine working in reserve running his own business and, and during that whole conversation with reed all i was thinking of like how you know like 
how incredible it is to be the founder and CEO of such a, a, an amazing company and just the culture he's built and his ability to communicate and lead. And I think that's really difficult. I don't have a big team myself. We're in the tech world. It's a little bit different, uh, but I have a lot of respect for entrepreneurs that that can manage that. I mean, because there is a lot that goes on behind the scenes with a business and especially uh, with the type of uh, business that he is in with regulations and policy and safety and security, uh, let alone all the financing and funding and employment. So so what a testimony to uh, the ability for someone to actually do that. And I'm sure he won't mind definitely if you reach out to him with questions. Uh, if you're a business owner, I mean, man, reach out to him. He's probably got some nuggets for you. So, all right, we're going to roll into, I got Jamie backstage and she is going to play. We're, we've picked three amazing episodes of American Warriors, and we are going to play those back to back. They're about 20 minutes a piece. And then we got Courtney coming on from, I think she's in Okinawa, but she's coming on. She is going to be talking about um, OCS fitness prep and a lot about nutrition. And so she is a, she's got a lot of letters after her name. And so she's really important. So she knows what she's talking about. Uh, she's on a lot of our social media platforms, uh, working with a lot of clients, whether you're in the military or not, whether you're a runner or just looking to improve uh, your fitness re uh, regimen and your nutrition. So don't miss out on that. And then we've got a lot of people uh, following that. So, all right, I will turn it over to Jamie and you can roll the, the videos. During my career in the Marine Corps while I was in Okinawa, I started my martial arts training there and pretty much been with it uh, since then. Uh, took a little bit of a break from karate for a while after I had retired, picked it back up probably in early 2000s. So I've been in this, uh, in this system here now for about 21 years. We did a lot of fighting. Um, took a lot of shots to the head. Over the years, that starts uh, adding up. It starts taking its toll on the brain. And I started noticing it probably about six or seven years into my time as the VSO. Before I got into what I'm doing now, I was the veteran service officer in Cherokee County for nine and a half years. And learning what I did in the Marine Corps about not quitting. And, and like I would explain to people, I am not a gracious loser. So I just choose not to. And so I would tell all my vets that. That and, and what I did in the Marine Corps as an analyst helped me do a better job as a veteran service officer because I could take and look at what we've got and where we want to be and draw that line to how to get there. I enjoyed what I did. Uh, I hated when I had to, to leave that job, um, but it, it kind of got me to where I am you know, today. I had to leave as the veteran service officer because of all the concussions I'd had. Um, at least six or eight as a kid growing up. I know three of them I lost consciousness over. And then in 20 years of fighting in martial arts, I've obviously had more concussions. Uh, I had reached a point to where I could no longer remember how to do my job. Um, I kept having to ask my assistant how to do things that I learned in my first year as a veteran service officer. I couldn't remember people's names. I'd have to go back and 
look at all their stuff to see what we had done. Um, I mean, my memory was just gone. Um, I would be trying to hold a conversation with someone and and I would stop in mid-sentence and be done with the conversation because I didn't know anymore where I was going with it. When you realize you're losing your mind and there's nothing you can do about it, you kind of wonder what your future is going to be like. And I didn't see a very bright future for me at that point. So I retired in December of 17. In January of 2018, I got a text from a friend of mine told me about a seminar. So I went to this seminar and kind of sat there and listened to it. And most of it was just meaningless to me. It was boring. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't fit me in any way, shape, or form. And then they talked about uh, at the last little bit of a study that they did with a group of Marines in the VA Medical Center in San Diego. And they had a Marine Master Gunny there talk about how he had dealt with PTSD and TBI for five and a half years. He was telling his story and he had been blown up twice. He had PTSD and two TBIs and he'd been dealing with them for about five and a half years. Migraines because of the TBI, he'd get up at two o'clock in the morning, take his sumatriptan, try and go back to bed and get some rest. Um, and most of the guys that have PTSD realize, you know, you get maybe two or three hours of sleep a night and that's about it. Uh, the rest of it's just trying to go to sleep. Um, and he got to be one of the guys that got selected to be in this study that the VA was, the VA was testing this equipment out. And after his first treatment, he got up at two o'clock in the morning, like he always did, and he went in to take his sumatriptan. And as he reaches up to get his sumatriptan, he stopped and kind of thought, he says, wait a minute, I don't have a headache. So he put it back and he went back and went to bed and he actually slept. So the next morning he gets up and he calls these guys up that did the treatments on him and says, what did you guys do to me last night? And they go, uh, but, uh, but are you okay? Are you all right? Is anything wrong? He said, no. He says, for the first time in five and a half years, I slept. For the first time in five and a half years, I didn't wake up with a migraine. And so I'm listening to this guy going, hmm, I wonder if this will help. And then after it was all over with, I went up and asked him and said, hey, look, here's my deal. Laid it out for him. Boatloads of concussions. Don't sleep. No memory. Is it going to help me? He said, yeah, it will. I said, okay, I'm in. I went through a series of the sessions, uh, and it helped me out a lot. I mean, it brought me my life back. It gave me back my ability to process, to think, to speak. My memory's still not so great, but you know, it probably never was really all that great anyway, but that's okay. But it brought a purpose back to my life. It gave me something to start looking into to be able to start going back to helping vets because my, my heart is being able to help people out. When people get PTSD, one of the things that's going on, and it's like so many of the combat vets, they're always operating at that fight or flight mode. And the hypothalamus in the brain is just spinning, dumping all these hormones into the body. You know, for most of us, you know, when something, when something jumps out at us, you know, we get that rush of adrenaline, we're ready to fight or run or whatever. And then after a couple of minutes, everything calms down, we're back to normal. These guys with PTSD, all these hormones are being dumped into their body all day, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The body wasn't meant to handle all these hormones all the time. And so what those hormones do is they cause a lot of problems with the rest of the body. It can cause heart problems, cause liver, kidney, uh, the insomnia, uh, causes a lot of the same types of issues, you know, problems with the heart, problems with the brain, co problems with cognition. There are just so many areas of everyday life that, that gets adversely affected. When you stop the hypothalamus from spinning and dumping all those hormones into the body, and these people start calming down and settling down. They just like take a breath and they go like, wow, there is peace in the world, so to speak. 
you know, or at least in between their ears, you know, in their mind, they're finally able to relax. They're finally able to uh, go through their daily life without worrying about everything that's going around, going on around them. You know, when's, when's the next guy going to jump out from around the corner and try to shoot me? Or, you know, when am I going to get abused again? Or, you know, whatever their issue or their problem was, they don't, they don't have to worry about that anymore. It's called microcurrent neurofeedback therapy. What we do is we clean places on the scalp and then we'll hook the leads up to them and then we'll move them around in different places. The power level that we're using to get to the brain is so low, it's not enough to penetrate the skull. So we have to use neural pathways in the scalp to get to the brain. What we're doing is we're retraining the brain on how to fire correctly. Because anytime the brain goes through some kind of a trauma, and it doesn't matter if it's a, a trauma that's from from wartime, from abuse, somebody you know in a serious automobile accident, doesn't matter where that trauma comes from. It all affects the brain similarly. So Lisa and I met at an ISIS presentation in December of 2018. She had a reboot program, and I had the ISIS equipment. And so we got to talking and decided that we could form our own company called Anim Car Wellness. So we're part of the Camp V network of partners working together to help vets. So I'm Travis Gladhill, a retired Air Force veteran of 22 years. Did multiple deployments to both Iraq and Afghanistan. 2005, if I remember correctly. I was in Iraq, 90, went off in uh, close proximity to a Humvee that I was in. Basically got uh, knocked around a little bit. Uh, fortunately enough, uh, it was it was in close proximity, but not close enough to, uh, you know, kill anyone. They call it con concussive blast. It rocked the vehicles. It rocked, you know, everyone in the vehicle. Uh, smacked the head around. Did notice, you know, after the deployment, I was having a lot of headaches. Lots of ringing in the ears, and, you know, got checked out. Sure enough, the doc said that I probably had a concussion, you know, from the blast or possibly smacking my head against the inside of the, the Humvee. Didn't really start getting treatment for it until I met Dave, uh, and then he offered this service. It definitely helped, especially with uh, uh, some of the ringing in the ears with concentration. Still get the headaches, but it's a lot more manageable now. Once we bring the brain back into alignment and get it to where it's firing correctly, people can can keep their anxiety and their depression. They can bring those, we can bring those levels down to a point where they can keep them under control and they can function in life. They don't have to worry about, you know, what am I gonna do when I go, you know, to Walmart and go shopping, you know, and and you know, something happens, am I gonna blow up? Am I gonna punch somebody out? You know, am I even gonna be able to stand being around that many people? But it's amazing how, um, how the body and the brain were designed, everything was designed to heal. And when we are given what we need to heal, the brain can heal. Even guys that have dealt with PTSD for 30, 40 plus years, we can help them to heal. My biggest and best accomplishment for me is being able to put a family back together. When you can take a veteran that can't, can't be with his family, can't be with his wife, can't be with his kids, you know, they're all afraid of him. They're all scared of him. And when you can turn that around and you can change his life, you can reduce his stress, you can reduce his anxiety, you can reduce his depression, you can get him away from suicidal ideations, and you can put that family unit back together. What, what more could you ask for than helping to repair a family?
So I got this car about eight months ago. And in that eight months, I put about 50,000 miles on it. Going to see vets in different places and helping take care of them, guys that can't get out. Doing a lot of driving, going to see uh, guys up in uh, Winsboro and Quitman, Lindale. It's a pretty amazing feeling to know that, that I have been blessed enough to be able to help somebody regain their life. Because I mean, that's what happened with me. Somebody was able to bless me enough that I was able to regain my life. And now I get to do that with other people. When you can take people out of that kind of a situation and you can bring them back to life, basically. To me, that's, that's what I'm here for. I was born in Grants Pass, Oregon. Small town, Southern Oregon. Grew up doing a lot of hunting, a lot of outdoor stuff. But I didn't really have like these wild ambitions uh, of what I wanted to be when I grew up. I went out for every sport. I think I got cut off of every sports team in school. I learned how to like, I guess, take uh, my limitations and try to figure out what was gonna, you know, sports wasn't it. So I think it translated again into like prepping me mentally for doing something beyond that. When I found something that I was good at, I exploited it. And I think that was the Marines. Joined the Marines at 17, went in on the delayed entry program, and I turned 18 right before I went to boot camp. I joined the Marine Corps to be a grunt. That was what I signed up to do. That was my MOS from to start. And then um, during boot camp, Desert Storm kicked off. On the 24th of February, 1991, a coalition of allied nations launched a massive ground assault against Iraqi army units occupying Kuwait. Went to Marine combat training shortly thereafter that, and then I went to the School of Infantry. Then I got dropped to my unit, and then we deployed overseas. It didn't really hit till we went through the straits, and then we have a plane flying beside the ship with a um, mine clearing device on it. And we're like, oh, this is for real. And then they start mounting the 50 cows on the sides of the ship. And you're like, wow, this is going to be interesting. We land in Kuwait City, and it's just, it's just smashed. There's bullet holes everywhere in every building, boats on the side. It was a place where 
as the Iraqis were trying to leave Kuwait City, they just unleashed everything on them. The A-10s, F-15s, everything. They were bombing the heck out of everything. Iraqi military units in Kuwait were crushed within a matter of days. Images of hundreds of burned out vehicles littering the highway leading to Iraq provided partial evidence of the route in the desert. You could sense death. You could feel it. This guy picked up a boot and shook it and a foot fell out. And you're like, wow, <laughs> this is insane. We did like this big fire exercise at night. It's kind of like a big muscle flex, like, hey, there's more of us out here than are. Got up online and then just started opening up with all small arms and then grenades and then. You generally you'd do like a combat load of like a tracer every six rounds. I think we were doing like one in like three just because it looked cool. It literally looked like you could walk across the, the tracers. There were some trucks and stuff that were out there that had been left behind. And I don't know if there was an attempt to come get some of their equipment, but that was what we were blowing up. It was incredible fun. And then we just ran back. <laughs> it's like, let's go, let's get out of here. The little muscle flex, the little show off that you know made it look like we just had thousands of guys out there when we had about 100. So we leave the Persian Gulf and they're having problems in Somalia with these warlords that were stealing all the aid packages that the United States was sent over and they were killing some of the aid workers. We did a amphibious landing, um, did a little patrol inland, just kind of like, hey, we're here watching you guys and probably should stop doing that. And then shortly thereafter, Black Hawk Down happened in Mogadishu. So it was kind of a bummer because we had probably had an opportunity to go get them and that would have not happened, but. There was a lot going on in the world with Iraq and there was a lot going on with, you know, with the pirating. So they, it worked out really good because I got to go to a lot of cool schools. It put me in a position to go to some really good schools. And then in that time, I got to go to Advanced Infantry Squad Leader course. Um, it's physical. It's a lot of advanced land nav, night land navigation. And I ended up with a, an amazing group of dudes on my squad. And we ended up winning. We had the overall winning squad. So I did that. Went to Mountain Warfare School in Bridgeport. And then I go on my second deployment. We actually flew to Okinawa and then they developed a non-combatant evacuation liaison element, which is like, they called it an LC force. So there's 16 of us. The mission was we would fly into an embassy or a building, take it down, and then secure the ambassador, and then burn anything that needed to be burned, and then exfil out. So I got to go to helicopter, it's called the HRST school, um, helicopter rope suspension training, and I got to do the master qualification course. We would fly in on a Huey or a 46 or a 53, depending on how many people we were gonna take, fast rope onto the roof, and we'd be the first team in, clear it, secure it, um, and then we would spy rig off which is a 120 foot rope, hangs out the bottom of a helicopter with rings in it. You have a harness on, clip into it, and the helicopter takes off, Then you just fly underneath it. And so that's how we got out of there. Our company Gunny, who I did not like, liked me. And he goes, hey, uh, Corporal Prevet, you wanna go to uh, California with me for a couple of months. I was like, mm -mm. no, sir, I don't. He said, no, we'll have fun. I'm like, there's no, nobody has fun with you. There's no, there's no fun to be had there. So what it ended up being was um, they took a, they took guys from our platoon. We were 
being inserted to go find these like marijuana grows out of uh, in between, basically in between Bakersfield and Oxnard, California. So we would go in, they would drop us off, we'd do patrols, try to find you know these uh, these grows and drug operations, these cartel operations, and then just report back. I had an action-packed four years. It was a lot. I was super fortunate. They let me do a ton of stuff. This was on the USS. Tuscaloosa. Couldn't make it on a baseball team, but hell in a gunfight. <laughs> this is the inside of the track. Soaking wet. There's probably 90 degrees and 100% humidity. The water, I remember the ocean water was so warm. This was actually in Hong Kong. We went to Hong Kong twice, and I just couldn't believe the buildings. They'd build these buildings with bamboo scaffolding. 18 different countries. Went around the world three times, and I had never been to New York. This was spy rigging, special patrol insertion and extraction. The CH-46 with a 120-foot rope, and you never got in the helicopter. You just flew below it. That's me on the bottom. Now having a son, I don't think I've ever shown him these. I don't want him to be interested in it yet. It's a lot of good times, but it can be it can be bad too. You, know, you don't have to go to a war, a full scale conflict to go and do really fun stuff. So 1994, um, me and another guy. We got selected to be representatives from 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, 1st Marine Division. And we flew on a C-130 to Peleliu. We knew we were kind of going there for um, a reunion, but we didn't really know what it was. But it ended up being they, were, they flew about 15 veterans on the 50th anniversary of the invasion of Peleliu. We went there and greeted them and then escorted them as we walked through the little town. And one was Captain Land. He landed with, I think, a 230 Marines. By the time they cleared the beach, they had 90. When they, they sent him up onto this hill with his, he was taking, he just was describing it, he was taking enemy machine gun fire from three sides as he was going up, killing the Japanese in the bunker emplacements with his guys. And by the time they came down, there was eight left of this whole company. So I didn't really realize it was an honor flight at the time. I was just going there as a representative from First Marines. And so we had this big ceremony there, and it was really cool. And we got to talk to these guys about, you know, Bloody Nose Ridge and um, all these different amazing, you know, battle sites. And so that was kind of my first introduction into what became honor flight. When I had heard about Honor Flight, I thought, man, that would be neat to go take World War II veterans to DC. So this was in May of 2015. I went on this Honor Flight with 50 World War II veterans. Went on another flight, it was better, did pretty good. And then both the people that originally had started it uh, walked away. So I took it over. And then I've been running it with our team for the past four years. I think I've been able to take a little over 200, be a part of 200 guys going back to DC. It's pretty awesome. We start getting applications in the mail, then we take first come, first serve, and then by conflict. Uh, we take our World War II veterans first, and then Korea, and then Vietnam. 
we call and we work rates with hotels back in DC and we get a bus and then we, or we get the food and we order the food and then get all those kinds of like the big things done and then we start picking off the small things. We get the bags and we get the hand sanitizer and the masks and the candy. Then we contact all the schools in the area and ask them to write letters for a mail call. We used to sit here for hours and we will stuff envelopes. We make sure everybody has letters to open on the flight home. What drives me is, is you know, their service that they did for us, for our nation, for our families. Um, and I am very grateful. I just want to make sure it's a good time for them and let them have some closure and, and some relief. So it really means the world to me. You have all this work put in all this time and then at, at two o'clock in the morning it's a light switch and now it's go time now you hope you did everything right your effort is now going to show to 58 people have them come up there and do it and then grab them then have them go back to the seat and grab the next set okay. but we want to get everybody sat okay we're in go right ahead all right you guys are next We'd like to thank you for flying with us today. And one last thank you to our special guests on board today. We do thank you for your service. We would like to welcome our honor flight, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. If you can give them a warm welcome when they come up here, we appreciate it. Thank you. People that are at Reagan waiting for their flight to go out uh, all stand up and all uh, welcome these guys to DC and the, the applause and the it's just it's incredible it's so cool to see that thank you guys thank you guys thank you I never expected that just now Oh, Jesus. Made my whole friggin' life right there, I'll tell you. Oh. Every single time, it just kills me. It's what it's about. And it starts that emotional roller coaster right out of the gate. I would like to welcome you all to Washington, D.C. Thank you guys for coming. I know it's kind of a, it's kind of a haul all the way out here to D.C. Um, but again, thank you and uh, we really appreciate everything that you guys have done for this country and your service. There's so much to see there, and we're only there for a short amount of time. I like to try to show them everything. And I think just even seeing the buildings um, helps them, like, taking the enormity of it. So kind of my goal while we're there is to see is get their eyes on as many things as possible. We come here because the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, it's what they raised their right hand to support and defend. things I think that are really big is when we go to the Lincoln Memorial, we go to Korea, and then we go over to Vietnam. That two hours is insane. Um, it's one of those events, it's one of those things that I think hits everybody. When you, when you take these veterans to these places, um, and that was their conflict, how they see that, how they feel like they're being remembered, they're blown away. It 
the emotional toll that Vietnam took on not only the veterans, but on our country was immense. And there's so much emotion there. It's arguably the plainest memorial there, but I think it carries the most weight. I think it holds the most emotion. I think it holds the most pain because it's all intimate because of the names on the wall. And it's a huge healing thing. I, I think that our goal uh, is to take as many guys back to D.C. as we can to give them that, that welcome home that they didn't get. It's one last mission with those same kind of guys. They know what you put into it by how they feel when they get back. All these little things that, you know, the reflection and the healing, all the things that go on during the flight. <clears throat> But when you get back and you get the letters in the mail, and they're like, that was awesome. It makes it all worth it. I've been able to help facilitate 200 guys healing. Um, that's, a, that's pretty big, that's a big accomplishment. And I, I'm proud of it, I am, but it's like the work's not done yet. Not everybody's got that feeling, so you kind of want to keep going until they, until they all feel that way, until they all get a welcome home. We're, we're proud as a, as a team of what we've been able to do, but there's some work left to do. Hog zero one has the white smoke in sight. Force confirmed that that's the enemy. My targeting pod is set to infrared at the time, so everything is white hot. And I see a large flash, like a really bright flash in it, which typically means something very, very hot, like an explosion or something like that. And I immediately hover over the mic button on the on the throttle, expecting to hear somebody's about to start talking. What's that? We see your safe. I see your safe. Bring it in. Bring it in. Good copy. We're still taking fire. Smoke is being tossed. The JTAC comes on, he's like, hey, we got our front element, the troops in contact right now. A barricaded shooter that just shot an RPG at him. Hog, be advised, we are still taking fire. Turned out what I saw, that bright flash I saw was the, the motor from the rocket propelled grenade coming out of that. Okay, do you see the building due south of the smoke, about 100 meters, that is our target. And so when he, dis when he says that, uh, I just come back with something effective like, copy, you know, I just saw a bright flash in the vicinity of building 151, and he comes back and he was like, yes, that's it, that's where they are. Problem was, is their explosive ordnance technician that's with the ground team uh, was injured in the blast, and, they, and at the time they were thinking it was bad, and now we have a U.S. casualty. So now my whole job in life is like, protect the friendlies that are over there, protect the helicopters to get them there, and then take care of the initial threat. We're able to get the helicopter in, basically no issues. They get to it, get to a landing zone, and then as the uh, as the team basically gets outside of that danger close range from the target, we're able to employ on the building. Hog zero one is in hot. That's clear. You're clear. High. Go high.
My name's uh, Major Hayden Fulham. Uh, I go by Gator. I'm uh, right now. I'm the the commander and the pilot for U.S. Air Force's A-10 demonstration team. Major Fulham is now positioning the A-10 for a pass down the show line. Five, four, three, eight. Heavy personnel in the open. At show center, no mark. So there's a deep, rich heritage of aviation uh, with our family, and it's something that, that carries over to me and my younger brother, and some something that makes us uh, very proud to continue serving today. So some of my earliest memories as as a child were listening to stories about Wayne and Roger, my two grandfathers, who were both fighter pilots in the Air Force and both served during Vietnam. Wayne was ultimately shot down and killed uh, during the Vietnam War, and Roger was shot down a few months later and spent the remaining five years as a prisoner of war before he before he returned home. My biological grandfather, Wayne Fulham, was his name. He was also an F-105 pilot during Vietnam and was a good friend of Rogers, of who became my grandfather. Uh, and in November 1967, he was shot down and killed uh, just north of Hanoi flying an F-105. I believe it was his 34th, uh, 34th mission. Um, they were doing one of the Iron Hand missions as far as surface air threats. That was some of the most heavily defended territory in the world uh, at the time. So some of the most dangerous flying you could possibly do. He gets hit when they're over, uh, over Kep. Uh, he tries to make it to the Gulf of Tonkin to punch out over the water because he knows that's the best chance of survival is if you can get out over the water, there's naval assets out there. Um, basically, he's not able to make it out to the water uh, and he, he ejects, gets out of the airplane and uh, that's basically the last anyone's ever heard or seen from him. The other folks that are flying with him, they see him, they see he has a good parachute, they see his parachute go into the trees uh, and the story kind of stops there uh, for a number of years. So then. You fast forward, so once the Vietnamese was letting U.S. officials into the country uh, to find the remains of service members, my grandfather Wayne, uh, he, he was some of the earliest from remains that were identified. They identified his remains in, uh, in 1987, and his funeral was back home in January of 1988. So my mom was pregnant with me uh, at his funeral that they did at the National Cemetery in, in Chattanooga. Probably my dad and his brothers may have a very different outlook and, a, and, and view on it, but to me it was, um, I, I shouldn't say celebrated. It wasn't like something that was celebrated, but it was something that, that we were very proud of, you know, and something that, um, that they, it was something that they both believed heavily in, uh, and that meant a lot. And that certainly carried over, over to us as well. Uh, even as a young kid, I loved everything about the A-10. Kind of a goofy airplane, an ugly airplane that carries a big gun in the front of it. Like I thought that, that kind of spoke to me and appealed to me. Uh, and so I was fortunate enough to get selected to fly the A-10 out of pilot training. I went to my first assignment in uh, Moody Air Force Base, flying in the 75th Fighter Squadron, uh, which is the A-10s uh, of the 23rd Fighter Group that had the shark teeth on the front of them uh, and have all the lineage back to the American Volunteer Group flying P-40s with the shark teeth on them. So uh, a lot of really cool uh, squadron heritage there uh, and getting to fly A-10s with teeth on them doesn't get much cooler than that. Within about a month of showing up to the squadron, we deployed to Southern Turkey and for Operation Inherent Resolve and we're fighting ISIS in Northern Iraq and Northern Syria uh, for six months. Once we got there, we didn't waste any time. I think uh, between getting in country and my first combat sortie, I, was, I think I was only there two days or something like that, and then I started flying uh, pretty much right away. Uh, it was a really dynamic situation going on over there. ISIS had really taken a stronghold in northern Iraq and northern Syria, and they had claimed Raqqa as their basically their uh, world capital. Turkey at the time was a uh, pretty volatile and dangerous place, uh, but with the, the, the wild thing was when we first got there, um, folks that were permanently stationed there at Insur Lake, uh, the U.S. forces that are that were permanently stationed there still had their families there. So like while we're, you know, in tan flight suits and we're got bombs hanging on our jets every day and full load of guns and all the things that you associate with combat. When we go to the, you know, go to the chow hall on base to eat, well, you see like moms with their double strollers and kids and pushing them around base, uh, which was a really wild experience because we're living on an Air Force base, like it's got it's got a commissary, it's got a BX, and it's got families there. And they, you know, you see kids running around riding their scooters down the sidewalk, but we just happen to go to the other side of the base and then go fly combat missions every day. So it was a weird dynamic to be like, 
to to have that that odd shift and think like within a one hour flight of where we're sitting right now like you have some of the most evil people on earth doing I mean, some of the most grotesque things and we're here we are like this is a it was a really weird a uh, really weird parallel and in the six months we were there uh it went from that to uh turning into more of a deployed environment all the families were sent home and then you'd go to uh, you'd go to the chow hall and now there's the big concrete T walls like block, you know, barricaded around the chow hall and see, uh, you know, it, it looked a little more like a, a Ford operating location and less like a uh, stateside uh, military base. You train and you work so hard to get proficient in the airplane so that you can protect the folks on the ground that you're there to protect. And here you are, like here I am getting to do it as a brand spanking new lieutenant uh, in a fighter squadron. Um, so in a lot of ways it was really really gratifying and really kind of self-fulfilling time uh and i and i say that i say that kind of sparingly because there's nothing there's nothing really that gratifying about like going to combat and dropping bombs on people or anything like that but uh uh but when you're when you're helping the right people it feels good at the end of the day for sure so ended up getting about five about 500 combat hours uh in that first deployment and um a little over i don't remember exactly a little over 60 combat missions uh, in the six months that i was there Five, four, you're clear top. Here they come again! Yeah. <laughs> it was an interesting dynamic changing from that first deployment to the second one, because the first one, like I said, I'm the newest, youngest guy in the squadron, and then in my my next deployment, I'm, you know, I've got, I don't know, at the time, probably 15, 1600 hours in the A-10, and uh, about to be an instructor in the airplane, and. Uh, have one combat deployment under my belt and all that kind of thing. So it was a huge, like a huge shift in mentality uh, and, and a different mission, uh, you know, kind of mission set they were doing. But but it's interesting to like go back and think about that first one, the first deployment and, you know, how green I really was and how much I was learning. Not to say I wasn't continually learning on the second one, but the, the second one I came in with a whole a whole different bag of bag of tricks and bag of experience uh, that, uh, that paid dividends. Yeah. One of the most memorable uh, missions from that second deployment, like once we're in Afghanistan, like I said, now I've uh, got a little more experience in the airplane, a little more comfortable, and certainly you know, more comfortable being in a deployed environment. But uh, so my younger brother flies the A-10 as well. We're in the same squadron, and we actually deployed together to Afghanistan, and I've flown uh, combat missions with my little brother as my wingman, which is pretty, uh, pretty unique, pretty remarkable. And at the time, his wife also flies the A-10. All three of us were in the same squadron at the time, and we all three deployed to Afghanistan together in the same squadron, which was uh, which is pretty remarkable at the time. I hadn't heard anybody tell me of other times I knew of that happening. And so we ended up we ended up flying together uh, a handful of times. And I was pretty nervous the first time we flew together because I was like, man, this is, you know, not only am I keeping, not only am I responsible for, you know, my wingman now, because I'm the flight lead out there. It's like, not only am I responsible for whoever's out here flying on my wing and keeping them safe and making sure we don't get ourselves any, you know, any, anything silly, uh, but now it's my brother so it's like it's a little bit added dynamic there uh and so the first time i wasn't sure how i was going to feel about it. the first time we flew together we'd flown together before uh home station but but of course like first time flying in combat together after the first time flying together i was like okay no we're good i'm, I'm okay with this for sure where well, we ended up flying together i don't know five six seven times uh through the course of, of that first portion portion of the deployment uh and i got i was his flight lead the first time he dropped a bomb in combat the first time he shot the gun in combat so uh, pretty, pretty remarkable thing to get to experience with with your brother for sure, um, and, and an exciting thing to be a part of too. Uh, but yeah, one, one of the more memorable ones was the first bomb he dropped in combat was uh, was uh, was a pretty pretty push it up like pretty push it up sortie. We were supporting some folks just north of Kandahar, supporting a team from the 2nd Ranger Battalion, and they're going to be clearing through this village. And so we were there for uh, just after they had been infilled by the helicopters. Uh, they, had already, they were already on the ground by the time we show up. The way these Afghan villages are built up, it's just a complex just mess down there. And all the buildings look exactly the same, and you know, so it can be kind of difficult to keep track of where everyone's at. And then early on in the sortie, they, uh, they no joke, start taking fire from this big tree line. A controller on the ground uh, speaks to us, gives us all the information we need to prosecute an attack on a target. 
uh, the way that kind of our tactics were set up and the way I had briefed that the game plan was going to be was uh, my brother, you know, he was my number two and he was going to be our primary bomb dropper. So my do my job was to dope out whatever the situation was going to be. And then he's my hired gun. I'm going to translate all the information that he needs to put it in his jet so he can af effectively put the weapon where it needs to go. I said something to the effect of like, all right, man, here's your time to shine. Because I'm the one using like the trucker comment, uh, not using very good brevity in the airplane. He just comes back with a real sharp toot, which is the response I would expect from him. So I was like, okay, good. He's got his mind in the right place. We have eyes on this tree line uh, really, really quick. Um, we can't see any of the muzzle, muzzle flashes or anything like that. This is during the daytime, uh, so we can't see anything, but uh, we're, you know, I described the tree line that they talked me onto. I say, hey, this is what I'm seeing, and they confirm really quick. Yeah, if you're on the right spot, what we want to put is to, we want to put, uh, put two bombs on each side of, the, of each side of that tree line. And so he rolls in, puts two bombs exactly where they needed to be. Uh, and the shooting immediately stops and and uh we know hey like we did you know we took care of the guys out here we've done some good work i can't speak for him and his airplane but i, ma I imagine he got those kind of like pre-game jitters out a little bit and he's like okay yeah here we are now we're, we're ready to work and then uh and then we fast forward a couple hours we've been to this tank around oh, at least once by this time we're back overhead i just happen to be looking at what i think is you know very front friendly element and i'm doing this in my targeting pod which i have set to infrared at the time so everything white in it is hot and i see a large flash like a really bright flash in it which typically means something very very hot like an explosion or something like that and i immediately hover over the mic button on the on the throttle expecting to hear somebody's about to start talking because i i don't know is that a good flash is that a bad flash was that a breaching charge for them to get into a building and it felt like a really long time but i bet if i go back if i were to hear it again it's probably like three seconds you know it's probably a very short amount of time and rise i'm about to key the mic to, to ask them the jtac comes on he's like hey we got our front element their troops in contact right now copy. We're still taking fire. Smoke is being a barricaded shooter that just shot an rpg at him turned out what i saw that bright flash i saw was the the motor from the rocket propelled grenade and so when he just when he says that uh, I just come back with, you know, I just saw a bright flash in the vicinity of building 151 and he comes back and he was like, yes, that's it. That's where they are. And I know this is probably going to, this thing may pick up a little bit. So immediately I tell uh, my brother, I tell him like, hey, you need to call the tanker, go get gas now. Because what I don't want to happen is for both of us to be low on fuel and we both have to leave them. And now we're leaving these guys high and dry. So I send him immediately. My objective is like, I'm going to dope out this whole scenario for him. I'm going to send him all the information. Okay, do you see the building due south of the smoke, about 100 meters? That is our target. So the second he's overhead, he's ready to roll in at a moment's notice or he can employ weapons. Basically, we execute that exact plan. He's overhead. He's ready. Uh, I head uh, to the tanker. Problem was, is their uh, EOD technician, the explosive ordnance technician that's with the ground team, uh, was injured in the blast. And they, and at the time, they were thinking it was bad. But now we have a U.S. casualty. So now my whole job in life is like, now we need to keep the helicopter safe. Like we. We, we don't want to turn one injured person into a lot of injured people or uh, into a downed aircraft. So now it's securing the landing zones where they plan on going and, in, and then the route for to get the friendlies to the helicopter. That's all I'm worried about now. We're able to get the helicopter in basically with no issues. They get to a, get to a landing zone. And then as the, uh, as the team basically gets outside of that danger close range from the target, we're able to employ on the building. Dog zero one is dead hot. That's clear, you're clear to hide, go hide. eventually get the uh get the eod tech onto onto the helicopter but by that night he was in germany and was in surgery uh in a hospital in germany and we ultimately got the word a couple days later that he you know he he made it and he was he was going to recover fine I think it was the next day me and my brother both were sitting there like at the ops in our in our ops building uh and the phone rings in the intel shop where our intelligence folks work uh and it's the jtac we were working with the day prior and uh, he just wanted to know, hey, is, you know, whatever call sign, Hog 53 is Hog 53 around from yesterday? And they look on the schedule and they see that was us. And down he's like, hey, guys, just want to let you know, like, if you guys weren't there, like, we may not have made it back. So just want to thank you guys kind of thing. And that was like the pinnacle. Like, that was the absolute peak of my time in the A-10. It was like, that's, that's, that right there is what it's all about. That's all I told him. It was like, hey, you know, you're the whole reason we exist. You're the whole, the whole reason we do what we do. 
you'll see an you see an old saying at a lot of A-10 squadrons. It says the the mission is the 18 year old on the ground with a rifle. Everything else is support, and we view you know view ourselves that way. Um, mm-hmm. So, but that was a that was a, a full circle moment for sure. And then the fact that I got to do that with my younger brother on my wing that was pretty uh, that was a pretty wild time. Mm-hmm. How I ended up uh, getting hired on to be the demonstration pilot, uh, like a lot of, like a lot of things in the military, a little bit, of, you know, dumb luck and timing. I knew it existed, but I didn't know a whole lot about the demonstration team and really what the mission is. Because flying in air shows and flying in the military uh, are extremely different things. Like I said, you know, from a young age, I always had a passion for airplanes and passion for military history and passion for service, passion for this jet and a passion for our mission. So I was like, man, this would be a cool way to to kind of share a lot of that stuff. And so I kind of threw my hat in the ring and I applied for the job and ended up getting selected to to do it. And and so it's a two year assignment. I'm going into my second year uh, right now. My job is to travel around, recruit, retain, inspire, and take the A-10 around, show it off to to crowds all over the country and uh, get to have a lot of fun with the airplane. So we're, everybody on the team, we're uh, all active duty, stationed out of davis Monthan, and I'm the only permanently assigned pilot to the team. And then we've got nine maintainers that take care of our airplanes, and uh, we get to travel all over the, all over the U.S. And, and get to show off the capabilities of the A-10. So today we're here at, uh, in Tyler, Texas, Tyler Pounds Regional Airport, uh, and we're flying the Rose City Air Fest. Uh, and the whole idea is we're going to go out there uh, this afternoon, this evening, and I'm gonna show everything that the, the A-10 can do. We're gonna show as fast as it'll go, as slow as it'll go, as tight as it'll turn, as fast as it'll roll, and, and take it out there and run it through its paces and hopefully get really, get people really excited about, uh, about seeing some jets flying. Wayne and Roger, my two grandfathers, they're, they're with me and I feel it every single time I go up the ladder of that airplane. Every time I walk up to it and I see that thing, it's pretty powerful. It's pretty impactful. And today I'm going to get to go out and I'm going to get to go up the ladder and I get to fly the A-10. And that's a that's a remarkable thing. And I don't take it for granted. Uh, in my book, it doesn't get much cooler than that. So, so I take a lot of pride in being able to do that and a lot of pride in the family being able to kind of carry on a little bit of that Air Force heritage and that lineage, which is a pretty exciting thing to do. Hi there, my name is Courtney Burling, and I'm so excited that you're here with me today. I'm gonna be walking you through a short training on how to properly lose weight or gain weight to help you meet the military standards. Now, you might be wondering where all of my information is coming from. There's a lot of nutrition information on the internet, and some of it might not be super accurate. But I want to assure you, you are in good hands. I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in dietetics. I studied at the University of Cincinnati, and I did my internship at the Cleveland Clinic, and I have been practicing as a sports dietitian for 
over 10 years. Um, not only am I a dietitian, but I also ran track and cross country at the University of Cincinnati. And I continue to coach runners every single day because it is truly my passion. Aside from being a dietitian and a running coach and helping candidates prepare for OCS, I am also a military spouse myself, currently stationed in Okinawa, Japan, to support my husband who is active duty Marine Corps. So anyways, let's go ahead and jump into this training. If you have questions or want to leave me some feedback, you can always catch me on Instagram at eatwell.runbetter. All right, let's go. All right. Well, my name is Courtney Burling, as that intro just showed, and I'm so excited to talk you guys through how to, it might sound weird, to lose weight and gain weight in the same presentation, but there's actually a lot of overlap. And so I'm going to walk you through everything so that when you leave this presentation, you know exactly what steps you can take to either lose that weight you need to meet the military standards or gain the weight that you're looking for. All right, let's get started. Oops. Is that me? Sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, so if we have time at the end, we will also talk about some bonus tips for training for your physical fitness test and specifically for that three mile run that I know most of you probably dread, but I absolutely love. So we will talk about that at the end as long as we have enough time left. All right, so let's dive into this. Like I said, losing weight and gaining weight, it might seem silly to talk about that in the same presentation, but there's so much overlap. So when we're setting weight goals, we first need to understand that genetics play a huge role here. And so fighting against your genetics, like if your family and your like all your lineage is really just smaller, then it's really hard to gain weight. Um, it's gonna, you're going to be fighting against your genetics. And same with if you know your family is just on the bigger side that doesn't necessarily make you unhealthy. It just means it might be a little bit harder for you to lose weight. However, within you know your genetics, we can still adjust our body weight uh, slightly. Our body weight has really what we call a set range that we kind of like to be where our body naturally falls. Going anything beyond that set range actually gets really hard to either gain weight or lose weight beyond that. So we do want to appreciate our genetics and understand where our body is coming from but look at what we can do. How can we work with our body and not against our body? So we want to set realistic weight goals. Um, so just as I said, understanding those genetics, we do not want to compromise our performance or our growth in any weight loss or weight gain goal. And so I'll give you one example that I see a lot, um, especially in, I work a lot with just runners. And so I see this a lot in runners. We think thinner is faster. If we lose weight, we'll be faster. And that's only true to a certain extent. If we're compromising our endurance or our, our strength because we're under eating so much, we're setting ourselves up for an injury. And that is not something we need when we're preparing for either boot camp or OCS or um, you know any branch of the military. So um, in terms of what is a good goal, you know, I want you to think about somewhere around half a pound up to a pound a week of weight gain or weight loss is a pretty realistic and possible goal. Um, a pound a week is pushing it. I would say really focusing on that half a pound per week and anything we do that's more extreme than that it's going to be extremely hard to maintain that. So um, make sure we're not setting um, you know, our expectations uh, too high or setting those goals too high. Um, we do want to be focusing on weight loss or weight gain. Any changes in nutrition should really be happening in, I say, the off season. So if you are a college or high school athlete, in the middle of your training session or you know, um, as you're working up for like football or whichever sport it is that you're playing, it's not the time to be drastically changing your nutrition. It's okay to tweak your nutrition, but it's not the time to really be focusing on losing weight or gaining weight. And so for those of you that are preparing for the military, we want to make sure that we are starting early with this. We do not want to be trying to change our body composition a month before we're about to go out for training, um, you know, before you start OCS or boot camp. We want to start this way ahead of time. And so think of that as your off season, way before you're about to ship out. And then focus on your overall intake. 
one specific food group is not going to make you lose weight or gain weight. I see carbohydrates blamed for weight gain all the time. And yes, there might be an ounce of truth to that. You know, we always say like, if we cut out carbs, we're going to cut and we're going to be able to lean out. And that's only slightly true, but carbohydrates also hold on to water and they help us stay hydrated and they're your body's preferred source of energy. So we don't want to cut that out too much. Okay, we're going to dive into all of this in so much more detail as we go on. This is just the tip of the iceberg here. I want you to think about the fact that consistency is key. Consistency is what we need. And like I said, making these changes, like I see, I'm currently stationed in Okinawa. My husband's active duty Marine Corps. And I see this all the time. And, and our friends, you know, they have to weigh in, in in a week or two. And now's the time they're like cutting, they're running and they're sweating. And it's like, y'all, you needed to start this months ago. You know, doing this a week or two ahead of time is not really going to help. It might, you know, it might help you pass. Um, you might slip under that weight standard, but it's not going to help long term in trying to make weight changes right before you need to weigh in only sets you up for yo-yo dieting. And that gets to be really hard on your metabolism. So focus on consistency at each meal and each snack. This is an opportunity. Each meal presents an opportunity. I want you to choose foods that are supporting your goals. So obviously, whether it's weight gain, weight loss, maybe it's even maintenance. Maybe those goals are improving your running. And we know that carbohydrates are going to give us the energy we need to run. So we need to be thinking about these things at every single meal and snack, which like I said, think of it as an opportunity. With both weight gain and weight loss, like I said, there's a lot of crossover. We still want to be eating consistently all throughout the day. So about every three to four hours, and this is going to help manage hunger and satiety, which really just means keeping you fuller longer. And so what you're choosing at each meal obviously is going to be very different based on your goals. For those of you looking to gain weight, we want to be focusing on those higher calorie options. And I'm going to give you a whole list of those in a few slides, focusing on things like healthy fats, nuts and avocados, um, cheese, things like their fat is not doesn't necessarily make you fat, but it does carry more calories per gram. So, you know, a handful of nuts is going to have a lot more calories than a handful of grapes. Um, so well, more to come on that and lots more examples to help you through that. But thinking about what foods you're choosing every three to four hours and then weight loss, we still want to be eating consistently throughout the day, right? I don't believe in intermittent fasting or time restricted eating. I do not think that's going to benefit you. We can do a whole nother presentation on that another day, but that really just sets you up for a restrict and a, basically a binge. Um, and so we want to be consistent eating throughout the day, giving your body just smaller amounts of energy. If you think of each meal or snack almost as like a bucket of energy, spreading those buckets of energy out all throughout your day is the best way to go about this. And so when weight loss is our goal, we obviously don't want to be choosing those higher calorie foods. We want to be choosing those lower calorie, but still nutrient dense options. So things like vegetables, of course, are a great option. Um, you know, you're still getting the nutrition. You're still getting a lot of micronutrients and minerals. Um, but you're not packing on as many extra calories as the examples I gave you in the weight gain category. So again, more examples on those to come in just a couple of slides. So bear with me. And then continue to focus on your, the timing of your nutrition. This is huge for weight loss and weight gain and just really overall health. It's so important. So what I want you to do is I want you to avoid exercising on an empty stomach. I know so many people that don't run before, or don't eat before they run, and then maybe they don't eat after they run or they work out and they're holding out, especially for my intermittent fasters, they're trying to hold out as long as they possibly can so that, you know, they are eating technically less calories. But what they're missing is putting your nutrition around your workout is the best possible place to be putting that nutrition eating before your workouts, especially those morning workouts, is so important. That's going to give you the energy you need to power through that workout. You're actually going to be able to work out longer and at a higher intensity, hence more fitness and possible more weight gain, or I'm sorry, more weight loss, muscle gain, weight loss. Um, and so we really want to be focusing on eating before that workout. Again, post-workout, super important. Consider this a window of opportunity. This is when your body wants to absorb nutrition. Your body wants to rebuild muscle, repair muscle, right? When we work out, 
we're actually putting micro tears in our muscles. And so if we don't eat afterwards, those muscles are staying broken down longer. So eating carbohydrates and protein immediately after those workouts is really going to help your body recover, repair, and help you feel fuller so that later in the day, you're not getting to evening and that hunger's not hitting you all of a sudden and you're you know gonna either binge eat or just like way overeat at dinner. We're putting that energy around our workout when our body most wants it and needs it. So I hope that's helpful. It's a real crash course in pre and post run nutrition, which again, I could do a whole nother hour talk on, but I'll spare y'all from that. Um, so when it comes to weight gain and weight loss, we really want to be thinking about planning ahead. And it doesn't necessarily need to be this fancy meal prep that you see on Instagram. You don't need all the fancy containers unless you really want those. But I just want you to sit down on, you know, whatever day of the week you're going to go grocery shopping and make a little outline. It doesn't have to be exact. You don't have to have fancy recipes but just make an outline for the week. What, give me a ballpark. What are you going to eat this week? Like have an idea, even if it's like, I, you know, you're going to do takeout or, you know, you know, you're going to order something this night. That's okay. But have a plan so that when that day rolls around, you're not just looking in the fridge and let's say weight gain is your goal. Maybe you don't have a lot of food in your fridge. That's not going to help you. So we need to make sure that we're planning ahead. And same with weight loss. We want to make sure that we have the right foods coming in and that we're setting ourselves up and we're not just waiting until we're hungry and eating whatever comes across um, our eyes as, as, it, as we get hungry. So, um, so plan ahead, make that outline and go to the grocery store. Even if you are single and living alone, I know what that's like. My husband's gone all the time, but still plan ahead and make those meals. It's going to pay off. Make that list when you go grocery shopping. I know I, I make a list and I forget it almost every time. It's okay. If you write it down, you're probably going to remember it, even if you don't remember to take the list. So go shopping. I know that sounds like such simple advice, but I work with so many people who just avoid going to the grocery store. I mean, more so obviously during COVID, but you know, when we are just relying on takeout or quick food options, that's all right for a while, but it's not going to benefit your performance. So make that grocery list have a, at least a loose plan. If you are in college, then maybe you're eating at the dining hall, or maybe you have really limited cooking options. You maybe don't have a stove tap. You're left with a mini fridge and a microwave. We can make do with all of this, but check the dining hall, see what's on the menu. A lot of dining halls will post, you know, or they have the same foods all week long, you know, at least like, you know, there's a salad bar and a sandwich bar and, you know, they probably rotate through your pastas, but have some ideas so that when you go there, and this is the same that goes for a restaurant. So if you're not in college and you just go to restaurants, same rules apply here, you know, know what's being offered, know what's on the menu so that when you get there, your appetite doesn't just take over. You can really make a sound decision before you even get there and have an idea of what you're going to be choosing. All right. So let's dive into more specifics here. I promised you this was coming. So let's talk about it. I love these. They're called athlete plates and I did not create these. I wish I did, but they were created by the U.S. Olympic Committee. And so you can find them on their website if you want to see like the whole big PDF version. But if you are somebody who is an athlete looking to still lose weight without harming your performance, then this is what's important. And this might seem very general and vague maybe, but I don't love talking a lot of macronutrients or calories because that makes us more food obsessed and can actually create more nutrition issues down the line. So I love these plates because they are generic and that's why I like them. So when we're looking for weight loss, we want to think about filling half of our plate or half of our meal should really be, I say color, um, but fruit or vegetable, ideally more vegetables, um, obviously in the morning. I don't expect you to have a salad. If you want that, you go for it, but I don't expect it. Um, but at lunch and dinner, you know, that's a great time to make half of your plate a vegetable. And then if you look in the one on the left hand side, bottom corner, you're going to see protein. We want to keep those proteins lean and either baked or grilled. This is where we want to stay away from fried, um, but we still need that good lean protein source. So things like chicken and fish, um, you can still do beef, but just watch the cuts, you know, look for more of a 90, 10 versus an 80, 20. 
Um, and we want that protein to be at least four to five ounces. So um, it's really not that much. Um, I feel like Americans typically overeat on protein. Um, it's about the size of a deck of cards or so is about three to four ounces. So you can think about the size of a deck of cards, maybe a little bit more. And then in the top left-hand corner there, you're going to see your grains. And so as I said in the very beginning, carbohydrates are still very, very important, especially for performance. The other thing is a diet like the keto diet, which is basically a no-carb diet or some of these low-carb diets, they're going to work, but for a very short period of time while impacting your performance negatively. So you can go ahead and cut carbs, but it is going to negatively impact your performance, at least if not right away, it will eventually. So we wanna make sure that we're still choosing carbs at each meal. But if you notice, it's about a quarter of our plate or a little less. So for most of us, that might look like I don't know, one cup or three-fourths cup of cooked brown rice, or if you've ever had quinoa, like it's an, an ancient grain, it's a whole complete protein, but still a, um, a grain. Um, you know, you can do things like a whole wheat bread, you, you know, the options go on and on, but you still need those carbs. It should just be a smaller portion of your plate. And then you can also notice we still want to be including healthy fats in our diet. I had mentioned earlier that fats contain more calories per gram. And while that is true, it's still very important. And so fats carry our fat-soluble vitamins. I won't bore you with too many details on fat-soluble vitamins, but vitamins A, D, E, and K really come from things like olive oil and fatty fish and nuts and um, avocado. So we want to make sure that we're including these. They're going to help you stay um nourished and it's going to help your skin and your hair and the list goes on and on. So we don't want to cut them out, but we do want to monitor and make sure that we're not having a ton. This says about, um, I think it says about one tablespoon or one teaspoon or one tablespoon. Um, so, you know, it's still okay to use salad dressing. We just don't want to be dumping it on. If you're at a restaurant, you can ask for it on the side. That's always a safe bet. Okay, so continuing on with some weight loss goals or specific recommendations, I want you, like I just said in the last slide, focus on filling your plate with half of it being vegetables. First and foremost, you got to have those vegetables. Then we add that protein and every single meal should really look like this. So as I said, when you sit down to build out, you know, kind of like a menu for the week or at least a general idea, I really want you to think about what's my carb, what's my protein and what's my carbohydrate at each meal. Um, and so as I mentioned your lean proteins can be things like skinless poultry. So if you, um, you know, take the skin off, especially, um, we don't want any fried chicken. I'm sorry. If you're trying to lose weight, it's just not the time for the fried chicken, but a variety of fish, um, looking at low fat dairy options, such as yogurt or cottage cheese. These are great sources of protein as well. Eggs, tofu, beans, tempeh. Um, you don't have to always have meat. Um, despite what my husband thinks a meal is still a meal without meat. Um, and so you can use a variety of protein sources such as things like tofu and beans. They make um, great protein additions to your meals. Okay. And then lastly, with managing portion sizes here, as I mentioned with the carbs, we want to keep that small, but we also want to look for those really high fiber grains like brown rice, wild rice, quinoa, oatmeal, corn tortillas, whole wheat breads, brown um, whole wheat pasta, um, whole wheat crackers. If you you know need something crunchy, um, you know fruit is obviously a carbohydrate as well. These are the things that are going to keep you full or longer. When we have fiber in our diet, especially the higher the fiber the more full we're going to be feeling. Um, now, fiber can also constipate you, so make sure you're drinking plenty of water with the addition of these high-fiber foods. But that is going to be a major benefit to um, not only managing your weight, but also helping your body digest um, carbohydrates properly. Um, when we eat lower-fiber foods, our blood sugar spikes and drops right away, hence you feel full, and then you get hungry right away. Like if you eat a piece of cake, full for maybe an hour, and then hungry right away. It doesn't stick with you because it's low in fiber. Okay. Another really important thing to be looking out for when we're losing weight is calorie, uh, liquid calories. This is so important. And I know some of you are not going to love to hear this because it includes alcohol and especially mixed drinks. And so this is, if we are trying to lose weight, 
cutting out alcohol and mixed drinks, especially anything um, like your sugary cocktails or um, I don't know, I don't drink a lot of cocktails, so I, I can't think of many good examples, but they are loaded with sugar. Um, so we really need to watch where we're getting our fluids from. And so, um, as I said, beer, even wine, even liquor. Um, I've you know had conversations with people about what's the lowest calorie liquor. They all contain calories. So really, if you're taking weight loss serious, I would cut out all alcoholic drinks. Um, you know, watch out for other liquid calories as well, such as obviously soda. We know that one, but sneaky calories such as like sweet tea, juice. You know, we think orange juice. Oh, this is great. This has so much vitamin C may be beneficial when we're sick, but otherwise it's just a lot. It's like I talked about in the last slide, not a lot of fiber. Your blood sugar is going to spike and it's going to drop and it's not going to stick with you. So watch out for those um, liquid calories, including specialty coffee drinks. Your, um, I don't know, I don't drink a lot of fancy coffee drinks either, um, but like your uh, mocha, frappe, I don't even know all the lingo, but you know what I mean. All those Starbucks drinks that are more than just coffee, if it costs more than $3 at Starbucks, then it's probably loaded with sugar is a general rule of thumb you can follow. Um, so you might save yourself some money here too. Um, but yes, watch out for those specialty um, cafe style drinks. Know what's in it too. You can always check the menu at most restaurants in the States. Now they have the calories listed. So to see what, you know, there's probably a lot of things that you're doing that, you know, without making major changes to your diet and without being overly restrictive, you might be able to slim down on your calories just by paying attention a little bit more. Um, so definitely stick to your water, stick to your unsweetened tea. Um, there's great electrolyte based drinks out there that are low in calorie. Um, Noon is one brand and Liquid IV is another that I love. Um, they have like 10 calories per serving and they're full of electrolytes to keep you hydrated for your sport. Um, other things that I would say though, in terms of liquid calories, the only exception would be things like a Gatorade. If you're going to be doing like a ruck or a really long run, we need those liquid calories coming in. That is what Gatorade is actually made for. It is not made for playing video games and like sitting on the couch. It is made for those that are out there working and sweating and they need those carbohydrates coming in. So definitely um, not shaming sports drinks by any means. They serve a purpose and we just want to be using them at the right time. So when we're out exercising and then I did add milk is also okay. Of course, um, you can do an almond milk or a cow's milk, whichever it is that you prefer. All right. And so in terms of weight loss, I think this is my last slide on weight loss before we switch over to weight gain. Um, think about what you're doing during the meal. And that might sound really silly, but, you know, try to eat mindfully. Try to eliminate the distractions around you. If you have the TV on, shut the TV off. If you're on your phone, put your phone down. If you're eating in the car, try to wait till you get somewhere. I want you to be present in your meal. And when you're present in your meal, the food usually tastes better, but you also notice when you're starting to feel full. And so it avoids that getting so far into your meal and then all of a sudden you're stuffed and you kind of regret having eaten so much. So we want to be checking in with ourselves all throughout the meal. Again, we don't need to restrict. We don't need to leave the meal hungry, but we just don't want to leave the meal feeling overly full. You should always feel like I could eat a little more, but I feel comfortably full. Like if we were on a scale from one to 10 and 10 being Thanksgiving stuffed, you really want to think about walking away from that meal when you're at like a seven or so. Like pretty satisfied. Um, but eating slowly is definitely going to help you determine that. Um, like I said, if we wait too long, if you go back to the very beginning of this presentation, when I talked about eating every three to four hours, the reason we want to be doing that, even when we're trying to lose weight, is because if we wait too long, then we're more inclined to just eat and eat and eat the food that's in front of us. So what we really want to do is if we're eating every three to four hours, eat slowly, Think about the meal, make proper choices. As we just talked about, build that healthy plate, give yourself time to sit down and enjoy that meal. And like I said, avoid those distractions, check in with yourself. I've often heard dietitians say, you know, put your fork down in between bites or, you know, you can do that if you want to. I'm not going to make that a rule or anything, but, you know, just make sure you're checking in with yourself throughout this meal. How's this meal making me feel? Am I even enjoying this meal right now? You know, what else is going on around me? How full am I? Just be mindful, check in with your yourself. 
All right. And so my last tips for you on weight loss, as I said in the beginning, do not, please, this is so important. So I'm going to say it probably at least one more time in this presentation. Please do not cut out whole food groups. Please don't demonize carbohydrates. If you are training for the military, you are an athlete in my book. And so we need to treat you as such. And so we need those carbohydrates coming in. Carbohydrates fuel your brain on a day-to-day -day basis. They fuel your body and then they fuel your exercise. So we still need them even when we're trying to lose weight. They are not the main source of weight gain. Um, if you overeat on them, which carbohydrates are very easy to overeat on, then that's where we can run into some problems. But if we're being mindful and we're choosing those higher fiber carbs, then they're great. So just keep all those tips in mind as you start to build out your meals. Um, we talked a little bit about healthy fats, and I just want to remind you that healthy fats do also help keep you fuller longer. Very similar to fiber, fat plays a similar role in keeping you full. So choose those healthy fats. So instead of things like butter or fried foods or... I don't know, even cheese has more saturated fat in it, but choosing more of those unsaturated fats that are better for our heart, like nuts and seeds and avocado and olive oil, these are going to help you stay full and satisfied and bring all of those fat-soluble vitamins that we talked about in so that you're staying properly nourished. And then last but not least, like I mentioned, when you're dining out or dining at the dining hall, definitely check those nutrition facts label because as most of you probably are aware, when you dine out, the portion sizes are huge, especially in America. And I get to say that because I live in Japan now and I get to see, we often joke, you know, when we go out for coffee, I'm like, I need to order two coffees to get like an American's like normal size. Um, and so in America, especially the portion sizes are quite large. So when that meal comes, either cut it in half, plan to eat half, and then, you know, you can assess and maybe eat the other half if you're still hungry. You can swap your French fries for a side salad. Um, definitely order that, you know, no calorie drink such as water um, and just go ahead and hydrate yourself. But definitely choose those grilled, baked, roasted, broiled, steamed, those types of options. Those are the key words we're really looking for when we go to a restaurant. So definitely avoiding those fried foods, which I know. And I'm not saying never. Um, and actually, one more thing that I don't have on these slides are I don't believe in cheat days. And while that might come as a surprise to you, um, cheat days mean you're doing something wrong. And we aren't doing anything wrong here. It's just the way we're eating. And I, I hate to sound like a commercial of like, we're doing this as a lifestyle change, but it really is. There's no food that's considered completely off limits here. There are, you know, you can have a variety of foods still and still lose weight. You can still have dessert. You can still have your fried food. It's just a matter of how often are we doing this? But I do not want you to feel deprived. I do not want you to end up having a cheat day because that does end up messing up weight loss. And that adds you back into that almost like a restrict binge cycle, which gets to be very difficult on our metabolism. So all foods can fit. Just think about more in moderation. There's nothing that is considered wrong or off limits. And I really have to stress that because I do work with a lot of people that have developed disordered eating habits from years of dieting. So we don't want to restrict to the point where we feel deprived. All right. And then here are my snacks to help you support weight loss. So if you're watching this and you want to take a screenshot or take a quick picture of this, this slide I think is really helpful in terms of ideas. And so I'm not going to read all of them out here. You guys can read them, but just a variety of things. And I really want you to be thinking about pairing a carbohydrate with a protein or a vegetable with a fat. So a good example obviously is like saw a handful of baby carrots with some hummus. Um, another one, obviously, celery and hummus. I, I love veggies and hummus. I think that's a great snack. Um, you could do, you know, um, let's see, what's another good one? The low-fat Greek yogurt. I think that's a great option. You get your protein, and depending on the type of yogurt, there's most likely going to be some carbs in there. Um, you know, so there's so many different varieties that you can do here. But really think about, like I said, getting in some protein and some nutrients with your snacks. We don't want just empty snacks. Like potato chips are fine sometimes, but that's not going to really keep you full or satisfied in the long term. All right. So 
that was all weight loss. Okay. So if you are in the weight loss category, and like I said, I would really only focus on weight loss if you need it for the military standards, the weight standards that exist. If you just want to lose weight, I would just be very cautious in terms of how is this going to impact my training? Um, don't let it go so far that it does start to impact your training. Now, for those of you that would like to gain weight, and I have these questions just as just as much as the weight loss, especially with, um, I work with a lot of OCS candidates. And so this is a big question I get. And it, you know, it makes me think back to when my husband was in Iraq, he was there for 10 months and he was just trying to bulk and bulk while he was there. And I was shipping him protein powder from the States and like the poor guy just could not, like he did gain a little bit of weight, but um, you know, it just, like I said in the very beginning, if it's fighting against your genetics, right? He's a collegiate runner. He's just not one to bulk and everybody's body is just different. So we do want to just appreciate the body that we have and think about how can we work with it? How can we support our body? How can we support our performance goals? Do I need to be gaining weight? Um, so anyways, I say that just as a reminder, those genetics go a long way. We can't fight our genetics too hard. All right. So a lot of the same things, there's a lot of crossover from the weight loss. Obviously the food, the food's choices that we have is the biggest difference here. And so um, I just want you to think about choosing quality calories. You do not need to load yourself up with things like ice cream and cookies and sugar. And I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not demonizing sugar here. It serves a purpose. But I think when we think about weight gain, that's where our mind goes. It's like, oh, I'm going to like have some ice cream at night and I'm going to have some soda and I'm going to just like get all these calories in. And again, there's a time and a place for that, but that's not how we want to be gaining this weight. We want to be loading up on those nutrient dense snacks, which of course I have a list for in just a minute, but thinking about those like nuts and peanut butter and thinking about not eating any food plain. And what I mean by that is if you were to have like a piece of bread, you would be missing out. If you have bread with butter on it or bread with avocado on it, now we just made that into not only a delicious snack, but one that is much higher in calories and nutrients. So we really want to be thinking about how can we amplify every food we're having? Um, how can we add to the food we're currently doing? We don't need to overhaul our diet. We don't need to do anything drastically different. We just want to, I love the word amplify, amplify that um, the, the food choice that you're making. So focus on food first and dietary supplements second. And I feel like I need to say that again, especially um, my OCS candidates love supplements. And y'all, I need you to hear this. It is a slippery slope. If you don't know exactly what is in that supplement, if it is not verified by a third party organization, it doesn't have a little stamp on it that says USP or um, uh, Informed Sport is another one. There's a couple different brands um, or different organizations. What that like Informed Sport and USP, um, what they do is they check that supplement. They check to make sure what the label says is what is actually in that container or like what that powder or pill actually contains. But if it's not verified by a third party, that label does not necessarily have to match what's inside. And so while it's going to be probably along the, the same lines, you know, if it's protein powder, it's probably still going to be a protein powder, but there can be traces of metal. There can be um, illegal drugs. I mean, things that might make you pop on a drug test. And so we need to be very, very careful with supplements. And the other thing in terms of supplements, um, especially for those preparing for either a combat deployment or OCS, boot camp, any, you know, anything of that sort, um, even if you're just planning to go to the field for, you know, a, a small deployment or an exercise, if your supplement, especially your pre-workouts, contain a lot of caffeine, this is going to be a problem. When you get to OCS and boot camp, there is no caffeine. And so a lot of my candidates work on decreasing their caffeine intake prior to going so that they don't end up with a caffeine withdrawal headache and they aren't relying on that caffeine. I bring this up because so many people that are trying to gain weight use a lot of supplements. And so we need to be very choosy about our supplements. I would hate to see this weight gain goal either leave you, you know, with a caffeinated a caffeine addiction 
or worse, like I said, containing um, a substance that you were unaware that was in there. So be very, very choosy with your um, supplements. Make sure that it is verified by a third party. And most importantly, focus on food first. That is really the way. If you are falling for all of this advertisement, I mean, there are so many things out there that's like, labeled like so something gain or you know like the, so many things advertising muscle gain and truly the right way to gain muscle and or weight uh, obviously we want that weight to be muscle but um is really focusing on timing of nutrition like we talked about your workouts and overall good quality nutrition coming in there is not one supplement that's going to be the game changer for you at least not in the long term without impacting like so many supplements, I could go on about supplements and I'll try to wrap this up, but so many supplements can be fine in a short period of time. And a lot of studies aren't done with a long-term view. Um, they're done, you know, in like cohorts of like three months, they looked at this, you know, people taking a supplement. And so we know some supplements are safe for short periods of time, but when we start taking supplements for a long period of time, we don't always know how that's going to affect things like our liver, especially massive amounts of protein can affect the kidneys. So anyways, I'm going to step down off of my supplement soapbox here. And I just want you to realize food first is always going to be your best option. Okay. One major tip for you, so if you've learned nothing yet, this is a good one, so start paying attention, um, include a bedtime snack. And I'm not saying that eating before bed will make you gain weight. I don't want that to be the narrative here. But studies have shown that consuming a casein-based protein, which is found in casein protein, which is in milk or dairy products. They also make a casein protein if you don't like milk or dairy products. Um, but if you can consume a casein-based protein prior to going to bed, it helps you keep your muscle mass on overnight. It helps keep those muscles fueled overnight and basically minimizes muscle breakdown. So that's a great thing to be having right before bed. Um, this can be either in like a little smoothie, you can mix up some yogurt and some fruit, you can do, um, you know, just a glass of milk, you can, um, I love the Greek yogurt option, that's probably one of my favorites, or cottage cheese if you like that. Um, so lots of different options, but having that snack before bed is a great way Way to help you keep that muscle mass on overnight. Um, and so other examples, cereal and milk. I mentioned the um, cheese and crackers earlier. That's a great snack, especially right before bed because it contains that casein. All right. And so we looked at the plate, the athlete plate for weight loss, but what about for weight gain? How does it differ? You don't have to do anything drastically different, like I said. So if you are somebody who maybe you live with somebody else, maybe you have a family or you live with some roommates and you guys all eat the same, you don't have to do anything crazy different. You don't need a special diet. All you have to do is monitor your portion sizes. Then think about when I say portion sizes, I don't just mean the amount of food on your plate, but the way your food is actually plated. And so if you see on this plate, I wish I kind of had a side by side of the weight loss and weight gain plate. The major differences here are actually the protein stays the same for the most part. Your color on your plate, your vegetables decreases just a little bit, but that makes more room for carbohydrates. So our carbohydrates increase, color decreases just a little bit in order to create more room for those carbs. And then we still have those healthy fats. And so obviously the amounts of foods are going to be a little bit higher for our weight um, gain versus our weight loss category, but really decreasing those vegetables makes a very big difference. I'm so sorry. I'm going to jump up and shut the door. Somebody's cutting the grass. Okay. Very sorry about that. Um, it is Saturday afternoon here. So everybody's out cutting the grass and taking care of things around the house. So anyways, let's look at some examples for adding in higher quality calories. Like I said, we don't just want to load our bowls with ice cream, though that's delicious. It's not going to help in the long run. So again, if you're taking notes, take some notes here, take a screenshot, whatever you need to do to use this list for later. But these are some very simple ways to get in extra calories and nutrients without making you feel completely overloaded or completely stuffed. And so if we're eating every three to four hours, 
choosing these higher calorie like snacks, if you will, or meals is going to make such a big difference. And so I'll just point out one or two that are really more my favorites. Um, well, you can see, and I just noticed this on my list here, the baby carrots and the hummus are on both lists. And you might be thinking, well, that doesn't make sense, but it does. The portion size of the hummus doubled. It was two tablespoons on the weight loss because that's still a great snack. It's a great snack for everybody. It's just a matter of portion sizes again. And so you can look at things like, um, I love this too, like a, a, an oatmeal that can be a snack for you. Um, you know, you could do a half a cup of dry oats, which turns into about a cup full, but use a whole milk versus like a skim milk for weight loss. Right. So it's very similar. Like I said, you don't have to do anything wildly different. It's small choices. It's things like, you know, the portion sizes, especially of things like almond butter, peanut butter, olive oil, the, those fats, like I've talked about, contain such a big bang for your buck. That is a great way to get in those extra calories. Um, and I also will highly recommend smoothies. If you are starting to feel pretty full, smoothies are a great way to, you know, add extra calories, add extra nutrients throughout your day. And so you can just be sipping on a smoothie. Maybe you eat a great breakfast and then you sip on that smoothie for you know an hour or so I mean, it might be melted and gooey by the end but you know 30 minutes or so in between breakfast and lunch and then you have another lunch or sometimes even having like two lunches like an early lunch and a late lunch is another easy way to get in those extra calories um, but avoid going a long time in between meals because then you're missing those opportunities to be getting in more calories um, on the note of smoothies, here's a few great recipes for high calorie smoothies. And again, drinking your calories, as we talked about back on the um, liquid calorie slide for weight loss, is an easy way to sneak in more calories. So we don't want them if we're trying to lose weight. We do want them if we are trying to gain. And I don't just want you drinking soda, but something like a nutrient-dense smoothie is a great way to sneak in those extra calories without even noticing. Like look at the second one down, six ounces of milk, seven ounces of a full-fat yogurt, and half an avocado with some berries is 500 calories. Like that's a lot of extra calories without you really feeling all that full. So I love the smoothies when we're um, trying to gain weight. So, okay. We have about 15 minutes or so that I am going to talk about training tips. If you are left with any questions or concerns about weight loss or weight gain, if I left anything unanswered, definitely go ahead and shoot me a message over on Instagram. Uh, my handle is at eatwell.runbetter. I'm happy to address any additional questions. Um, you can also check out my website, eatwellrunbetter.com. And that also reminds me that I didn't thank our sponsor in the very beginning, uh, Stars and Stripes, for sponsoring us through this 24-hour live stream on Parade Deck. Um, so great to be here. So I uh, should have said that in the very beginning, but hey, better late than never. Okay. Let's jump into some training tips and tricks real quick. Um, I am a registered dietitian, but I am also a run coach and a former collegiate runner. So running is near and dear to my heart. I actually ran a race this morning, so it's all fresh on my mind. Um, I'm going to give you just a few short tips to help you build out a sound training plan. We don't want to, just like with nutrition, we don't want to you know, increase calories or decrease calories too too quickly. We don't want to do anything drastic. Same goes for training. We don't want to increase our training too rapidly. And when we do increase our training very rapidly, we end up not feeling so good. You might end up with things like shin splints or uh, muscle breakdown that leads to injury. So the name of the game, if you go back to my nutrition slides, consistency is key. I know I say it all the time, but it's true. We cannot wait till the last minute. If you know you're shipping to OCS or boot camp in um, May, I mean, what is it? It's almost April. Like you should be in the thick of your training now. It's not time to start training. You should already be training. Um, I'm sure your OSO and your recruiter would be very happy to hear that you are training. Um, so what does that training look like? I believe when you are getting ready for any sort of military service, um, you need to be running, uh, working up to, again, this isn't like day one, but working up to at least three to four days a week of running. And that's on top of things like lifting weights and maybe some cross training um, or a, a rock or you know a hike. Um, and so 
we do need to be working up to about, like I said, three to four days worth of running. That slow build in mileage is what is going to keep you feeling healthy. Um, it's going to keep those shin splints at bay. So plan to have at least one rest day a week. So maybe this in the beginning for you looks like three days of running, two days of lifting, one day of a ruck, and then one day of rest. Um, or maybe in the very beginning, it's two rest days. Um, but the plan is that we work our way up. Each training plan, if you will, should always include stretching, dynamic, meaning moving through our stretches, adding some movement to stretching before our run. And then after is okay to do more static stretching where you're just like reaching and holding. Um, but we should always do stretching before and after core exercises, hip strengthening, especially for female runners. It's important for everybody, but even more important for female runners because our hips are our real stabilizers. That's where we get a lot of our power. Um, but weak core and weak hips really lead to a lot of injuries. So we do want to make sure that we are, um, you know, really taking care of our bodies in that sense. And then you need to know, and this might sound like basic knowledge, but you need to know what your PFT goal is. What is your current time and what is your goal time? And I don't want your like a goal. Like if you're running 25 minutes right now and your a goal is 18 minutes, like that's great. Keep that goal written down somewhere. But what's our next goal? Maybe it's to go from 25 to 23 or to 22 minutes. And then take that goal and let's say it's 21 minutes. Maybe your goal is a 21 minute, three mile time, which would be great. Divide that by three. What is your mile pace? And we need to know these numbers because this is going to help our training. And so what is your, your mile goal pace? If you're running 21 minute, three mile, you want to be running seven minute miles. And that might sound really silly to some of you. Like, of course I thought about that, but I think a lot of runners don't think about that. So it's really important to know what is our mile goal pace? What is our, you know, what is our average pace that we're aiming for? Because that's going to help you break it down when we look at the three different types of runs I'm going to talk about. The first type of run that should be included in your weekly training plan are intervals. You need to practice running fast. We should not be running fast all the time. In fact, a lot of our runs should be slow and easy. That's what helps build endurance and helps your bones and your tendons and your muscles and your overall aerobic capacity is easy runs. But then about 20% of your mileage should be hard efforts. And so we can't expect to be fast if we're not running fast. So we need to make sure that we are doing some intervals. And so when we're doing intervals, I'm talking about distances of 400 meters up to a mile. I can't tell you how many um, like OCS candidates or pulleys um, come to me and they're like, yeah, I'm doing some 100 and 200 sprints. I'm like, okay, well, that's great, but that's not going to help your three mile time. Like it's going to help your speed and your power. So it's not wrong, but it's not going to help your three mile time. And so we really need to be focusing more on this distance, 400 up to a mile for intervals. And then when you're running these intervals, let's say, for example, you did eight by 400 meters. So eight times you're running 400 meters. There needs to be a break, obviously, in between. So you would run 400 meters. Maybe that takes you, I don't know, a minute and 40 seconds or so, minute 50 seconds. I think that's seven minute pace off the top of my head. Um, then you want to rest for about one minute. You want to be resting either a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio. So if you run for two minutes hard, you rest for two minutes. Um, or as you get better, then you rest for half the time. You run hard for something like two minutes and you rest for one minute. And as you get even better, then that rest can become what we call an active recovery. You go from standing still or grabbing your knees and trying to like catch your breath. You go from that to a slow jog in between your intervals. And that's when you know you're really starting to improve is when your heart rate's coming down back to normal while you're still moving through that active recovery. So um, so again, what this could look like, I give you the example of eight by 400 meters, you know, so again, that might take you two minutes or so to run the 400 and then you recover for about a minute. You could do three by one mile. If your goal, you know, if your race pace or your PFT goal is that seven minute per mile, then running three by one mile at seven minute pace with a three mile or three minute, um, recovery jog in between is a great plan. So 
anyways, that's enough on intervals, but we need to practice running fast. We need to practice running PFT pace, not all the time, not every day, but on these hard run days, on these interval days. Um, last two types of runs I just want to touch on, and then I will wrap up here are things like a tempo run. And so you've maybe never even heard that word before. It's a real running term um, and don't let it confuse you. It just really means more of like a threshold pace. Like how fast can you run without being in complete oxygen debt? This is gonna help improve your endurance, but also improve your lactic acid threshold, how well your body is clearing lactic acid. And so we wanna be doing these tempo runs I usually have my runner, my my more advanced runners do them once a week. Some of my newer runners will do them every other week um, on top of their interval runs. But so basically it's like taking your PFT pace and running maybe 15 to 20 seconds slower. So the example we've been using is a 21 minute PFT, seven minutes a mile. So you might want to run, you know, two to three miles at, at tempo pace, which would be, you know, 720 or 730 in this example. So you're not running easy, but you're not running all out PFT pace. You're running in that kind of like gray zone right in between. And that's what really helps build your endurance. And again, that lactic acid threshold, how quickly your body is clearing out that lactic acid. Um, and so as you become a more advanced runner, it's great to do, you know, a, a one or two mile warm up do a three mile tempo run. So almost at your PFT pace, but not all out because that all out effort should be reserved for PFT day, but running, you know, a, a hard, like a seven out of seven or eight out of 10 effort and then cooling down for one or two miles. That would be a fantastic workout. Um, so again, that can be done about once a week. And then the last run, and then like I said, we will pretty much be wrapping up is the long run, or like I, I like to call it, an endurance day. It might not always be a long run, depending on how your body handles um, increase in mileage, but this should be done at an easy pace. As I talked about when I earlier in the slides here, easy efforts don't make you slow. They allow your body to grow. And so, you know, the equation for really getting better at running is rest plus stress equals growth. And so we need to like have these easy runs and take these rest days. And then we need to stress our bodies with interval runs and tempo runs and hard lifts. And that's how we get faster. So it's okay to make these long runs as slow as your body needs. I don't even go, I don't give my runners a pace. I give them an effort because that effort is going to be different every single day. And so, you know, if you didn't sleep as good or maybe you didn't hydrate or the weather's incredibly humid, like it is here in Okinawa, um, that pace is going to be different and that's okay. We need to honor that, but it, it should be nice and slow. We want to focus on time on our feet. That's what, like, I can speak to OCS because I know my I was with my husband through OCS. Um, haven't, we haven't been through boot camp, so I can't speak so much to boot camp. But it's about time on your feet. You are on your feet a lot, and you are walking a lot and running a lot. And so, getting comfortable with being on your feet all the time is gonna be a huge help for you. And so. I would, you know, again, easy starting out with lower mileage. If you are a brand new runner, this might even be a walk run for you in the beginning. You might aim for 45 to 60 minutes of run one minute, walk one minute and build your way up from there. My more advanced runners, um, the runners that I've been coaching for, you know, three months or so, they're running, you know, probably around six to eight miles, depending on um, their you know, their past and like some of them were former high school runners or, um, you know, they all have different goals. But um, so around 60 to 90 minutes, though, if you prefer to run by minutes versus miles, sometimes it's a nice change up. But practicing being on your feet, if running long is just not in the cards for you, maybe there's an injury or you really just hate it, um, I would still recommend it. But you can also do a long hike being on your feet or some of my athletes will do um, a longer run, like maybe a five to six mile run and then straight into like an hour long hike. So they're getting two hours of time on their feet back to back. Um, and that is great training for OCS um, specifically, I'm sure boot camp as well. So practicing being on your feet for long periods of time with the proper nutrition, of course. So, um, okay. That is it. That is all that I have for y'all. So if you have any other questions, you are interested in run coaching, especially after hearing some of those tips on um, preparing for your fitness test. Um, but if you are 
um, training for OCS, training for boot camp, where you are in the military trying to meet those weight standards or PFT standards, don't be shy to reach out. Again, you can find me on Instagram at eatwell.runbetter. You can email me, CourtneyBerling at gmail.com. Or of course, you can find me on my website, which is just eatwell uh, eatwellrunbetter.com. So again, I just want to thank um, Andrew and Stars and Stripes and Parade Deck for having us all here. Hey, that was amazing. Great job. Can you hear me all right? Can you yeah, hear yeah, me? I can hear you. Yep, yeah, perfect. Yeah, uh, amazing. I was trying to take notes, but... I heard, you know, make a list for the grocery store. So does that count Instagram or uh, what's Instacart? Yeah, Instacart. So, oh, yeah, that counts. We just don't have that here. So I forget that that exists. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. So yeah. It, but then at the end, it always reminds you like, oh, would you like this? Would you like to add this? You know, yeah. based upon your shopping habits, how about this gallon of ice cream? So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, throw that in there. <laughs> throw that in there. But. Yeah, I mean, really good. I, I can't wait to kind of review this and go back over those notes and uh, kind of got me motivated to kind of get a plan. I mean, that's really what I heard is a plan. And also, you know, people think I don't need a coach, I don't need a trainer, but I think you probably just proved it that having a coach or someone with as many letters as you do after your name really can make a difference, especially if you're planning for OCS, you know. Uh, yep. So when I went to OCS, I didn't have that plan. I just went. I just <laughs> went, and it was just gut, you know, just like gutting it out. You know, there was not any, you know, like, oh, I better, you know, be. I think I thought about it, like, oh, I need to be able to run three miles. And I was prior enlisted, so I kind of knew. Oh. But, uh, but yeah, if I really wanted to get that 21 minutes or that 18 minutes, then definitely using a program like yours would be amazing. Yeah. Thanks, so, Andrew. I know so many people like and a lot of people can go to OCS and just like live on a prayer and like gut it out. Yeah. But um, others really like it just depends, like makes me think of like when I was a student, like I was that student that had to really study to get the straight A's. And then there's others that can just wing it and get the straight A's. So it kind of depends on uh, what kind of athlete you are. And I'm sure you get into a lot of the mental part of it as well. I mean, that's I mean, maybe you mentioned that and I missed it, but, you know, along with your nutrition and, and your physical being, because I do, I mean, I know a, a, a candidate that went, he was all excited. I mean, he was like a poster of a Marine. Like he already looked like he could just put the blues on, uh, but he had dropped out because of more of the mental stuff. Mm. He, he focused so much on the, you know, like perceivably, you know, I can do the, the tough stuff, uh, but it was more of the mental that really kind of challenged him. So, you know, again, having that plan and being prepared uh, really helps. So, but hey. Yeah. And I think too, when you have a plan that helps the mental game, because you're like, I planned for this, I prepared for this and I trained for this. And yep. that makes a huge yep. difference. And just being confident in yourself going in makes a big difference. I mean, I was never there myself, but I feel like I lived through it when Brian went. So. Oh yeah. It's a, yeah. So, uh, but Hey, thank you for being on the pray deck. Thank you for taking this midnight hour here. Like we just it was easy for you me. tipped us over. <laughs> yeah. yeah one, you tipped us one over here. So no problem. Yeah. Thanks for having me. And uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of the 24-hour um, live stream. Yeah. All right. We'll see you later. And just uh, exit out of the browser. Um, so don't hit that big red button. Do not hit the big red button. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It'll okay. shut us all down. Oh, all right, geez. Courtney. Thanks. <laughs> okay, I bye. know. <laughs> bye. All right. So there we go. Uh, that was great information. Um, from Courtney. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, you know, obviously you can go back and watch this again. You know, it's going to be on all of our YouTube. It's going to be on LinkedIn. It's going to be everywhere. And so it's going to be over there on Stars and Stripes. So, uh, you know, what you just heard from Courtney, you know, I won't put a dollar amount on it, but that was worth a lot of uh, money. Like if you're actually to pay someone to get all of the information. So I hope, you know, you took notes, like she said, took some screenshots. Obviously, you can go back and watch this again. So, but we are going to move on. So, I, I don't know why. Let's see here. I really wanted to let you guys see. So, I just wanted to kind of recap. You know, we are doing the live 24 hours marathon, uh, March Madness. And somebody sent me a LinkedIn message that said, It is really March Madness. You're staying up all night. So, I am going to get a little rest here in between our next guest. And so, don't worry about me. I kind of pretend like it's just 
doing duty when you're in the Marine Corps, your 24 hour duty or overnight uh, duty. So don't worry about me. I'm just so grateful that all of our creators could get on today. And we just had a huge lineup starting at eight o'clock this morning uh, with Spondulix and Recon Network. A lot of new creators that have joined Mario and Shelly and Joshua. So, and even Regan, all the way from New Mexico out there on the Navajo reservation, joined us and really presented some valuable historical information and an irreverent warrior. So, uh, and a few more. So, tonight we are going to move on. Uh, so let me get our next slide here. So, so this next person that we're going to talk about, let me just get her picture up here. You've already seen that video. So we really wanted to thank Stars and Stripes again for all they did for us. Um, so let's see here. Let me get rid of this. So you can't really see this. This is Kelly Sabrachi. She uh, has the Misunderstood podcast, and she just premiered season four. And we have it for you tonight, which I feel very honored to have that. But Kelly uh, is very instrumental. Uh, she's in the Navy. She's active duty. Uh, she's very instrumental in recruiting. You know, uh, you know, giving out that message to people that are interested in joining the Navy. She went to the Naval Academy. She lives in Chicago um, doing her, her active duty service there. But I would encourage you to go to spot, go to Parade Deck first. Uh, go to Parade Deck. Look at all her social media. Uh, but then listen to her podcast on whatever favorite channel you have, Spotify or Apple. Um, so, And then follow her. Subscribe. So without further ado, I'm going to play her premiere episode of Season 4. You're listening to Miss Understood Podcast, where we are setting the record straight on all things misunderstood. I'm your host, Kelly Hall Sabraki, pageant runner up, model, speaker, wife, and U.S. Navy Lieutenant. I may have never won a Miss USA title. But I am the queen of being misunderstood. Welcome to the show, guys. What is up, world? This is season four. Welcome, guys. Welcome, new listeners. Welcome, returning listeners. Welcome, Miss. Understood fam. I am so honored to be here. You have no idea what this means to me. Just today, I was reflecting on this journey. This podcast journey has been crazy. I started this podcast right after Miss California USA in January of 2020. You know, I circled back with my thoughts. I mean, I didn't win. I didn't win Miss California USA, and I had this big plan to go travel across the country and speak in schools and go to high schools and universities and speak about everything that I speak to you guys every single episode. And then I didn't win. And so I thought, you know, how can I continue to impact, inspire, and get my message out and create the biggest ripple I can? And my mental management coach, Heather Sumlin, who's been on the podcast before, she'll be on it again. She was like, what? make a podcast? Why do you have to wait for these opportunities to come to your door? Build the door yourself and walk through it. And I was like, yes, like let's take the reins. And that's exactly what I did. I was like, okay, I'm going to stop waiting to be featured on people's podcasts. I'm going to stop waiting for invitations to speak. I'm going to stop waiting for a crown to be put on my head so I can go out into the world and make a big difference. I'm going to start doing it myself. I'm going to put myself in the driver's seat. And that's where Misunderstood was born. And then COVID happened and I had so much more time to focus on it and really just build the plane as I flew it. And one of my mentors, Brandy Voth, who's also been on the show, she was like, look, Kelly, every day that you don't put out your podcast is a day that someone 
who needed to hear your message isn't. And you're preventing them from hearing the words that God's putting on your heart. So just do it. It's not going to be perfect. Your podcast cover may not be what you want, or your audio may not be perfect, or the the technology may not be exactly right, but just do it. Just use your voice. And I was like, you're right. And so I just started. I started recording episodes on my phone and I had no idea what I was doing. And then I did a photo shoot on the balcony of my Long Beach apartment with Austin in the middle of COVID. And that's how I created my first ever podcast cover art. Like I truly have just been having the time of my life creating this. And not much has changed except for I have an amazing team at Hatch who's producing my episodes. And other than that, I (laughs) have outsourced some awesome designers for my podcast cover art, but I'm still recording this episode in my tiny little apartment, in my tiny little bedroom on a Wednesday night in between work, in between hectic craziness. And I'm doing it because I love it and because I'm here for you guys. And, you know, I I went out, took the liberty to just define what being misunderstood means. And according to Google, misunderstood is incorrectly understood or interpreted, not appreciated or given sympathetic understanding. That's exactly how I feel. I am still the queen of being misunderstood. But here's the thing. I have found that being misunderstood is kind of a superpower. I kind of love it. And it was initially, you know, this clever title that Heather and I came up with when we were going over branding for my podcast initially she was like, you know, you're constantly explaining yourself and you're explaining why you're doing pageants or why you're doing modeling or why femininity gives you confidence or why it's important for women to do both. Or she's like, you're always kind of on this like defensive mode and you're just so frequently misunderstood. And she was like, that's it. You're in the queen of being misunderstood. And I ran with it. And this podcast has been all about all things misunderstood, people, persons, concepts, things, whatever. Like that's what I wanted to dive into. But it's turned into so much more. And more recently, I've had to really reflect because I've been challenged on a whole other level that I wasn't anticipating. And at first, I'll be honest, I have tried to record this premiere episode three times. This is my fourth time recording a premiere episode. And each time I could tell I was coming from an angle of defense. Like I was defending myself. I was defending my name and my brand and my platform. And I recorded an hour long tell all. Uh, rumors and assumptions and what really happened at the Super Bowl. I I just recorded this last week and I listened to it over the last couple days and I thought, you know, this podcast is all about, yes, being misunderstood, but it's also an extension of how God is using me and it's tangible tips, tangible things that you as listeners can take away and apply to your everyday life. And I didn't want to release an episode that was just me setting the record straight on rumors and assumptions and all of the chaos that's been happening over the last eight weeks. Like, although maybe the tea was piping hot, that's cool. And I love, uh, we all love some good tea. But it's not really what you needed to hear. And it's not really what I needed to be sharing. So I'm circling back tonight as I'm recording this premiere episode on why being misunderstood is really a superpower. 
And in a matter of about three seconds, I reflected on this and I thought, why is being misunderstood a superpower? Oh, it's because it causes so much reflection and you really start to embrace your purpose. And it lastly, like it builds resiliency. There is so much power in each of those things and being misunderstood is amplifying all of them. Like it's not a bad thing that I'm so misunderstood. It's not a bad thing that there are so many rumors circulating about me. It's not a bad thing that there's so many assumptions made about what I'm doing because all of that is working together to build a better me. It truly is. Like people reflect and they think, oh, like there's this rumor. Oh, like people don't get what I'm doing. People don't get me. They don't get my passions. They don't get my hobbies. They don't get my personality. Like there are so many assumptions being made about me and what I'm doing and who I am. People sit there and they stress about it and they stress about it instead of thinking, wait a second, let's remove all of that noise. Let's remove it. The noise canceling headphones are on and that just leaves you. That leaves you and your voice and your purpose. And what is it? What is, what do you stand for? Who are you? What are you trying to do? What do you believe in? And why are you doing it? What is fueling you? All of those questions can be answered by you and your heart and your intention and God's purpose for your life. You don't need the noise of all of these outside voices of people who don't even know you to drive that purpose for you. You already have that within you. And just recently, I was listening to a podcast and I, this is like so ironic guys, but ironically, it was John Mayer on a podcast with Alex Cooper quick pitch for Call Her Daddy. It's not a Christian podcast or anything like that. It's not personal development, but a lot of people have been talking to me about it. And so out of research, I've been like hopping around to different podcasts and listening. And I just so happened to listen to this podcast where John Mayer kind of talked about being misunderstood, literally used those words. And he said this quote, your reality is stronger than their ability to distort it. And I found that to be so powerful because of what has been going on with me since we last connected in season three. So just a really, really brief overview. I enjoyed the holidays with my family. There was a blizzard that hit Chicago. We drove 18 hours down to Florida for our best friend's wedding. I did a photo shoot in my living room for the misunderstood branding with Sam Hardy, which was awesome. I've connected with new women. I threw a friend a baby shower. I have just been all over the place. And while still working full time as a flag aide and HR officer, I have enrolled in my MBA program and I have been in my second class and that has been a lot of work. But All of that has worked together to make my schedule a little bit more hectic and crazy, um, but I'm still trying to only do things that bring me joy. But in addition to all of that, I have been continuing to build my platform on social media. I hit 100,000 followers in January, which is just still like insane to me. I can't believe that. And the Navy partnered with me for the third time to go to events and showcase Navy opportunities through my social media, through my perspective. Now, this is just like such an honor in general. Like the fact that Navy recruiting believes in me and my platform and what I'm doing and wants to utilize that, like I'm just so touched. I'm so touched that they find value in that. Like that's just so validating. I do what I do because I believe in it, but it's always nice to see that other people believe in it too. So I was approached to go to the Super Bowl 
which is insane. Like exclamation point, exclamation point, like Super Bowl. What? Like that's so wild. So that has been probably the biggest milestone since we last spoke. But even so, that's been the biggest challenge that I've recently faced. Let me get into this just a little bit more. So I was approached back in the fall about doing some Navy events and spreading that awareness on my social media platform. And I said, absolutely, sign me up. So I went to the Navy Notre Dame game in November. I went to the Army Navy game in December. And then they asked me to go to the Super Bowl. So my thought was, I'm going to the Super Bowl game. Like, that's all I know. That's all I'm aware of. But I found out over the holidays that I would not be going to the Super Bowl game, that there were several Navy events happening leading up to the game. And, you know, there was a all-female flyover that happened. The Navy had a huge, incredible Super Bowl experience at the NFL experience there in Phoenix in downtown Scottsdale or downtown Phoenix, rather at the convention center, like there were just all these like big Navy events. So they asked me to go there and, and capture it and create content. And I was like, heck yeah, sign me up. So yeah, was I a little bummed? I wasn't going to the game. Sure. But I was also like, this is so new. Like the Navy is asking me to go create content for them. And holy cow, I just want to like, I want to be me and I want to be authentically me and I want to stay true to myself and my personality and my brand and my platform. But I also just want to do a good job. <laughs> like this is a lot of pressure. So yeah, I definitely felt a lot of pressure going, but ultimately like, I always kind of give myself a pep talk and I talk to Austin and my parents and Jackie and my friends and they're like, Kel, go crush it. Go do what comes natural to you. No one has has taught you how to do this. I'm self-taught on social media. Just go be your natural self. And so with that kind of pump up speech, I headed to Scottsdale for the Super Bowl and I was there for about four and a half days and I covered all sorts of events. I got to MC a metal school ceremony and do interviews with the female pilots who did the, the flyover and just meet awesome sailors. And it was just such an amazing, amazing event. So I really, I'll caveat this with like, I am not new to social media. I have been on here for five years building this platform. And the haters have always been louder than the lovers. And the trolls love to come out and the memes will get created and the articles will get written about me. But I don't, listen to the noise. And I've put implementations, I should say, I have put boundaries on my social media and really implemented these boundaries to protect my mental health. For example, I put the feature on that you can't comment on my post unless you're following me. And that's really to remove these like really negative comments that come my way. My thought there is that if you're following me, more than likely, like you want to be following me, you know, no one's, no one's twisting your arm um, and that you support my platform. And so that's, that's who I want to be commenting on my stuff or DMing me. So all of that to say, after the Super Bowl, I was definitely surprised at the amount of backlash and controversy that circulated around the Navy recruiting sending me to cover events at the Super Bowl. There was this perception that the Navy spent like thousands upon thousands of dollars to send me there. It was not true. That I went to the, the Super Bowl game, football game, and like that wasn't true. And there's still this continuous perception that I'm a full time influencer. That isn't true. So it all is just circulated around people who just don't get it and they don't get me and they don't understand why I'm doing this or what my brand is or what my platform is or how it started. And the OGs, the originals on here who have been listening to my podcast for a while and been following me for a while know that this just kind of all happened. You know, once upon a time, I was a 24-year-old who decided to do 
a Miss USA pageant on a whim. And through that, I found social media. I started speaking out about doing both, being in a pageant while serving in the military. And everything since has been stemmed from that. Like, I had no idea that my platform would grow from 300 followers at 24 to 100,000 at 30. I had no idea that women truly related to my platform, that they were trying to find a way to do both in their life, to be a mom and an entrepreneur or a pageant queen and an engineer or a doctor and a model or a wife and a business owner. Like all these women were trying to figure out how to do both and trying to shatter those stereotypes. And if I could be that guiding light, I wanted to be, I wanted to help. And that's where this has all continued. But to circle back to the Super Bowl, there has just been about a month of controversy and negativity and memes and articles and people pulling me aside at work and people calling me to see if I'm okay. And through all of that, as frustrating as it might be, because I just want to, I just want to focus on the positive guys. Like, I just want to focus on why I'm doing this. Like, I am not going to let the noise of the naysayers affect my voice or my heart or the purpose that God has placed in me. I'm not. They're not my target audience. The naysayers and the trolls and the negative people, they're not my target audience. My audience is all of those who are looking to be inspired, who are seeking impact, and who want to figure out a way to potentially do both in their life. Maybe they're scared to be their authentic self. Maybe they're scared to go into a male-dominated field. Maybe they don't know even how to start feeling like a transparent leader. Those are all just little tools and tips I want to give along the way. So back to my original point of being misunderstood kind of being my superpower. First, I mentioned it causes reflection. You know, the amount of hate that has recently come my way for my podcast, for my social media, for what I'm doing, people are like, oh, it's makeup. It's about makeup. Like, what? Or they're saying, oh, she's, you know, it's all vain or it's self-driven or self-propelled, like, you know, selfish in nature, all of that. I just had to sit back and reflect and think, okay, I guess this is selfish in nature because I like it. I, (laughs) I like truly love what I'm doing. Like it does fulfill me. This is how I choose to to spend my spare time. So I guess it's selfish because I love it. But other than that, I spend a lot of my personal time away from Austin doing this, recording podcasts. Like even right now, my sweet husband is making dinner while I record this podcast instead of being in the kitchen with him. And it's because I truly feel like this is a blessing. This platform is a blessing. So when I sit back and reflect on those comments or those people challenging me, I'm like, okay, selfish. I don't I don't really see how it's selfish other than the fact that I really enjoy it. I'm not monetizing. I have never made a dollar off my podcast. I am not getting – I don't have all these sponsors. Like everything I tag on social media is because I want to tag it, not because I'm being paid to tag it. And that's very misunderstood, but all in all, like reflecting on what I'm doing has made me realize how proud I am of it. And I want to challenge you to do the same. When you hear people challenging what you're doing and pushing back and telling you it's wrong or it's too different or, hey, there's assumptions being made or rumors floating, think back as to why. And if there's something that you should be concerned about or there's something that ignites concern, yes, like let's take a step back and let's change that. But for me, it doesn't really ignite concern. I know why I'm doing this. I know that God has placed 
a voice in me for a reason. I know that I find this fun. I know that I'm doing well in my day job in the Navy and that this isn't distracting from that. So all of those reflections come back and they give me the green light. Keep going. Keep going and keep doing it. And if you feel like you reflect and you you have a red light or a yellow light and you're like, uh-oh, okay, maybe this is selfish in nature. Maybe this isn't because I want to do good in the world. Like what what is driving me in this? Like think of that intention. Then that's exactly why we reflect. But I'd say for me, being misunderstood is a superpower in that way because I constantly reflect about what I'm doing and it allows me to refocus. And that's kind of leads into number two, which is being misunderstood as a superpower because it allows me to really embrace my purpose. And I, I'm saying this with the biggest smile on my face and I'm getting kind of emotional, honestly, because I know God has big plans for me. And for, I'm a God girl. You guys know that Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans that God has for me. And I always think back to that. I know the plans which God has for me. I know they are big and I know they have purpose and I know he has a plan. So why would I sit around and listen to what everyone else thinks and what they all want to believe? What I know my heart and I know my intention and I know God has a plan for me. God has a plan and there is a purpose. There is a purpose and a reason why I fell into pageants and why I failed as a service warfare officer and I've overcome and really embraced these challenges along the way. There has been a purpose for all of that. There was a purpose for me modeling. There was a purpose for me learning photography. There was a purpose in all of that because I learned how to use social media. I learned how to find a voice. I learned what I was good at in moments where I felt like I was failing. Like I realized I was able to build confidence through my passions and through all these different outlets, they all led, they all had a a purpose and they've led to me finding my voice and using it for good. And God's not going to get in the way of that. He's going to amplify that. So being misunderstood is completely okay because you're going to reflect and you're going to sit back and you're going to remember your purpose. You are going through X because God has Y in store for you. And I'm totally okay with that. And I believe in God. And so no matter how much negativity or hateful comments come my way or judgments are made, I'm going to focus on that purpose. And lastly, build resiliency. I got this question recently and someone was like, how, like, how, how are you this resilient? Like, what did you go through? What did you do? And it really stems from the fact that every time I have failed, which has been a lot, something good has come from it. Something good. I learned a lesson. A door was opened. A chapter closed. A new one started. Like something positive came from it. So why would I not trust the process? And why would I not bounce back? And for those of you who are very early on in your journeys, maybe in your faith or maybe just in life, these things are going to keep happening and you're going to think it's the end of the world, but then you're going to get through it and you're going to say, wow, I'm so happy that through this process, I realized how much power there is in believing in myself believing that I can do this and I will get through this and having faith that you'll cross to the other side. There's so much power in that. So I just let it all happen. That's fine. It's all fine. I am okay with being misunderstood because it is leading me to be more clear 
about my own purpose in life. And I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep moving forward. And I challenge all of you to embrace being misunderstood. Embrace the journey of what your differences are and what they're creating, what the path that it's creating for you. This journey I am on, none of it, me going to the Super Bowl, me being in the Navy, me marrying Austin, me competing in Miss California, like all of these things would have never happened had I not trusted that there was something in me that was different than the person next to me. And if I said yes to these opportunities, there's an opportunity to amplify those differences because life is way too short to sit back and be the same as everyone else, to sit back and listen to the noise, to sit back and believe in the assumptions they're making about you, but they don't even know you. All that matters, you know you. You know your heart. You know your purpose. You know what's driving you. Channel that. Focus on it and push through because you've got a superpower and it's being misunderstood. Guys, I'm so excited for season four. So freaking pumped. I am so happy I re recorded this episode because. Although we love a good tell-all, we love addressing the rumors, we love spilling the tea, this podcast, this platform is about uplifting and it's about inspiring. And for all of you out there who are thinking, I can't get through this, I promise you can. For all of you out there thinking, people just don't get me, good, good. I'm glad they don't because that means you stick out you are different. You don't blend in. And we need people like you. We absolutely need people like you. There is a plan and there is a purpose. And we're becoming resilient queens because of everything that we're going through and we can get through it. I'm so excited. Looking forward to an amazing season of incredible guests sharing all the biggest misunderstandings that they've gone through or the assumptions that have been made about them, but we're tackling everything in between. And I'm so excited to take you on this journey with me through season four. Thank you so much for being here. I truly love and appreciate every single one of you. Cheers, guys. Season four, here we go. What is up, world? This is Kelly Hall Sabraki, your misunderstood, and I am here with another installment of Questions with Kelly. I am working through my DMs and working through old Q and A's. Boy, do you guys ask a lot of questions, which I love, and it kind of causes me to do some self reflection and really just kind of check in on me, my purpose, what I do, what I love, what I hate along the process. So. Today's Q&A edition of Questions with Kelly is specifically, how do I blank? So I asked you guys quite a while ago on social media, how do I blank? And you submitted your questions. How do you do blank? So I'm going to get through as many as I possibly can in this short episode and answer your questions. Yes, they are so miscellaneous, but I'm going to stick with a non military theme as best as possible so you guys can get to know me a little bit better and really just kind of bridge the gap so you guys remember, oh, I'm not just someone in uniform. I'm a real person with real hobbies, with a real life behind the scenes. So first question I have is from Faith underscore Ellen 99. Kelly, how do you get through a tough breakup? Great question. I know that this is probably what you've already heard. I think the only way to get through a tough breakup really is time. Time does reveal all and time makes everything a little bit better. You get into a new routine, new regimen. I'd say for me, when I was getting over a tough breakup, my hardest breakup was definitely in my early 20s. 
And I really dove into my passions. I dove into friendships and I filled up my calendar. So that way I wasn't really like sitting around thinking, stressing, worrying, crying. I was making points with friends. I was meeting new people and again, pouring myself into my passions. So circling back, my hardest breakup was in, I was living in San Diego at the time. I was, you know, starting up a photography business And then I was also still like trying to get out and meet people in the city that I had just moved to a a year and a half prior. So I texted the minimal friends I had. And one of those friends, actually, she spray tanned me. Chelsea Chapel, she was a bridesmaid at my wedding, actually. She spray tanned me every week for like a year. And in that time of trying to overcome this breakup, I reached out to her and I said, hey, you want to grab a drink? And we went out. Obviously, a wonderful friendship blossomed and she ended up being a bridesmaid in my wedding back in April. So I say filling up your calendar definitely helps a lot, but be selfish. Take that time for you. Okay. Next question is from Abby underscore Wilhelm. Kelly, how do you practice your faith on a regular basis? Yeah, that's a tough question. You know, I think a lot of people believe that you need to be going to church every single Sunday and that knowing a lot of scripture and having like active Bible weekly Bible studies is the answer. That's incredible. And I definitely like strive to be that person one day, but COVID with moving and PCSing and my consistently hectic lifestyle has really forced me to create my own kind of path with my faith. And so I really just pray a lot. I pray a lot and I look up scripture when needed and I self-reflect and I listen to him. I listen to what he's placing in my heart. So I would say like just talking to him consistently is how I practice faith. Next question is from Camille underscore Jade. Kelly, how do you get your nails done while staying with the Navy regs? Great question. You can look up the instruction on Navy regulations, type it into Google or go to my Navy HR. But really, I'd say your... I think it's like longer than three inches. You can't have your nails longer than three inches, which is kind of a long, long nail. Like no super long acrylics or anything like that. There is a new policy on like colors, like what you can and cannot have. But I think like an overall method to stay true to is it has to be a color complementary to your skin tone. So if it looks a little bit brighter than your skin tone, if you're even really questionable about it, don't do it. I do a lot of pale pinks, a lot of browns, um, and currently I have this like pretty pink pearl color on. I really love doing dip because it always stays on forever. But yeah, I make sure I get my nails in every month because it's another way to stay feminine in uniform. All right, next question. Kelly, do you take medications for your migraines? I do. Unfortunately, I have to do Botox. In my neck, shoulders, and head every 90 days. And then I also take an injection in my leg when I get them, which is not fun. Next question is from Everyone Loves Beth. Kelly, how do you handle performance anxiety? Yeah, this is a terrific question. I say largely my work with Heather Sumlin. She's a mental management coach. She has helped check her out on Instagram. She's incredible. Heather Sumlin, she really helped prep me. I do a lot of visualization, a lot of mental rehearsal. That has been probably the number one change for me and helped a lot in those stressful situations. Next question is from XO Angela. XO, Kelly, how do you manage being in the military and being an influencer? Would love to be able to do the same. Yeah, I really just do it for fun. And I think I've told you guys a million times over, you know, if you're spending your extra time, like, I hope you love your job, but sometimes your passions aren't what put food on the table, right? Like you have all these passions, do them because they bring joy to your heart, not necessarily because they bring money to your bank account. Put that on a t-shirt, right? Like, I love being an influencer because it came by accident. I just started showing up to social media, speaking my truth, really pouring my heart into my captions. It was very therapeutic for me. So that's why, like in my spare time, my time commuting, if I'm sitting on a plane, if I'm sitting on the couch, 
I get inspiration randomly in the shower and I grab my phone and I write down a caption. Like that's fun for me. So it's really in my spare time. And then my full-time job fuels me in other ways. You know, I definitely feel like I'm consistently challenged as a leader constantly in my job. And that also spills over to my social media because the lessons I learned in my everyday job, I show up and I teach you guys about. Okay, let's see. Oh, you guys have a lot of breakup questions. That makes me really sad. I'm not going to say your name. Her last name is, it looks like, I'll just say from Kiki, get over, how do you get over the person you thought was the one? Here's the thing. If they are the one, they will show up for you and they will continue to show up for you. And it will be transparent that they are the person for you. And I know that sometimes you have to drift apart before you come together and there's those love stories. But I will say that I thought there was a person that was supposed to be my person took years to get over. And then I met Austin and I'd never looked back because when I met Austin, it was the easiest decision of my life. He was the person for me. Nothing has been easier in my life than committing myself to Austin. It fit like the perfect puzzle piece. And that's how it is whenever you find the right person. So hold out, have faith and pray. Speaking of which, next question, how do you pray? From Lewis Line 123, I talk to him like he's my mother. I talk to him like he's my friend. I talk to him like I am talking to a girlfriend over brunch. Like I just say, hey God, I am really curious about this. I'm worried about this. I'm stressed about this. Like, please just place peace in my heart and clarity in my path because of X, Y, Z. And that's how I talk to him. And it's nothing crazy. It's nothing fancy. I don't recite anything. And it really, every single time I get done, I felt like I released something and it's how I've strengthened my relationship to him. Okay, next question from Chuck underscore Cindy. Mace, how do you juggle all of your activities? Prioritization, number one, I prioritize my time first with my career. Navy always comes first. That's what builds my life and pays my bills. I also obviously love my job in the Navy. With any free time I have, I then populate it with time with Austin. And then third, whatever free time I have, I space it out with schoolwork, with, you know, podcasting, and then with influencing. And then, you know, when I was doing modeling or photography, I'd kind of sprinkle that in as well. But I plan and I try to plan for at least one or two social events a month to go to to see friends. So I have a calendar that I color code and I plan everything out almost two months in advance, which makes me sound like psycho, but that's how I do it. And, you know, on that note, like it is 830 at night on a Tuesday and I'm recording this podcast while Austin is playing video games. So this is this is how I balance it and this is how I make it work. Okay, next question is, wow, you guys have a lot of questions. I really appreciate that. Next question is from IDWIT525. How do you start your mornings? Honestly, I don't have anything Instagrammable in my mornings. I set my alarm for six o'clock. I sleep in or I snooze it one more time. I pop out of bed. I have my clothes pre-laid out. I throw on my clothes I wear for my commute because I don't wear my uniform when I commute. I do my makeup in less than 10 minutes, sometimes eight minutes. Pour my coffee and we're out the door. Boom, train time. So it's pretty quick. My morning routine is about 15 minutes. Nothing glamorous. I'd say the best part of my morning is when I'm sitting on the train for over an hour. That's always amazing. I spend that time going through my to-do list, sometimes shopping, sometimes ordering groceries, pushing out my podcast, creating content. That's like my me Kelly time, which I absolutely love. Okay. A couple more questions is from Kelly. How do you, this is from, I think, Soa Life. How do you... I think this question, it says work stress when you get home. I think it's like, how do I relieve or like diminish that work stress when I get home? I leave it behind me. I know it sounds so easy, but like I have that hour commute, which is my decompression time. And then when I get home, I really don't talk about work. I'll talk about work with Austin first 10 minutes when I leave the office. I'll call him on my way to the train. But, you know, really like keep those emotions at the door when you walk in, make it your time, make it your space and make it about you. Okay. Last two questions. 
It's from Hey Hey, it's Liv. Kelly, how do you stay motivated in the gym fitness? Oh, girl, I have been struggling with that. I, this is not a good question for me right now. Full disclosure, it is December and I have not worked out since August. I know, cringe city, USA. But when I talked about prioritization, I used to be able to prioritize Navy, Austin, gym, passions. Like gym like came as a routine part. Now with my work schedule, gym has definitely fallen off the wayside. And that's because I started my MBA program. So any free time I have in the mornings or in the evenings, I commit to working on one of those things and then also trying to show up for you guys on the podcast. So this has been a hard season for me, but I also like want to give myself grace that it's okay. When I was super ripped and like pageant ready, I had a lot more time and I didn't have the demanding career, like the demanding billet. I have in the Navy right now. I have a really hard billet right now in the Navy. And that's okay. Like, I still try to eat really healthy and be really healthy. And that's the best I can do. And that's fine. So give yourself grace. And, you know, and I'm going to get back into it slowly. Little arm workout here, little leg workout here. But just a little bit at a time goes a long way. Also, if you need to sign up for classes, class pass, core power. They all do like weeks free, that sort of thing when you sign up. So check that out. I don't know if you guys can hear. I'm getting exhausted just recording this episode. I can't believe it's almost nine at night. But I, again, I want to show up for you guys because this matters to me. Okay. Last question is, (laughs) actually, I have three really funny questions I want to get through. Actually, they're not that funny, but they're pretty interesting. Okay. Last three questions. This one's from Tama Killura. Killura? Killura? Kelly, how do you focus on your own path and not let anyone's opinions or doubts get in the way? First is faith. I have a lot of faith in my path because I know God is placing it in front of me. And there's a reason. We're all on this earth to be no one other than ourselves. And we're all given unique talents and unique skills. And I truly believe that. I don't think I'm on this planet to be someone else. Like I think I'm on this planet to be Kelly Hall Zabraki. And so I really tap into that. I have a lot of faith. And then with that, I have confidence. I have confidence in my abilities and what makes me me and what makes me different. And it's truly also about happiness. Like if I'm not pursuing my passions, if I'm not doing social media or podcasting or trying to uplift others. Like I don't really know my purpose. So I'm going to keep doing that because that fills my cup. If I can't fill up my cup, I'm not showing up for other people. And ironically, showing up for other people and trying to inspire them is what fills my cup. So it's cyclical. Over time, I've really stopped caring about what other people think because the people that are in my circle that know my heart, their opinions are the only ones that matter for me. And as long as my in-laws, my parents, my husband, Jackie, my best friends are proud of me, then that's really all that I care about. Second to last question from Luis Mendez 001. Kelly, how do you balance everything when you were in college and avoid a mental breakdown? Oh my goodness, Luis, I did have mental breakdowns when I was at the Naval Academy and I didn't do nearly as many activities as I do now. I only focused on school. I had to do one activity because the Naval Academy requires you to do one activity. I did dance team and I also ran. But you better believe I had mental breakdowns for sure. So I took it day by day. I planned out my weeks. I was very organized and I prioritized. Lastly, and I think that this is a perfect question to end on, ironically. It's from John Y. And the question is, Kelly, how do you have so much time to post on here and go places if you're an officer? And I'm going to handle that by saying no matter who you are, whether you're an officer, you're an enlisted, you're a CEO, you're the president, everyone needs to prioritize self-care, period. You cannot show up for other people if you are not taking care of yourself. You are going to drain yourself out. You're going to lose your fire. Your light is going to be dim. There is just no way. So you have to self-care with the things that matter to you, like I just said. I prioritize trips, 
long weekends, visiting friends, spending time with friends, doing the things that matter to me. It makes me a better person, makes me a nicer person. It makes me remember why I do what I do and ultimately makes me a better leader because I reset that battery every single time I take time for myself. It's not selfish. So like I said, I don't care who it is. Take time off. Take a Friday. Take a day to go get your hair done. Communicate with the people around you. Communicate with your spouse. Communicate with your boss. And remember that it's not selfish to put yourself first. You have to do that in order to stay afloat. And then also ultimately to put others before you as well. So on that note, I hope you guys like the special edition of Questions with Kelly. How do you slash how do I, because I am Kelly, I loved your questions and I always love hearing from you guys. Feel free to slide into my DMs at kelly.sabraki on social media and comment. I would love to hear what you guys loved about this episode. If you guys love Questions with Kelly, I love showing up for you guys. You guys are all amazing. Thank you, and I hope we eradicated some of your misunderstandings on this episode. Until next time, this is Kelly Sabraki with Misunderstood. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Misunderstood Podcast. I love hearing from you guys, and I want you to take a screenshot of this episode, tag at misunderstood.podcast on Instagram, and share a takeaway from today's episode. Something you loved, something you wanted more of, whatever it is, it helps me learn what you guys want to hear. Please consider leaving a review on iTunes or Spotify. I want to give a special shout out to my friends at Hatch for producing this episode. If you're looking to launch a podcast or if you already have one, you can get unlimited podcast editing by visiting usehatch.fm. That's usehatch.fm. Thanks so much, guys. Until next week, this is your misunderstood Kelly Hall. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The More You Give. I'm your host, Jackie Barnum. Today's episode is brought to you by VetTix. VetTix is an organization that provides sports tickets, entertainment tickets to shows for veterans and service members. Go check out their website at vettix.org. That's V-E-T-T-I-X.org. As a disclaimer, everything I say in this podcast is my own opinion, Jackie Barnum, and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or the Marine Corps. Okay, so... I am super excited about today's episode upon the like, you know, idea of even starting this podcast. It was honestly inspired by this guest. Um, We have Ryan Mannion, who is the president of the Travis Mannion Foundation. And even just going on your website, it's like, there's so many more things, you know, has written books, you know, does public speaking events, does like just so many things. So I have been looking forward to this for so long and I cannot wait to talk to you. So thank you so much, Ryan, for being on this show today. Yeah, I'm happy to. I want to honestly like (laughs) talk about first how, because I haven't met you in person, but I feel like I know you and I straight up like slid into your DMs a year ago because I was just happened to be looking on Instagram and I saw Ryan Mannion started following you and I was like, like, you know, my jaw dropped and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I got so excited. I think I texted a few people about it. And then I messaged you and I just was like, (laughs) Ryan, I am so honored to, that you're following me. Like, please let me know if you ever need, I just was like, so, cause I've known who you are for a long time. Like I, 
you know, been involved in Travis Mannion events um, at the Naval Academy and whatnot. And so I've known who you are from afar. And then I just was like total fangirling over you. But then what was cool was that you messaged me back for, you know, immediately. And you're like, oh, I'm actually a huge fan of yours. And I just was like, let me just let me just faint over here because that anyway. So that was just sliding into your DMs just worked. <laughs> Well, I have to tell you, you were, um, you were, uh, or, and are, uh, my daughter is such a huge fan of yours. And, um, I've shared with you that my daughter, you know, is the Naval Academy is somewhere that she's thinking about going and, you know, and, and I'm, I was born into a military family. My dad's a Colonel in the Marine Corps. My brother was a Marine, uh, I, I, I've been surrounded by Marines, hence my children have been surrounded by Marines. But I will say my kids have not been exposed to many, if at all, female Marines. And so, um, you know, this idea when, when we would talk to Maggie about the military, my oldest daughter, you know, she couldn't even picture herself in the Marine Corps because she identified it as like a very male driven industry, you know, Marines are men. And when she started following you, she all of a sudden began to see herself in Marine shoes. And so I thank you for that because, you know, you think that growing up in a household that's filled with Marines, she would identify with that, but it wasn't until she found you that she started to see like, oh, I, I can see myself in, in these shoes now. So, or these little heels. So I, I thank you for that. And she She's a big fan of yours. And like I said, I'm that a big means, fan of yours as that well. That means so much to me. Um, I know. I feel like I, when I was her age, I, like there was no one to look at, you know? And I feel like, because, you know, Instagram was so new. I think I like made my Instagram when I was at the Naval Academy. So, you know, it's just, yeah, having someone to be like, oh, I actually like can see myself doing those things. So I love that I've connected with her and connected to you through all that. So it's just so awesome. Um, the first thing I want to talk about with you is, is, you know, kind of speaking of Maggie and, uh, you know, the next generation, um, you have a podcast called The Resilient Life what, that, you know, talks about resilience. And me being a company officer at the Naval Academy Prep School, dealing with, um, you know, 18, 19, 20-year-old kids kind of, you know, they're adults, but they're just leaving home or um, going through that transition and teaching that age group resilience. Um, how do you, how do you like, what advice can you give or how do you start instilling resilience in that, that age group or even, you know, kids younger? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because so through the work of the Travis Manning Foundation, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little backstory. When we started the Travis Manning Foundation, one of our main objectives was, of course, to provide support to returning veterans and families of the fallen. Um, but our original mission statement also had, you know, our original mission statement was provide support to returning veterans and families of the fallen and to play a role in um, creating the next generation of leaders. And I will tell you, when we put that mission statement together, we didn't know what that meant, but we just knew that somehow we wanted to play in that space. We knew how important it was for young kids who are making these decisions about what the rest of their lives look like. And, um, you know, today, we're, we actually train veterans to mentor youth and talk to youth about character and resilience and what it means to live a life of service. And, you know, it, it's, I, I don't feel so far removed from like when I was in high school, like these, these things that small things can seem like the end of the world, right? I, I look at my kids now, I've got two teenage daughters and, you know, it's all about putting things in perspective for them. And, you know, I, I, my, my favorite thing to say to my kids, because, you know, for my 13 year old, the world's ending over the smallest things, right? Every day. And, you know, and then for my 15 year old, she's in this position now where she's trying to identify like, what does my life look like? And, and, you know, she's starting to think about like, where do I want to go to school? Where do I want to go to college? And, you know, just last week she did bad on a, a history test. And she came home and it was like her world had ended. And I said, you know, 
Maggie, failure is a bruise, not a tattoo. That is one of my favorite sayings, but it's also a value at the Travis Manning Foundation. It's one of our values. And I think it's so important for not just kids, but for everybody to understand that like life is a series of ebbs and flows, right? And we can't allow one small failure to define us. And if we are kind of attuned to this idea that that our life is these these peaks and valleys, it makes like the difficult times easier to to digest. And it's always what I'm saying. I'm like, listen, you, you did poorly on this test. Well, guess what? That gives you the opportunity to do well next time. And it's it's about knowing that no matter how low you get, you have to know that you can always work your way out. And if you can kind of stick with that mindset, it's obviously much easier said than done. But if you can stick to that mindset, it makes things so much more palatable in this like journey of life. You know, we know that like it, we're in a low, but but we're always going to come up from there. And we and we just have to keep practicing that and believing in that. And, you know, resiliency is like you've got to practice it. It's not something where you can just be like, I'm going to be resilient, like oh, I'm going to be resilient. You have to actually practice the art of resilience and you practice it when you have to be resilient. Right. And so um, you have to remind yourselves in those times where you're, you're challenged, where you're you're dealing with adversity. You have to remind yourself that like this is you know, one page in a book and you, you can turn that page very quickly and you can work yourself into the next chapter. Right. And my favorite saying that I think about when I think of resiliency is the, um, the only way through is through. That's yeah. what I try to tell my students. And I have noticed like for me growing up saying the word quit, like I, can I, I, it like makes me like uncomfortable to even say those words, you know, like, but sometimes I've seen this trend of students where as soon as things get hard, it's, it's easy for them to look me in the eyes and say, I quit. I want to be done because, and I don't know if that's because some people just are raised differently where, you know, people are like, oh, it's okay. If you don't want to do this, you don't have to, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. And if you kind of instill that in their minds and they actually get to, the Naval Academy or Naval Academy Prep School or boot camp or OCS or whatever, and they're actually faced with like a no kidding challenge, they don't know how to push through. It's just they're they're it's they're used to just saying like, well, I'm I'm uncomfortable, so I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah, and I think you know, I mean, listen, a as a parent, you never want to see your your kids struggling. You never want to see your kids like dealing with anything uncomfortable. But every time my kids do deal with something uncomfortable or challenging, I'm grateful for that because I know that's preparing them for what comes next in life. And, you know, if 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 you're not going to if you're going to be kind of coddled um, and, and we talk about this with character, like the, the end of the day, you know, you can be a straight A student, you can be um, an all American athlete. But if no one's teaching you how to be like a good person. You know, you can still be a jerk and be a straight A student and an all-American athlete. And guess what? Guess what's most important out of those three things? Being a good person, right? Doing the right thing. And so, you know, it's important to like kind of teach your kids and and that like these are these are such important life lessons. Um, and and you can't be afraid to listen, if you quit or you keep going, it's gonna be hard either way, right? Like either way, it's hard. So that's what I always say. Like you can quit or you can keep going. Both ways are going to be hard. So pick which way you want to go. Right. And I think an interesting thing too with resilience is that there's kind of like a fine line that we as, I mean, I'm not a parent, but I like to think of myself as a parent sometimes for my students, but like we watch sure. them and we see them, you know, struggling and we, we, we need them to struggle. We can't, like you said, we can't coddle them all the time. We can't always, you know, catch them and they need to learn through failure sometimes. But then how do you, how do you know when to intervene and how do you know exactly, you know, because they could fall and then they could really, really keep falling. And I'm just curious, like what your thoughts are on when's that point where you're like, okay, they actually need like some, this person needs some help now. Yeah. Well, you know, 
I had General Dumford uh, on my podcast and I got to talk to him a lot about resilience. And he said something and, and I lean back on it. I actually was just sharing it with my staff last week. We did a whole debrief of like his talk on my podcast because some of the things he said, everything that he says, I think is so incredible. But when we started talking about resilient, he said, you know what, Ryan, you can't be resilient and be alone. And, you know, he talked about the need for like embracing your support system, right? Like relationships are everything. And, you know, we have to, number one, allow ourselves to be carried forward by those that love us when, when we're in these hard times. But we also have to recognize, um, we also have to recognize when we need to reach out and, and say, Hey, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be here to lift you up and help you through this time. And, and, there's nothing wrong, number one, with asking for help. And there's nothing wrong for, with offering help. You know, that's not that's not giving the easy way out to your kids or your students. That's just saying like, hey, this is the place you're in and I'm going to help you get through to the next step. So, you know, I, I, I think it's always OK to say, you know, what can I do to help you get through this phase? Right. And that's. Yeah, I I have a whole thing. I know, I know you have the Travis Manning Foundation does tons of mentoring programs, which is amazing. And then I've recently started trying to do connecting people with mentors because you're right, like we're not alone. And every problem, and I, again, I try to tell whenever I have Marines or my students, I say like no problem that you will face is an original problem. There is somebody who has been through it, somebody who has figured this out. Like no, there is no permanent situation that we can't fix and just trying to because again and then there's because there's kids of course who are so used to being on their own and not asking for help and for me personally i feel like when i was that age i was just so trying to be under the radar and not bother people and not ask questions because i was in that like survival mode for four years at the naval academy just trying not to get <laughs> yelled at but i think i did myself a disservice by not reaching out to people for more help because I really did feel very alone for a long time. Even as when I commissioned, it's only really until recently where I'm like, okay, there's like people around here that, that can help me. Um, so what advice would you give, you know, even like to your daughter about reaching out to people and getting, getting guidance now, not waiting. I will say this is one of the things that I struggle with. Um, I, again, you know, I, I talk about a lot, like I, I growing up in a military family, my dad's a retired Marine Corps Colonel. And like for a very long time growing up, like ailments were kind of, of the body only, right. Not of the mind. And then like in the, the off chance they were of the mind and you were kind of like struggling with stuff, like they could be healed by the body. Like I remember, you know, even saying like, when I was young in high school, if I would say, and my mom was much more, you know, understanding, but if I would say like I was in a bad place or anything talking about kind of how I was feeling, my dad would say, we'll go for a run, you know? And, and I would be like, okay. So like, that's what I would do. Like go for a run, like a run could cure everything. And so I was almost like trained to believe that like, Anything that I was struggling with, if I just went for a run, it would make it better. I, I wasn't kind of like taught to reach out and to express my feelings. And, um, you know, and so that's kind of how I became as an adult when I struggled. And, you know, I, I definitely went through some challenging times after I lost my brother. Um, and I was kind of afraid to say like, hey, I'm not feeling myself. I don't feel, I mean, what it, when my brother died, I went and ran a marathon. I was like, I guess I got to go on an even longer run now, right? Like, this is what I have to do. Oh, wow. So, but, but then I started to realize like, well, no, I need a little bit more than that. So that's actually a big challenge for me. And it's something that I'm always pushing like, and I still have trouble kind of expressing like, I'm in a bad place because I always feel like I have to be the problem solver. So, you know, with my kids, I'm always trying to like, I'm always trying to talk to them in a way that I didn't always get talked to, right? Like kind of, how are you feeling? Like pulse checks with them, right? As opposed to just everything like, what kind of grades are you getting? What's going on here? What's going on there? But just 
trying to be their friend in a way that like, I want them to feel like they can tell me anything, you know, like I'm, I'm an open book. You will never be judged. And we will always find a way through any situation together, you know? And so, but the art of practicing that myself is something that I, I'm still working on, I will say. Right. And I think as a Marine and my, my old CEO, who's my mentor would do this to me is he would humanize himself literally when giving me advice. And he still does this to this day when I'm, cause I ask him anything and everything. And he will be like, okay, Jackie, this is Billy talking to you. Like, this is Billy. This isn't Lieutenant Colonel, whoever, whoever, you know, this is Billy talking to Jackie and this is, you know, and I think that is really huge and something that I, I will say like a really rewarding moment that I had recently actually with a student and advice that I would give is this, you know, don't give up on, on kids when they're closed off. Um, because I had a student, I could tell something was wrong. You know, you could just kind of tell when they're like a little disheveled or, you know, you could just pick up, pick up as a mom, you can like pick these things up really quickly. But so I pulled him in and I was just like, Hey, you know, Steven, how are you doing? Is everything okay? And yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm like, it just closed book would not open up. And I was like, okay, well you're, you know, I just noticed you're, not yourself lately. So just remember like if anything's going on, like I am here and he walked out the door, literally two minutes came back and knocked on the door. And he said, ma'am, I actually like really appreciate you asking. Can I actually tell you what's going on now? And I just was like, yes, please. Apps. Of course. You know, it takes that little bit of like, you, you know, that trust, you got to build some trust first. But I was like, so when he came back, I was like, Oh, yes. Okay. Like, and I could tell as soon as he got that off his chest and I, you know, gave him some advice and let him just speak, you know, he physically like looked like a little bit of a weight was lifted off his shoulders because I think a lot of these, these kids, again, like going through that transition in life, signing up to serve their country, going to the Naval Academy. So like mentally, they're like preparing to be adults. So they think they have to deal with all these things on their own. And they just don't. And and I keep and I hear so often where I ask, like, why, you know, why didn't you tell anybody about this? Like, we could have helped you so long ago. And in their minds, I don't know where this comes from. And I want to break this cycle. But th I've heard a few times where they say, well, you know, like when I ask for help, that's weak. And I just well, like, yeah. oh, yeah. And I think that's, I think that's unfortunately still a little bit of the culture that exists in the military. Um, I think there's been big strides taken um, to overcome that, but it is, I mean, it, you can say a thousand times over, tell us how you're feeling, tell us how you're feeling. But, you know, to say like, I I'm, I'm struggling all of a sudden it's like, well, we're preparing you to be America's, you know, leading fighting force like you can't you know so it, it's it's a double-edged sword so i totally get the idea of you know these these prep kids and naval academy students and you know kids going through ocs they don't want to say that they're having an issue you know um because right all of a sudden that singles them out is like hey you know that kid's kind of going through something whereas um frankly right now i think it puts you in a, a state of strength because it's like hey i have the strength to come out and say like this is what i'm dealing with and i'm ready to tackle it head on you know right and especially when these kids this age i i that are my students i've noticed it's that age where you know that loss is first time for them so a lot of you know losing of an aunt or a parent or a grandparent. And that's the first time that they're dealing with this and having to kind of help them navigate that grief. And, but there's a lot of them that go through that. Unfortunately, you know, I hate that for them and it pains me when my students are in pain, but, you know, just having them be able to support each other and providing them the resources and be like, Hey, you're not alone. And not only what you're going through, like you're, you're going through this and it's hard and you're going to come out stronger, but you are now a resource to somebody else that will be yeah. going through this. Totally. So Ryan question for you about the Travis Manning foundation when it started, what was kind of like the first, cause I know just looking on the Travis Manning foundation, like website, it's like events, 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 you know? So what was like the first kind of event that you all put together? So the first actual event, 
we weren't the Travis Mannion Foundation at this point. So after after Travis was killed, um, you know, again, you, you want to talk about like social media at the time it was like MySpace was, you probably are too young for this, but MySpace was oh, like- Oh, I have a MySpace. Okay. It's so, out there and it won't be deleted and I hope no one goes and searches for it. <laughs> so that was- It's kind out of, there. Yeah, that was the social media platform. Facebook really kind of was a, a college thing. Like it was kind of starting on college campuses. And so there was no, um, you know, there was no- go fund me or any of these like uh, fundraising platforms or anything like that. And, you know, when Travis was killed, um, my parents' friends said, you know, we, we want to set up a memorial fund. And um, they went to like a local bank in, in our town and they set up the first Lieutenant Travis Mannion Memorial Fund. And um, in Travis's obituary, it was like in lieu of flowers, please donate to the first Lieutenant Travis Manning Memorial Fund. And it was like an address of a, a local bank, right? It was like, send your checks in here. So, you know, you think about like these platforms today that are just go viral, but in, in, even in that kind of old school approach, a couple of weeks after Travis's death, we had several hundred thousand dollars in this bank account. And at the time, we had no idea what we were going to do with it. We knew we we knew we wanted to do something at the Naval Academy. Um, we wanted to do something at Travis's high school, but beyond that, we weren't thinking of the Travis Manning Foundation. Um, but we were like, all right, well, we're just going to keep like doing events and you know, kind of for us, it was just about like keeping Travis's memory alive and like. And so the first thing we actually did was run the Marine Corps Marathon because Travis had signed up to run the marathon two weeks prior when he was in Iraq. He had um, called my dad and and my dad had run the Marine Corps Marathon several times because, you know, he was a Marine, and but he hadn't run in, in probably 10 years, the marathon, and never thought he was going to run again. And my brother called him from Iraq and said, um, hey, dad, I just signed up for the marathon, Marine Corps Marathon. Why don't we run it together? And, you know, my dad's like, what do you do when your son calls you from Iraq? Like I'd retired my marathon shoes, but I was like, all right, I guess I'm running. So my dad signed up and I'll never forget. We were sitting in my parents' family room and there was a ton of people there. This was a few days after Travis had died. And, you know, we're kind of like, just everybody's just sitting around. And my dad said like, well, you know, Travis had signed up for the Marine Corps marathon. Like, I'm I'm still gonna run it. I'm gonna run it for him. And it I I I talk about it in my book because it was like this scene from a movie. There was probably 20 people in the family room and it went around in the circle and like the person sitting next to him was like, I'm running it with you, Colonel. And like literally everybody, and I'm talking about like, you know, there were Marines in the room, but there were also like 60 year old women, and everybody's like, We're running the marathon. And I'm like just I'm sitting like, I'm kind of like last in line and I'm just like looking down at the carpet, like I'm not running a marathon, right? And then everybody's looking at me and I was just like, <laughs> okay, I guess I'm gonna run it too. And you know, it was really, for me, it was so therapeutic to just like focus on something. So, you know, that was in April that Travis was killed. Um, I started training June 1st. So from June 1st to the end of October, like I was on a mission because I'd never run more than five miles. Like that was kind of my max. Maybe I'd run a 10K at that point, but like never thought about like distance running in that capacity. So I really had to work at it. Um, but it was really good for me to like have that, like this is what each day looks like. I've got this goal. I've got to run this, you know, this amount. Um, but we had probably about 60 people run the marathon with us that first year. And I'm talking like out of those 60 people, 58 of them were like first time marathon runners. So it was, it was quite interesting, but we all crossed the finish line together. We raised more money for the first Lieutenant Travis Mannion, uh, uh, fund at the time and Memorial fund. And, um, and now, you know, that event has grown. We're one of the largest charity um, partners with the Marine Corps Marathon, and we have hundreds of people that run with us every year. And so it's it's kind of interesting to like look back, you know, that first year we were in the Marriott down in DC. And I mean, 
we had Travis, we, we, we had different people speak about Travis at that dinner. One of them being Brendan Looney, who was Travis's roommate at the Academy. And he ran the marathon for Travis. Um, he ran next to my dad that year in 2007. And then he would unfortunately be killed a few years later in Afghanistan, but like, it was a really personal event. So, you know, now we have people that just sign up because they want a charity slot and we have a low fundraising amount. So they join us, but I love the idea that they're like joining into this thing that started in such like an intimate grassroots way. Um, so it's, it's special. Um, I've done the marathon a couple other times, but, um, but I go down there every year just to cheer everyone on. I will have to admit, I have never run a marathon and now I feel like this is my, I've always like waiting for like a sign to run a marathon and I'm like, Oh geez. Your- now maybe this is my sign to run a marathon the Mar- and the Marine Corps marathon too. I know. I feel like I'm not a, like real Marine until I've run that. Um, <laughs> But one day, one day, and I feel like it's always like raining or snowing or just like just really horrible conditions, which is like what we thrive on as Marines. I mean, the last mar- the last time I ran it was in 2019 and it was it was torrentially downpouring for like the first 10 miles where we were down. We were at Haynes Point and I was running in like a foot of water and I I was like, I can't believe that. That, that I'm running in this and I was praying for the rain to stop and it did. And it stopped around like mile 15, but it stopped and it got so sunny and it was so steamy that like steam was coming up off the asphalt that, and it was so hot that I was praying for, I was like, start raining again. So yes, oh my it's, gosh. Always, it's always terrible conditions, but that's what makes it even sweeter at the end, you know? So how did you, and when did the Mannion Wad CrossFit stuff get tied in? Because I'm that's coming up in this month, right? Like this yeah. week. And yeah. I'm looking at, again, I was looking at the website to see the events. And it's just like, I think I was like scrolling and scroll all the scrolling and scrolling for a good like 30 seconds with all CrossFit gyms that are participating. So how did that come to be? So... The Mannion Wad is a a hero wad through CrossFit. And if you're part of the CrossFit community, like hero wads are, well, wad is workout of the day, right? Like every day you get a a wad. And so these hero wads are named after fallen service members, but they're actually pretty um, particular where they only make hero wads after fallen service members that they can show proof that they participated in CrossFit. I mean, it's, it's very interesting, um, thing that they do. But, but so the Mannion Wad, actually, there was a Marine that went to the Academy and wrestled with Travis. And when he got out of the Marine Corps, he went to work for CrossFit. So when Travis was killed, he was like, Travis and I were doing, you know, doing CrossFit in Iraq, like, you know, I've got proof of proof of CrossFit, you know, I'm going to make a wad for Travis. And so he created this wad, which is, um, it's, seven rounds of uh, 29 weighted back squats and a 400 meter run. And, you know, that, that, that matches up with his date of um, uh, 429, 2007, but it's, it's a killer workout. Um, It is all legs, right? So you're doing hundreds of squats and running, I don't know, it's like 2.1 miles all in after you, you get all the rounds in and Jimmy Letchford, who designed this workout, designed it because he said, you know, Travis was a wrestler at the Academy. And he's like, Travis was, his legs were like tree trunks. Like that's where all his strength derived from. But he also ran like a gazelle, like he could run forever. And so he's like, he was this interesting combination of having these huge legs, but just could run forever. And so that's kind of how the workout was designed. Um, and then we were able to take it with the Travis Manning Foundation and turn it into an event where it didn't just rest within the CrossFit community, but like bring it out to the broader community of like, hey, do you want like the ultimate challenge to honor fallen service members? Like here it is. And um, and so, yeah, we've got hundreds of gyms and then you can sign up individually too. Like we have thousands of people that just sign up and you can do the wad anywhere, which is a great thing. Um, and you can scale it, right? Like it's, it's weighted back squats, but 
I mean, most of the people I know that I do it with just do air squats and it's still, you know, hundreds of air squats and you've, and it's terrible no matter what. Um, but like last year during COVID, a lot of gyms were closed. I actually put out on my, on Instagram, on my story, I was like, Hey, doing the manion wad in my driveway on this date at this time, if you're interested, DM me for my address. I had like all these veterans that showed up and I had a, a sister of a fallen service member. They showed up in my driveway and we just did the manual wad together. So, you know, for, for us at the foundation, we do a lot of physical activities that are because we know that, you know, getting back to my dad saying go for a run. We know how important uh, physical exercise is to your mental health. It, it is a, a it's not the only component, but it's a huge component. And then two, there's also that that idea that like we are sometimes we let like fear hold us back from knowing our true potential of what we can accomplish. Like I never thought I could run a marathon. I if I'd had the man and wad just given out to me like, hey, do this workout, I'd be like, I can't do that. But when you've got a name tied to it of like a fallen service member, um, it gives you kind of that ex extra inspiration and. You know, we always say at the the foundation that Travis's name represents this post 9-11 generation of men and women who have sacrificed, right? Like we want his name to represent all of these men and women. So like when you're getting out there and you're thinking about you're on your like 250th squat and, you know, you just want to die, you know, you think about like, all right, this, this sucks, but like this is not anything compared to what this generation of warriors has done and stepped up to do. So it makes it a lot more palatable. And, um, and then, you know, then you get past, you know, that fear of the unknown and, and you kind of step into this place where you're like, wow, like I can accomplish so much more than I, than I thought I possibly could. And then you're reminded, you know, every day for a good five days when you're trying to walk downstairs and you cannot because you're oh, so yeah. sore. Yeah. <laughs> you're a like good, a good seven oh. days, I would say. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Ryan, for the Travis Manion Foundation, where do you see it, you know, in the next five, 10, 20 years? You know, for us at the foundation, when we talk about, you know, we do so many different things. We have so many different programs for veterans, for gold star families. Um, and and for civilians alike and you know i think that's one of the things that is unique to our organization is that our membership is about 130,000 um strong but civilians make up about 50% of that and you know we want to make sure that we are building a community and that in essence is what our organization is all about like a community of like-minded individuals that want to go out and and get stuff done you know, whether that's serving in the community, whether that's pushing themselves through physical activity um, and or whether that's teaching character to the next generation. It's about making sure that we're providing this community that that you can feel a part of and understand the essence of our military community. And so, you know, we are pretty set in the programming that we run and we are now we just put a 10 year strategic plan together and our plan is just to scale our already existing programs and, you know, be in even more regions, cities, uh, towns uh, across the country. That is, that is so wonderful. Um, my last question for you is for you specifically, what is your favorite Travis Mannion foundation event? Because you do, you know, I get the emails, you know, always asking for, you know, for volunteers for this. And then like you do refugee helping and you do the mentoring thing. There's so many ways to get involved. Um, so what's your personal favorite? I'm, I am I mean, for me, I think that the work we do through our character program is not only my favorite, but it's also has the most impact. You know, we have worked with over half a million kids um, across the country to date. Last year, over 50,000. And this idea that number one, we can give veterans a continued way to serve because you know, you're still in the uniform. When you take that uniform off, your desire to serve isn't gonna go away. And, and that's what we see from our men and women that are leaving active duty is 
they're still looking for ways that they can have an impact that they can give back. And when they're not given that opportunity to continue serving, that's where they run into problems with mental health decline. And so, you know, we want to be a preventative model to say, like, before you're dealing with things that are putting you in a position where you're having to walk into the VA because, you know, you're dealing with mental health challenges, we're we're preve- we're going to say, like, hey, you just took off the uniform. All right, we need you doing this, you know, and come be a part of our community. This is the way you can impact the next generation of leaders. And so we find um, the benefits to that are and, and listen, I, I'm probably the only non-veteran that gets to go up and and speak in this character program. I'm I'm leaving tomorrow to head to the Annapolis and give a brief to the second class midshipmen, which is my favorite thing to do every year. I speak at Travis's high school every year. I speak at summer seminar at the Naval Academy every year. And being able to tell that story to kids and like really talk to them about this idea of if not me, then who, um, they get it, right? And and for that 45 minutes that I have that captive audience, I know that some of them, like their lives are forever changed because all of a sudden it's something like a light bulb has clicked in them. And and the veterans that have the opportunity to share their story is so important. It's so important for them to continue sharing their story. So it's my favorite because I think it's the most impactful. And And frankly, I think, you know, it's the most important to our society as a whole. We have to keep, you know, playing a role in creating men and women of character. And um, I can think of no better group to do that than our men and women who served in uniform to take that uniform off and to go work with these kids and, and show them what service is all about, regardless of if they serve in the military, right? It's just about teaching them, like, you can be a servant leader in your own backyard. And, and this is the path that I chose, but this is, this is ultimately all the different ways that you can go out and serve. And um, it's, it's just so rewarding to see the change that's happening with the youth and um, the, the continued service with our military community. Right, right. So Ryan, where can people find you or get more information on the Travis Manion Foundation? Uh, you can go to travismanion.org and, um, and you can join our mission. Um, And joining our mission just means you're going to learn about things happening in your local region um, that you can be a part of. And um, you can find uh, Travis Manning Foundation on all social media platforms. Um, Myself as well. I'm probably the most active on Instagram at rmanion. Thank you so much. Ryan, is there anything else that you want to say? Um, no, I mean, thanks for thanks so much for having me on. And, you know, again, thank you, Jackie. I think that um, I was I was just showing my dad your Instagram. I was telling him yesterday I was going on with you. And I said, this is this is who Maggie met with on Zoom and they talked. And, you know, I just love the idea that there are strong females, young females that are kind of showing a different face to what it means to serve in the military. And you do it in such a great way. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much, Ryan. I love talking to you. I'm so, again, so honored to have you. Um, Your time is so, so important and valuable. So I'm so jealous that you're going to the Naval Academy this week. Oh, that's like just Annapolis is the best. So enjoy that. Enjoy your time there. Um, So with that, that is all we have for this episode for today. Um, I'm your host, Jackie Barnum. If you want to catch more of my episodes and content, please go follow me on the parade deck. Have a great day. We swung around, we came in, danger close, over right over the top of these guys and engaged with the building that the Taliban were in. And we came in and uh, as a crew, we blasted that door off its hinges and engaged the Taliban that were in there. The Green Berets and, you know, I, I can't ever talk enough about how heroic these guys were every time I ran across them in 
Afghanistan, jumped up immediately and assaulted the building.
I've been in scenarios where the president has been on the phone briefing people within the group that that mission is going to happen. And if you fail, this is America's failing on TV. Some of the highest targets uh, that the world has was executed by some people that I personally know. And if you fail, we fail. It's a big deal. Yeah. And however, if you win, you shut up. You, you wear a certain mask of command uh, because that's how we're trained. I think that's what's expected. But um, when you move past that, uh, when you're not in command, sharing the failures, not just the wins and all the, the sexy firefights and killing bad guys and kicking doors in and all the victories, really getting to a point in your life where you can share those failures with people so they learn those lessons. Because I, tr I truly believe this, man, is if you're not willing to share the failures, with this younger generation, you've now become part of the problem. Military is good at conditioning us, conditioning us to serve the role or the job that, that it needs out of us. Some of us choose the job that we want in the military and we serve in, the, in our, the capacity that suits us personally. Some get um, you know, on a, in a pipeline that ends up in a job that's not ultimately their best, best contribution or doesn't suit their personality. I would say in the transition, take a fresh view scan the horizon 360 what do leaders do they make decisions mm. bad leaders can't make decisions subordinates can't make decisions you can say what you want about it. senior leaders they're not afraid to make hard decisions meanwhile rockets rpgs we we are taking so much gunfire in our perimeter there are taliban members running through this was in ghazni there are members of the Taliban running through our base, literally shooting at U.S. soldiers. Yeah. And you got a call from your wife. Wife, my phone ring. Said, Hello, she said, babe. I said, hey, what's up, mama? She said, your mom just passed. I said, okay, I'll call you later. She was like, all right. This episode is sponsored by Tiffany and Bosco. High stakes disputes demand high impact trial attorneys. Will Fishbach and his trial team at Tiffany and Bosco deliver results for clients in the full spectrum of commercial and business litigation disputes. You get in the courtroom pretty quickly as an army jack. I had my first murder case within three months. Iron Triangle, uh, there's an island in this, you know, canal that has bad guys on it. A couple of detainees are rounded up, um, three of them. And the soldiers at some point said, just kill these guys, let's just waste them. The rules of engagement are, are not a suicide pact. I, I mean, the, the second you have a reasonable belief that either you or your unit are in danger, you absolutely positively deploy lethal force. The rumor mill starts going that that, um, that what happened to that family out there at TCP2 was that Army soldiers did it. I want to be the best attorney I can be for my clients, and, mm -hmm. and I also want to be the best leader I can in the, in the community. And, and those two things are not inconsistent. You know, by virtue of what I do in the community, I'm... Uh, better able to, to serve my clients. So, you know, my, my day job is I'm a litigation partner at a law firm called Tiffany & Bosco. It's uh, almost a little over 50 years old. I'm a trial attorney, meaning I, I take cases to trial. Uh, and I have the military to, to thank for giving me the, the, the breadth of experience to, to know how to take a case to trial and actually get up in front of a jury and, um, and, and truly try a case. You know, the military, it's very, it's paternalistic. I mean, you know, especially if you're a young enlisted soldier, you're, mm. you're, you're told where to live, what to eat, what to wear. You know, everything is very, uh, it, it's a highly structured uh, environment that, that governs your, your life when you're basically both on and off the clock. And, and, and it has to be that way. That's how you maintain good order and discipline within any unit. But 
the, the, the flip side of that is, you know, once you get that DD-214 and, and, and now you have to make all these decisions like, all right, where, where do I live? What, 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 what is my job? Do I, do I ask for a raise? Am, you know, am yeah. I making enough money here? Do I, do I look for a job somewhere else? Um, uh, those are questions I don't know that a lot of younger veterans are, are well equipped to answer. And I found this in my, you know, 12, 13 years of entrepreneurship as a full-time entrepreneur, full-time business owner. I mean, I've hired MBAs, literally, and I've hired people with no college degree that have 20 years experience. And candidly, I'll take the experienced guy. Every time. 10 times out of 10. Every time. Did the Army, would you say that really gave you your experience as opposed to maybe a first-year attorney that doesn't have military experience? Hey, nothing wrong with that, but doesn't have that. They have to get experience somewhere. So would you say you kind of... What's the term? You uh, broke your teeth or however that goes in the military? Uh, I can answer that question, yes, unequivocally. Um, huh. You know, the military, and I don't think it's just limited to just, just attorneys. Um, it, it gives you an opportunity to, um, particularly if you're an officer or, or even a kind of a, a junior kind of NCO position, you know, an opportunity to kind of assume ownership over what you're doing. Uh, but, but particularly as an attorney, you know, you, you get in the courtroom pretty quickly as, a, as an Army JAG. Um, and I think I first uh, started as litigating. I started on the defense side as a defense attorney in the started, you, you did? Or you say in general, you think just as the nature of the position, you get into the courtroom? I, I, I think the Army in general, if you want to take the opportunities, uh, will give you probably the best opportunity to not only get in the courtroom one right away, really, but also on big cases. I mean, I, I was probably a year, maybe a year and a half, two years in when I first started my first litigation position, which was a defense attorney in the 82nd Airborne Division. Um, and, and I had my first murder case within three months. And, and you know, it typically in your uh, your uh, county attorney's office, your DA's office, you know, you're you're going to start with the 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 petty crimes, the drug crimes, the the property crimes, and then you kind of work your way up to the homicide division. That's kind of like the pinnacle of a of a career. Interesting, but, I did not know um, that. Yeah, on the JAG side, you can you could you, is it because there's more crimes, less attorneys? <laughs> what's the, what's the equation there? Uh, boy, I don't think it's because there's more crime. I don't I don't think that's the case. If anything, because the military is a very tight knit community, I, I think oftentimes. Uh, it, it's harder to conceal crimes. I mean, there's so many crimes uh, that just go unsolved. There, there's, there's, you know, murders that aren't yeah, solved. I think there, there are kids that are abused, and you know, it, it's much harder to get away with that on a military base when everybody lives close together, when they're all talking. Um, so I, there's, there's that aspect of it. But I think it's just the way the army and the military in general approaches leadership. Is it the, 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 the I mean, the, the way. Why the military is so effective at, at teaching leadership is it puts people in these positions that are kind of sink or swim, for, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, now, I often say to my people, look, uh, you know, m my job is to basically, I'm not going to tell you how to suck an egg. I'm just here to make sure you don't choke on it. <laughs> Uh, you know, because there's more value in you, rather than me micromanage you through the process, I'm going to give you a couple pointers and I'm going to let you figure it out on your own because you will learn more effectively that way as opposed to me, you know, dictating every little move that you make. And, and you know, as long as you don't do anything, you know, that's, that's, that, that's failed with the case or, or, you know, uh, crosses the line ethically or, or in the malpractice, you know, that, that, that's fine. And mistakes are going to happen. The stakes are, as you know, the probably the best way we, we learn. Um, I've had a few. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had a few and, uh, I, I, it, I'm sure I'll make more of them and, and I, I hope to, uh, utilize them as the best learning experiences that I can. Um, but going back to your question, I mean, why it, it, it's just the way the military looks at leadership. It looks at developing young officers. Um, and then if you go to like a busy, uh, uh installation, like, like a Fort Bragg or a Fort Hood, um, you know, there's just a lot of, uh, you know, God love Joe, but he, <laughs> he has a way of getting into trouble.
I'll start off by saying there's a lot more to being an, a, a JAG in any branch than just military justice. I mean, there's there's a whole uh, kind of you know, panoply of, of disciplines, legal disciplines within the, each service's JAG corps. For example, like what's an example? For example, uh, the the big one is you know operational law, the the law of war, the Geneva Convention. Interesting. You know, how 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 do we interpret you know the the rules of engagement? Um, that's a huge piece of it. Um, administrative law. I mean, the the every military kind of you know uh, floats on this, <laughs> uh, is buoyed by this uh, uh, you know tens of thousands of pages of, of regulations that have to be navigated. And you know, well, the you know the commanding general's wife wants to uh, uh, use. Uh, uh, you know the division's money to have <laughs> ha have a tea party or something like that, or, or uh, actually, you know, a better example. This actually happened at Fort Campbell. Uh, Oprah, Oprah Winfrey came there and uh, I think like gave like everybody a car or something, and it, and it was all a bunch of military spouses and service members in the audience, and, and there was something of a conundrum there is that you know under the the Joint Ethics Regulation, which is federal law and governs all federal employees. Can they do that? You know, can, can, can they what? Can they receive the car? Right. Yeah. Can Oprah Winfrey show up and just say, every, you know, it, 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 I don't remember if it was cars or vacations, but there was some a some giveaway. some giveaway that everybody got. Interesting. And, and that's when you have uh, administrative lawyers to to look at that stuff. Let's say you meet a uh, uh, an officer from a foreign country, and they 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 give you a, a gift that has you know some kind of extraordinary value. Can you keep it? Um, things like that. Um, there's things that are just kind of basic, what I would call legal assistance. I mean, soldiers get divorces. They 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 sign, <laughs> they sign, uh, 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 they purchase cars at twenty eight percent interest. I mean, they they, they do all kinds of things Pay where, loans. yeah, they 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 need the assistance of a lawyer to kind of help help them get out of it. And then there's the UCMJ part. I moved around Iraq a lot because I was the, the the head prosecutor for the division, but I also was tasked with working with the the judges and police. Um, in all of our sector, which was basically all of northern Iraq, or at least northeastern Iraq. Let me clarify, the, the, the Iraqi judges and police, the local... Right, right. Police, Actually, right? No, I'm sorry, northwestern Iraq. Um, so I, I'd fly around a lot for that. Mosul, Talafer, you know, occasionally I'd have to go to Baghdad to, to, to you know, uh, at one point we had some, uh, some, some civil affairs unit up in Mosul that kind of went, went rogue and, and, and <laughs> they, 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 they built the bar... Uh, and then they were having like the, uh, the, the you know, the, the privates were going in there, getting into liquor, dancing on the bar. And, <laughs> and I had to go down and interview the, uh, the, the general in charge of the civil affairs unit and say, go down to Baghdad and say, sir, you know, what, what's going on up there? Um, uh, but uh, primarily I was in, in Cobb Spiker, which is uh, just outside of Tikrit, Saddam's home, hometown. Um, and um, I would sometimes see this, you know, uh, young female lieutenant, tall, brunette, gorgeous. Yeah. I, I see her in the mess hall, and and and, uh, and and you know I could tell by virtue of her her uh, shoulder patch that she was in one of the medical units. So uh, after that, I, I I started coming up with a lot of excuses to hang around the hospital, <laughs> uh, and and ultimately what happened was there was a case where. Um, a bunch of enlisted soldiers got together. I mean, Cobb Speaker is huge. I mean, it's just this giant, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the installation itself was enormous. The cantonment area was relatively small compared to the rest of the, the, um, the base. Somebody found some shack out in the middle of nowhere and they did a uh, hip hop night. And, and uh, uh, you know, a bunch of soldiers go out there and one of them got totally wasted. Uh, was driving back from hip hop night. There's always one. Well, there's, there's or, or more. <laughs> and uh, so he flips the Humvee. Oh, my goodness. Um, and unfortunately, the passenger is ejected. Passenger's spine is severed. Oh. They're both taken to the emergency room there on Cobb Spiker, where my wife was working that night, my future wife. And um, she's rendering treatment to, to both of them. I wind up charging the driver with, you know, obviously, in addition to, uh, you know, to uh, kind of a the, the military's version of, you know, aggravated DUI because he, you know, he, he severely injured the passenger, you know, the whole host of things, you know, violating oh. general order number one, et cetera, et cetera. And so I eventually got a, 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 I went into the ER to interview the people that had been there that night. And that's how I finally got my, my chance to meet her What was she You're had in. been in the ER that night treating those two soldiers. Oh. Um, and that was, um, uh, that was my, uh, my in, so to speak.
I did read a story, and, and, and you correct me on all the details because I will definitely mess it up, but a story where she had to actually treat a combatant. Right. And, I mean, two things. One, tell me if that falls under law of a Geneva Convention or something of treating combatants. And two, I think that's a, a testimony to who we are as America because what, uh, what other country, what other military – would treat their enemy, would, would spend our resources, our time to try to save your life if you're the enemy? Uh, it, it's a short list with one name on it, and it's, <laughs> it's the United States of America. Wow. Um, uh, so there's a concept of the law of war called, the, it's French, it's called hors de combat, which means out of combat. Um, and, and, you know, the, the best analogy is, you, you know, either you're in the boxing ring or you're out. Um, and you, you're out of combat if you're... Uh, severely wounded to, to the extent where you're you're no longer a, 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 co a combatant really you know uh and in this case um uh, it was actually the, our first date so to speak we were going to go have coffee together huh. uh, which is to say we, we were going to go to some little <coughs> you know uh <laughs> ramshackle trailer <laughs> on cob spiker that served coffee but um so uh, special forces had, had had an engagement with a, a, a group of insurgents. They had close air support from um, an, an Apache attack helicopter, which has that 30 millimeter um, uh, uh, chain gun on it. Uh, the story was that the 30 millimeter uh, had, had basically just like sheared off the insurgent's right arm. Um, and so, but he doesn't die. I mean, he, you know, he, 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 he's... Uh, Somebody puts a tourniquet on him, and uh, they take him to the hospital there on Cobb Spiker. And uh, bring him in, no ID. He's missing his right arm. So first point I want to I want to I want to bring up. Right. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Sure. Somebody had to treat him on the ground, right? Before so, he even got to the to right. the I was going to say FOB, but to the to the base, somebody had to treat him and provide immediate medical attention right. to a combatant right there on the right. ground. So some special forces medic. I mean, right. he's 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 captured. And he's still alive, and some special forces medic had, had to render, you know, you know, triage care on the right. spot, which was probably a tourniquet and, sure. you know, you know, fluid and things like that. Wow. Um, and then they had to get him, so you stabilize him, and, and then you get him to, you know, the, the nearest, uh, uh, you know, major hospital, which would have been Cobb Spiker. Wow. Um, so he gets to Cobb Spiker, and uh, again, he's missing his his right arm, so he's got no ID. So they, they call him Lefty. <laughs> Which is, you know, I, I, you know, I get it. You know, in hindsight, maybe, maybe bad taste, but, um, uh, but, you know, Lefty had, had uh, Lefty could have been dead. So. Well, he lost a lot of blood, um, and uh, you, you don't know what you know his blood type is. So what do you do? You, you, you've got to go into your supply of O negative, which is the universal blood, um, and uh, Lefty went through every drop of O negative that day, um, and. Uh, but but that's what we had to do, not, not only legally, but I, I think, you know, the, the Army in particular, the military, and U.S. military, I should say, emphasizes the importance of maintaining that moral high ground. Mm. And, and once cut, Lefty was in our care and custody and he wasn't a threat anymore, it was our obligation to stabilize him. Um, and, and then ultimately we handed him over to the Iraqi forces and, and, and you know, they, they did whatever they were going to do with him. But, but that was our job is to make sure as long as he was in our care and custody, you know, he... He, he was uh, somebody we, we had to look after. reading up on the Mahmoudiyah rapes and killings, that's a heinous crime to be committed anywhere, let alone by U.S. soldiers at war. Yeah. And the way that went down, unprovoked, un, you know, totally just out of the blue, it seems. How did that go down? Jeez. Uh, <laughs> uh, big, big, big question. Um, so um, the, the Mahmoudiyah massacre uh, was uh, an instance in, I think it occurred, I want to say also in, in March or April of 2005, uh, where members of the 
2nd Brigade Combat Team of the 101st Airborne Division, which at the time I think was attached to 4th Infantry Division. Um, they had uh, 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 four or five soldiers, or four soldiers actually, had uh, raped a young Iraqi girl, killed her, killed the parents, yes. set the girl's body on fire to, to you know, make it seem like uh, it was the, the result of some kind of sectarian violence. And those of us that served over there know that, you know, if, if you're, you know, kind of a, um, uh, your, your kind of standard, you know, garden variety Iraqi civilian, you were probably much more likely to die at the hands of a fellow Iraqi than you were at the hands of a U.S. service member. Well, that's one thing Saddam Hussein did was kept a, a lid on the right. different sects, religious sects, and and all kinds of stuff. And right. when he lost power and we came in, everybody just fled, and you had yeah. villages, and this Shia, Sunni, and yeah, that yeah. was a big problem. There, 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 there are divides that go back, and, and part of it's Shia, Sunni, but, but then within that, superimposed on that, there are tribes. And, right. And, right. and, um, and, and there was just so much, there, there were, I, I think, a lot of scores to settle in, in a lot of ways um, that, that you're right, because of the way Saddam ran that country, he kind of kept a lid on all of it. But, um, but yeah, they set the body on fire of the young girl, hoping it would kind of burn the whole scene down and then make it seem like, you know, the, the insurgents had, uh, had, 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 that it was kind of one tribe retaliating against an, another but tribe. This, but this was also clearly premeditated. I mean, these are six soldiers manning a checkpoint right which even the uh logistics of that i mean was this just like uh you know 9 a.m to 9 p.m did they sleep there forget all those details for a second but these are six soldiers where four of them and this is you know this is the middle of the city right i mean or uh, along a major road per se i i i wouldn't call it that um so it it occurred so the the whole thing went down in, it's actually um, Lucifia, Iraq. It was called, the, the AP reporter who reported on the story first said it occurred in Mahmoudia, which was technically incorrect. I mean, it's it's kind of like saying something happened in Peoria, Arizona, when it really happened in Glendale. But uh, but but be that as it may, the, the, the name stuck after the AP story ran, but it actually happened in, in, in Lucifia. Um, that was all part of an area um, south of Baghdad, which was a lot of agrarian land, um, and it was, um, you know, for those of you who live in, in, in Phoenix here, it, it was something of like a, a, a post-apocalyptic Arcadia. It was um, a lot of palm trees, a lot of canals, um, uh, and therefore a lot of um, vegetation or like, you know, bad, farmland, agriculture. Well, it, 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 and also places where bad guys could hide. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, if, if you know, what, when, when you have kind of a water table like that in the desert and you've got, you've got drought resistant vegetation, I mean, that, that, that stuff grows and it grows and it grows. And on top of that, the canals, th there weren't a lot of ways to cross the canals. And, and there was so much just stuff in, in, in those canals. You wouldn't want to you know, you're here, bad guy's there, he takes a few shots at you and then runs. In unless you've got a bridge or another way to cross somewhere in the vicinity, mm -hmm. he's he's probably getting away with it because you're, you're not going to want to jump in those canals because God knows what was in there, razor wire, sure. you know. Uh, you know it, it also could be some kind of ruse because they've got something daisy-chained in there to, you know, to, to, to blow you up. Um, but it was it was a very frustrating deployment for those soldiers because it was extremely violent there. Mm -hmm. um, there, that unit, I think, at that time, had suffered more casualties than any unit in the entire conflict. Um, they'd lost wow. their, their, their platoon leader, had been, been uh, uh, quite literally blown up. It was body dismembered uh, 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 due to a, an IED. Um, uh, two, uh, two squad leaders had, had been um, shot in the face at one of those checkpoints by, by, by an Iraqi that, was, that everybody thought was kind of a, a friendly. Um, so that's got to play on the psyche right. of all the other soldiers. Like you wake up every day. Is this going to be my day? Right. Very. It was just a, an extremely violent area. And uh, I, I think the soldiers were out there at these traffic control points, which are kind of along these little highways that, you know, go between one little farming hamlet to another. Um, and they're out there pretty much on their own. You know, you're, you're, you're out there, you know, maybe, you know, six or seven junior enlisted soldiers and a squad leader. Uh, this particular area was called TCP2 or traffic uh, control point two. Um, and at the time, uh, the squad leader was, was on leave. Um, and so you had a, a very junior soldier in charge by the name of Paul Cortez, who at the time was an E4 specialist. I think he was a promotable to be sergeant, but he hadn't pinned yet. And 
so squad leader's gone, and then you've got a guy in the, the unit named uh, Steve Stephen Green, who is, you know, by all accounts, but was just a, just a, a, a grade A sociopath. Mm. Um, he got into the army on a moral waiver, meaning he, he he should never have been there in the first place. But like it or not, this was a time when the army needed bodies, and it certainly needed bodies in the infantry. Um, and so he got on in a moral waiver, and he was just. Everybody reg regarded him as, as kind of a, 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 a loose cannon, a lunatic. He would say the craziest things. Mm -hmm. He had, you know, we'd heard stories about him throwing puppies off, off a roof and, and, and just doing kind of just really vile, sadistic things. Squad leaders, he's, he's on leave. You've got a junior sword, soldier in the form of Cortez in charge. You've got Green there, the, you know, the, the, the sociopath. And on top of that, the soldiers had somehow managed to get some whiskey from the Iraqis. So they're, they're, they're sitting there at this traffic control point. They're like playing cards. And, uh, you know, going back to, to soldiers and, you know, soldiers sitting around a table drinking whiskey and playing cards, you know, they, they tend to say some pretty crazy and outlandish things. I mean, that, that's, that's what 20, 25-year-old kids do at that point. And at some point, somebody had said, hey, you know that girl that lives at that farmhouse over there? What if we were to go over there and rape her? Um, and, and I think initially the reaction, and, and I'm, I'm kind of telling this narrative after kind of, I'm constructing it, having digested the case and all the right. statements and everything. Somebody had thrown that out there. And, and I think initially, the, probably the initial reaction was, well, that's, that's, that's silly. Let's not, let's not do that. But, you know, the day, the day wears on, more whiskey's consumed. The, 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 this is a, a unit that's really been through hell. Um, and no, no leadership on the spot uh, to stop them from doing this. And I think what started is kind of just a, a, a juvenile suggestion morphed into a plan. Well, how would we do this? You know, what would we do? We'd, we'd probably put on our, our we take off our uniforms, we put on our thermals, you know, cover our faces so we look like we're, you know, we're local bad guys. Um, uh, how would we do it? How would we get there? Well, if we kind of cut through, you know, this area, there's like a chain link fence there. You cut through that chain link fence and cut this way across that field and go that way. Um, and pretty soon, you know, this, this just idea became a plan. And so Green, Cortez, two other soldiers, Dan Barker and Spielman, head to this farmhouse where this young girl named Abir lived. I was shocked he actually got the other soldier to agree with him and go through with this. That was, I mean, again, I, I mean, crazy. had the squad leader been there, it never would have happened. Had, had right. there not been whiskey, that never would have happened, you know. Uh, but it was kind of a people have often said to me, like, well, you know, these guys had to have been. Well, cl clearly, they all had something wrong with them in the sense that their yeah. their, their moral compasses were, were severely lacking. But yeah. but I, I, I just there was kind of a confluence of events there the, the alcohol, the absence of leadership. Um, uh, you know, just the fact, I think that they were all very bitter about, th they felt like that they were, had been abandoned by their own chain of command. Mm. Um, and I'm not saying that was a fair, uh, or, or accurate belief on their part, but that was their perception. Got it. Um, so they go to the farmhouse, um, uh, at the time the, the, the husband and, and wife are there as well as the young girl, a beer, as well as her nine-year-old sister. Um. Green, uh, they go in the house, kind of corral the family in there. Most Iraqis had an AK-47 um, uh, uh, in the house as kind of self-protection. Self you were allowed one, I think, right. or whatever it was. You were, yeah, it was for, for, for home defense. Green finds the AK-47. He, he uses that to um, uh, uh, shoot the, I believe, the mother. Um, but Green also took a shotgun with him. Um, and... and you know, in, in hindsight, that was probably the one thing that that ultimately tipped us off that it wasn't Iraqis that did this because Iraqis mm. almost they never used shotguns. That that was something that U.S. forces typically had, for, you know, for for you know breaching, breaching. and things like that. Um, and so um, Green shot the father in the head with a shotgun, with the shotgun that 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 he had taken from TCP two. And, and if, you know, if you've ever seen a, a, a shotgun wound to the head it, it, it looks a lot different than a ak shot to the head i mean the, the, the father's head was just 
well, it, it wasn't a head anymore. It was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was a, it was a, uh, a, a piece of bone with a giant hole, hole in it, with you know, Jeez. brain and blood coming out of it. And I can, to this day, I can, I can envision uh, those photographs. Um, uh, so he he kills the parents, puts them in the bedroom, kills them, also shoots the nine year old sister in the face, which is the, the worst. Well, I shouldn't say that, but it just uh, that again these the the to this day the photographs are just kind of burned in my 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 brain. Um, but shot her um, through the eye and went out the back of her head, um, and then they took a beer, the fourteen year old girl, into kind of the living room, so to speak, and then they they Cortez. Green and Barker took turns raping her. Uh, after which, uh, Green took the AK, shot her on the head, and then uh, they, I think they had some, there was oil uh, there that, that they used to keep their lamps on at night. They covered her body in that, set it on fire, hoping it would kind of consume the entire uh, building, and it didn't. It really just wound up burning half of her body. <laughs> um, and, and then they head back to, to, to TCP2. Ultimately, the uh, um, there were two young boys that were part of the family that were at school that day. Come home, see their house on fire. They uh, go to their uncle who lives down the street. He comes there, um, uh, puts the fire out. Get, get, you know, gets some water from a, a well. I think puts some puts the fire out, and then goes to the Iraqi army and says, S "Four dead people here." That then prompts the Iraqi army. Then calls uh, another checkpoint. Uh, TCP one down the road, um, and uh, some soldiers there go to TCP two, and you know, do a you know what you would, might call a QRF or something like that, and so uh, Spielman and Cortez wind up going back to the scene as part of the hey. QRF to to investigate this, and the other folks there don't even know that they had just been there a couple hours before. Um, so uh, as with the prior case, you know the, the, they all get together and say we shall never speak of this again. Um, and, and, you know, that, that lasts all of about, you know, you know, 10 minutes. Uh, and, and eventually kind of the rumor mill starts going that, that, uh, that what happened to that family out there at TCP2 was that Army soldiers did it. So at first it was, it was stamped as this was Secretary in Violence, Iraq on Iraq Violence. Yeah. And there was no real launch of an investigation or anything like that. Yeah, it, it, it was just kind of written off as, as just like, you know, uh, and to be fair, the, the, the sectarian violence in that country was really awful. Sure. I, I mean, the things that, that Iraqis would oh, do yeah. to other Iraqis was incredibly brutal. Mm -hmm. But it was, I, I don't think I'd ever heard of an instance where they burned bodies before. That, that was, at least that was something typically reserved for uh infidels like you and i uh it, it, but it, it just it, you'd never heard of iraqis doing that to another iraqi that 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 also was kind of odd um and then also at the scene they found um uh not only was there an obvious shotgun wound to the head for the father there but they found a um, uh, a shotgun shell a spent shotgun shell which because cortez had gone back to the scene he collected it and that later disappeared and never you know uh made its way into the uh, kind of evidence so interesting um, Interesting. But eventually people started talking about it and uh, a young soldier by the name of Justin Watt kind of started, he, he was like, this this can't be okay. And, and he started asking questions and kind of piecing together what had happened and he brought it to CID, which again, army detectives and said, this is what I'm hearing happened. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was a really tough thing for him to do because, you know, again, he's an infantry soldier, close to Uden, and these are literally his brothers. And for him to you know, do what he did, uh, again, was not easy. Um, meanwhile, Green is being out-processed from the Army uh, to, uh, because of, you know, shocker, uh, uh, antisocial personality disorder. Tuh. So uh, as, as all of this is coming to light in Iraq, Green is back at Fort Campbell out, getting ready to yeah, leave. he's getting get ready to get his, his honorable discharge and, wow. and become a civilian. So I, I think we, you know, Green probably was out with his, his DD-214 discharge certificate probably a week or two before we conclusively had our, our arms wrapped around this investigation and what had happened. Um, and um, 
there's a whole body. People say, well, why didn't you charge grain? Well, there's a whole body of law uh, about, you know, the military's jurisdiction over service members. Mm. Obviously, if you're on active duty, you know, they, they have jurisdiction over you. Um, but there, there's also instances where, where soldiers know they're about to get charged with something. And so they, they, they find a way to get that, that DD-214 and, 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 and hustle out of there. And have you had charged anybody at that point? Uh, not yet. We were getting ready to. And, and we, we already had, we knew where Spielman, Cortez, Barker was. And, and your, real quick, your role on this was the lead prosecutor? Correct. Correct. Um, but for Green to still be under military jurisdiction, uh, well, let's just say that, to, to be detached from military jurisdiction entirely, you have to have uh, uh, three things. Um, a DD-214 discharge certificate. You have to have what's called basically an out processing, where you know those of us that have been there know you you, yeah. you go around and somebody stamps your piece of paper and and you know and, and you you spend two days going to every little you know office in the on the base, uh, and, and then finally you have to have what's called a, a final accounting of pay and final accounting of pay and allowances. Um, as it turned out, the the uh, Department of Defense still owed Green sixty six cents due to an accounting error, and so. Technically, did not have a, a final accounting of pay and allowances. Um, did I want to hang my hat jurisdictionally on sixty-six cents for what would likely be a capital murder case? I did not. Mm. Um, fortunately, a new law had been passed called the MEJA, the Military Extraterritorial Judicial Act, which allowed the U.S. Attorney to uh, charge, among other things, people that had committed crimes overseas while on active duty but it's since left active duty status. Which and it brings was, that they could be prosecuted back under UCMJ? No, prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney in the uh, federal criminal courts. In this case, I think it was the Eastern District of Kentucky. Um, but, so, for, but for that law, Green would have never been charged. So this law states if you conducted a crime while on active duty military, you are now no longer part of active duty. You could still be brought up on charges. Right. Whereas prior to that, like me as an example, if, I, if they came to me prior to this law and I'm out now, they couldn't charge me with anything if I conducted a crime? Uh, well, it, yeah, they could now. If, I mean, if, they could if, now, if, by prior to the law. Right. If you correct. committed a crime while you were scot-free if you got out. Correct. That, that, was, it, that was actually kind of a secondary purpose of, of the media. The primary purpose was really to be able to charge civilians that were accompanying U.S. forces overseas. Uh -huh. And the, the, the catalyst for all of it was a case in, in Germany where... There was a civilian employee, a uh, Department of Defense employee, who worked for the post office there, had molested his daughter in an apartment off base in, in, you know, Munich or some German city somewhere. And, you know, the German authorities were like, look, it, it's an American on American crime. We don't care. You know, he's your problem. Jeez. But there was no way to prosecute him in, in uh, you know, in, in U.S. courts. So the MEJA was largely a response to that. What does it stand for again? Military Extraterritorial Judicial Act. And it doesn't really so much create, uh, uh, it, well, it, it, it doesn't expand the jurisdiction so much of U.S. courts as it, as it almost created a, a new crime under federal law, which says if you, if you do something that's an existing crime under federal law, but you happen to do it uh, overseas, either as a member of the armed forces or as a civilian that comes to the armed forces, you've now committed a, a crime. All right, so the three other soldiers are still in. Barker, uh, Cortez, and Spielman. I prosecuted the, the three of them, as well as a couple other people that were involved, but really didn't have and then a significant role. Green, the culprit or the mastermind, he's out, but because of this media, he could still be tried. Right. But he has to get another prosecutor, or can you still prosecute him? No, so he was prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney, I, I think, right. for the Eastern District of Kentucky. I was I was sworn in as a special assistant U.S. Attorney to wow. assist in that process, but I, I didn't try the case. My job was to get Barker, Spielman, and uh, Cortez convicted, and, and also get them in a position where they could then be used as witnesses against. And me. what were you? Pros what was the charges? Uh, homicide and rape, primarily. I, I mean, so. Although Green was the trigger person, anytime you you either uh, aid and abet somebody in a crime or conspire with somebody to commit a crime, you're just as you know guilty of uh, of the crime. So again, you and I are gonna we're gonna rob a bank. You actually go in the bank. I stay outside as the getaway driver. I'm still guilty of bank robbery. Um, I didn't know that. Likewise, you know because the other soldiers aided and, and abetted 
with, with grain to, to kill um, uh, the, the family, they were equally guilty of homicide. There's also a concept called felony murder, which is if, if, a, if a murder is, happens to occur during the, the course of a felony, uh, of another felony, like a burglary or something like that, that's murder. Interesting. Uh, and then there was the obvious one, which was, which was rape, which um, Barker, Cortez, Barker and Cortez did actually commit rape. The theory with Spielman was that he had aided it and abetted the entire process. Did Barker and Cortez ad admit to that, right? Well, they made incriminating statements to, to CID. Uh, eventually, Barker pled guilty. <whistles> Cortez pled guilty to some things, but not others. And we, we tried him and got a conviction. Spielman did not, he pled guilty to some minor things, but did not plead guilty to the big ones. We tried in, him and got a conviction there. Uh, but, but ultimately, the goal was to make sure that we, we could have all of them ready to uh, testify against Green. Green goes to trial, uh, I can't remember what year it was, probably 2008, 2009. The uh, U.S. attorney goes for the death penalty. Um, they did not get it, uh, which didn't shock me in the least. Um, uh, and I can, I, can, I can tell you why, because... Uh, because I had been sworn in as a special U.S. attorney, I get to participate in the, the grand jury proceedings. Um, and uh, as any good lawyer will tell you, those proceedings are secret, and I can't talk about what was said there. <laughs> What I can say is, is I watched the faces of the grand jurors as they heard the testimony. And, and I could tell that they were partially disgusted by what happened, but maybe even more disgusted by the conditions, the harsh conditions that the soldiers were facing there. Um, and, and I knew at the time that Green uh, was probably not going to get the death penalty. Thank you for tuning into MOA's third season of the Never Stop Serving podcast, hosted by retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Olivia Nunn, a MOA Life member, and Tony Lombardo, MOA's Director of Audience Engagement. This season, we're sharing war stories from Iraq and Afghanistan, told by the men and women who lived them. In this episode, we speak to Colonel Chris Barnett, an Air Force PAYPOC pilot who was pulled off an instructor assignment and sent to Afghanistan to fly combat rescue missions in Helmand Province. His life-saving actions in the spring of 2009 resulted in two silver stars. Chris, now a retired colonel, tells our host Olivia Nunn about the high op tempo his unit faced and the challenge of returning home. So before we kind of get into your story, I want to start at the beginning. Who is Chris Barnett? <laughs> uh, well, um, I, I started my military career. I went to the Naval Academy, actually. Um, even though uh, the events uh, that you're talking about occurred while I was in the Air Force. I um, graduated from the Naval Academy in 1991 and uh, went on to fly helicopters for the Navy for uh, seven years. I flew my first four years out of San Diego, flying H-60 helicopters, doing combat search and rescue, anti-sub warfare, et cetera, for a squadron called uh, Helicopter Anti-Submarine Squadron 4. Um, I kind of fell in love with combat search and rescue. That, that was what I decided during flight school is what I wanted to do. Um, so once I had done my first four years with the Navy, I did an exchange with the Air Force with the 512th uh, Special Operations Squadron out of Albuquerque, New Mexico where I got to train new pilots in combat search and rescue techniques. Um, 
At that point in time, uh, it was uh, 2001. My time was up with the Navy. I was de- trying to decide what to do with the rest of my life. Um, uh, and the Air Force came along and essentially made me an offer that I really couldn't refuse, which was I was already qualified in their aircraft, so they told me if I came over, I could go to the Air Force Weapons School, which is the Air Force equivalent of Top Gun, um, except for it's kind of Top Gun on steroids. So instead of uh, six weeks, it's six months long. I went through the course. Um, 9-11 occurred right before that happened, and um, I was off to the races. Wow. You know, most people don't do a service transfer. No, um, and in all honesty, when I made the decision to do a service transfer, uh, I was looking back at my Navy career, and I had a good Navy career. Um, but um, I was also looking kind of at quality of life at the time. This was, again, pre-9-11. Um, I had been out uh, twice, two deployments, uh, two sets of workups for an air, being on an aircraft carrier, uh, two deployments to the Middle East, um, six months at a WAC. And then uh, I was in the Air Force, and the Air Force, whereas in the Navy I was doing, uh, I was kind of a jack of all trades flying helicopters. So I would do anti-sub one day, I would do combat rescue a day, I would do uh, logistics a day. The Air Force was very focused on only doing combat search and rescue or special operations. And so uh, I kind of made the decision I would I would switch over because I was I was very focused on that as a passion of mine. And when I made that decision also, uh, to be 100% transparent, the Air Force was doing 90-day deployments. Um, they were living in hotels in Turkey at the time. Um, it, it was a good it was a good life and focusing on combat rescue, focusing on the mission. Um, as opposed to six month deployments. I had two small children at the time, uh, a two year old and a, a four year old. Um, however, uh, as things happen, uh, 9-11 occurred right before I physically made the transfer over to the Air Force. And I never actually got to stay in Turkey in a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's good. But you know, at the end of the day, right, um, we are still one team, one fight, regardless Absolutely. of, of what uniform you wear, you know, we all still wear the nation's cloth. So here you are, you made that transition, you've decided uh, to go to Air Force. So tell us a little bit about that. Where do you find yourself now? So I I went through the weapons school and um, after graduating in June of 2002, I thought I actually was gonna have some time off. Um, It's a very rigorous course, Um, uh, puts a lot of stress on you. Um, it, you know, it, mentally, it's it's the equivalent of going through buds. I mean, it's the same length of time, et cetera. And you're, it's late nights, it's, you know, sorties every day trying to push the limit of what you can do in, in your aircraft. And I'm flying uh, H-60 uh, Pave Hawks for the Air Force at the time. And so um, I, I went home. I... Uh, had a weekend off after graduation. I was told I'm going to go to the Afghanistan in two weeks. So in uh, end of June 2002, I was in Afghanistan. Uh, I spent four months in Afghanistan, came home for three months, uh, went immediately to uh, Jordan in preparation for uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom, moved from Jordan to Saudi Arabia and eventually into Baghdad. So um, the um, the view that uh, I think everyone had of the Air Force kind of pre-9-11 is a different view than what we were living in at the time. Um, there were no we, hotel rooms. There were no hotel rooms. And those 90 uh, days went away. The 90 days went away. It was, uh, in fact, when we went into Iraq, it was uh, a very open-ended um, deployment. It was, yes. we'll come home when... When it's done. When it's done. We were really able to kind of leapfrog our way into Baghdad back in 2003. And it's, uh, uh, it really became a model for how combat rescue employs in the future. Uh, we've always been kind of at that front of, uh, because, like you mentioned, Olivia, the, it's one team, one fight. And one thing about combat rescue is that the faster you can get to a person, the 
quicker we can get them to whether it's a casualty, whether it's somebody that's shot down and ejected out of their airplane, it's how fast can we get to them? So let's dig into why you are here. Okay. You are a Silver Star recipient. And before we jump into that, let's take a quick commercial break. This episode is sponsored by MOA Insurance Plans, administered by Association Member Benefits Advisors. The MOA Insurance Plans program offers a variety of plan options and stands with you at every stage. Whether you are currently serving, transitioning from active service, or retired, learn more at www.moainsurance.com. You are a two-time Silver Star recipient. So now let's get into your story. The first time you received your Silver Star. Let's talk about that story. Okay. Um, well, uh, as a real short background, what happened was that we had been deployed to Afghanistan in uh, March of 2009. Uh, I was the squadron commander of what is the 34th Weapons Squadron. Uh, we, I was now teaching at the weapons school, which I had attended right after I had come over from the uh, Navy to the Air Force, and I was the squadron commander of the HH-60 Pavehawk squadron there, teaching combat search and rescue. And in November of 2008, a uh, Marine had passed away in Helmand Province in Afghanistan, and he had ended up being on the ground for about four hours, wounded, before he was picked up. And Secretary of Defense at the time, due to a congressional inquiry, had said, well, well, in Iraq at that time, I can get to somebody within an hour. We talked about the golden hour. But in Afghanistan, you know, we've got this guy who, who he may have passed away anyway, but he was on the ground for four hours before he was, he was picked up and taken to a hospital. So what they decided to do was, hey, let's – we need to send more aircraft to Afghanistan. We need to send more rescue aircraft. So what they did was they took my squadron, which was not supposed to deploy, and they sent us to fill the gap in Helmand Province, where the Marines in the north, the British in the south, were pushing heavy into what, what was a largely Taliban-owned area of Afghanistan back in 2009. Uh, this is, of course, before 2010 when the Marines came through Helmand Province. Um, in April of 2004, uh, we received a, a call that an individual had fallen off of one of the forward operating bases wall, and had, had, it was an Afghani National Army individual, had um, injured his head. We flew out, picked him up. Uh, from Bastion, where we were stationed, which is in s central Helmand province. And we took him to Kandahar, and on the way back, uh, we got a call from Green Berets. Now, uh, when we had shown up in Afghanistan, uh, my guys had gone and they had talked to the folks at Bastion. We had talked to the Green Berets, and like you mentioned, we're one team, one fight. So we had told the we had gotten all the radio frequencies for the Green Berets that were operating out of Helmand Province. We had gotten the frequencies and the radio frequencies um, for the Marines. We stayed in touch with them. We knew what their operations were at all times. So as we were returning from Kandahar, we came up on the radio with and found out that there was a group of Green Berets who had come into. Uh, contact with the enemy and were pinned down in northern Afghanistan in an area near what is called the Kajaki Dam uh, at the mouth of the Helmand River. Um, we asked if there were any casualties. Uh, again, that, that's our job. Um, it wasn't really to, to go in and support with fires or anything like that, but they said, we don't have any casualties at this time, but these guys are, you know, uh, we know that you do have the capability to provide fire support. And they asked if we would go support the, the Green Berets that were pinned down. We showed up in the area, and uh, there was a uh, operational detachment alpha team that had been pinned down. Um, the uh, quick reaction force that had come over to try to support them had also been hit and they were pinned down. 
and they were taking fire from a large compound uh, of Taliban uh, and really had nowhere that they could go. When you say we came over, who, who was in that? So that, that's, uh, we had, we fly with two aircraft. So it was our two aircraft. It was um, myself, uh, my uh, crew, and the crew of my chalk two. One of the things that we did, in which was interesting about this deployment, was we took basically, and I, I hate to use this as an example, but it, it's like when they take Top Gun in the movies and they say, okay, we're going to take all the instructors and send them. That's what they did. So we were all instructors teaching at the highest level in the Air Force tactically, and this was my crews. So all instructors, all at the very top of their game, um, and really at the leading edge of what the Air Force combat rescue was doing tactically. So when we found out that these individuals were pinned down, we came up on the radio and asked if we could help. Now, there was, um, there was a B-1 uh, that was dropping ordnance, but it couldn't get close enough because these guys were only uh, about a, a hundred yards away from the building that they were taking fires from, from the Taliban. Danger and, close. Yep, danger close. And they, the B-1 was dropping ordnance all over the area, um, but couldn't get close enough to hit this particular building. There were some Dutch Apaches that wouldn't come down low enough to kind of differentiate. There were very tight rules of engagement at the time in Afghanistan. Um, so we came up on the radio and being the professionals, my, uh, uh, my uh, co-pilot at the time, who was an instructor pilot, fantastic, uh, Brian Creel, uh, came on the radio and of course, being the professional he was, he asked for a full close air support nine line and you know how are we going to support these guys the uh joint terminal attack controller on the ground his response can i swear sure. Sure. <laughs> his, his, his response was well i'll bleep it but <laughs> his response was i don't care shoot the effing blue door i mean these guys and you could hear the rounds coming in and hitting the humvee that these guys were behind so that's what we did. We swung around. We came in, danger close, over right over the top of these guys and engaged with the building that the Taliban were in. Um, the beauty, again, of Air Force Combat Rescue and the weapons that we had, as opposed we were carrying 50 caliber machine guns, essentially the same machine gun that a B-17 flew with back in uh, World War II, but, you know, strapped on the side. And we came in, and uh, as a crew, we blasted that door off its hinges and engaged the Taliban that were in there. The Green Berets, and, you know, I, I can't ever talk enough about how heroic these guys were every time I ran across them in Afghanistan, jumped up immediately and assaulted the building. because The door was open. The fires now were all directed at us instead of at them. And so they were able to come in. Um, we swung into gun patterns over the top of this and uh, engaged the building and relieved the, the pressure from there, guys. Uh, we were very low on gas because, as I mentioned, we had, we had really done, uh, this was really our third mission that we had been on without going back for fuel. And so we went, found a local uh, forward operating location to get some gas. And then we were asked to come back out because once they got into the building, they were trying to remove themselves from the building and they come up, came under attack again. So we came back to the same area, engaged the enemy again, uh, and were engaged by the enemy um, over the top of the uh, Green Berets and supported their movement to their overnight location. You know, as you're telling the story and you're talking about the different air support that was available and the rules of engagement, there's always rules of engagement when you're in combat and they always change. They always yeah. shift. In my three deployments to Iraq, you know, you had to know what they were because they were constantly shifting. And what I was thinking about as you're telling your story is that that's the difference as you're making those calls as a commander is that you had to know the rules of engagement, but it's also making the call. 
right? Sometimes yep. it's knowing when to bend some of those to make the judgment call to understand what is going on the ground to ultimately save your team. And I think one of the great things that my team did over there in Afghanistan was the fact that they, uh, they got to know the guys that, that we would be supporting. So it, it, was, it was personal to us when these Green Berets were under fire. Uh, we had been over to their compound. We had talked to them. You know, they would brief us on the. We knew the operation they were going on, and so um, uh, you know, we had eaten pizza with these guys. It, it wasn't. It, we weren't keeping ourselves as like a separate unit that just would react whenever something went on. We were being very proactive, and uh, you know, I can't say enough about the the team and all the effort that they put into making those relationships. Because it matters. It absolutely matters. I believe the citation said 40 Green Berets. Yes, that were that were pinned down a, at the time. So that was the first. Yeah. And and for for many, you know, it one could you could say is is enough. Yes. Because not <laughs> cause, and, and the truth is, many most don't get to that level. Most don't ever see that kind of level of, of valor. Um, because it, it is it is a very uh, prestigious award, but you have two, so so walk us through the second one. The second one also uh, dealt with support for that same group of Green Berets that were stationed uh, headquartered out of Bastion, um, and and this one was, in my opinion, was remarkable, uh, not because of what our team necessarily did. And and let me say that I get the silver star because I was the, you know, the flight lead for this. But I mean, my entire crew, my entire team, the, uh, my flight engineers, my gunners, my co-pilots, my wingmen, uh, the PJs, I mean, they, they were in as much a hazard as I was. And every single one of them, it, it wasn't something that I did on my own. Um, and the heroism that I saw for the second one out of the Green Berets was something impressive too. So um, we were briefed into a operation that the Green Berets were going to do in May of two thousand or in May of two thousand nine. They called it Operation C Gen Six, and what they were planning on doing was this was post uh, poppy harvest. So we had uh, my crew had been in in pretty much. Uh, consistent contact with the enemy to pick up casualties uh, since April uh, 23rd of 2009. And this has occurred in May of 2009. So May 21st of 2009. So for about a month, uh, the British, the Green Berets, the Marines, everyone had been pushing after the poppy harvest to go after the Taliban. What the Green Berets decided to do was they knew that down in Marja, there was an area called the Loichar Bazaar, and this area was uh, essentially untouched by U.S. forces or Allied forces. So Marja at that time was, it, it was off limits. No one even flew over the top of Marja at the time. Uh, no one went into it. It was known to be owned by the Taliban. The Taliban knew they owned it. They stored, uh, you know, huge amounts of the heroin, poppy, opium, et cetera, from the drugs, uh, from the drug harvest because they knew they were, they thought, I should say, they were untouchable. And what the Green Berets decided to do was they decided to go down to this bazaar and they assaulted it in the middle of the night. There was no one defending it at the time because, again, the whole area around it was, as the Taliban thought, untouchable. And they secured this bazaar and took over the block that that it entailed. And uh, in the morning when the Taliban woke up, uh, they were pissed. And so as I talked to the Green Berets afterwards, you could see the women and children just streaming out of the town. And they knew they were in for it. 
And over the next four days, they were attacked continuously. About every hour to hour and a half, there was an assault on these Green Berets' position. And so for a four-day battle, uh, the Taliban uh, attacked them trying to take back this bazaar. On the afternoon of the first day, one of the um, uh, Green Berets, a uh, senior master sergeant, was hit in the arm um, and took a round through his forearm, but it, uh, it actually severed the nerve. It was pretty serious, and you know, it had nicked the artery. Pretty serious injury. We got the call. We had been on four missions that day already. Um, and uh, we found out that we needed to go down into Marja. The, at that time, no one had flown into Marja during the day. They went in at night with the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, had dropped them off uh, the night before. But no one had flown in there during the day, and certainly not in the middle of the, the uh, uh, a firefight. So we went down. Um, we got word that the individual was on the roof. We offered to hoist him off the roof. Another thing that uh, is you is not unique anymore, but at the time it was unique to come Air Force Combat Rescue is that we have the search and rescue hoists, etc. So we can pull people off of, of buildings. Um, they were able to get him down uh, off the roof um, as we came into the area, taking fire. Um, I rolled in over the top. The wingman went into the LZ, picked the individual up. We brought him out. Later on that night, we um, received call of a second wounded individual. So we flew down to Marja again. Uh, Keith Altenhofen, who was the wingman uh, co-pilot on this mission, um, Again, a fantastic instructor pilot. He said it looked like the beginning of Star Wars with the amount of tracers that were going in each direction from this. Um, I One of the things that we do and we had done at the time was we, we came in um, as we came in in an attack mode, uh, just like Apaches do, in a diving mode, coming down, out of 800 feet so that we could one could open fire one could go into the zone i was lining up actually at the time to open fire on a place that i was seeing fire coming from into our green beret compound uh, when my wingman lost his engine uh, his engine was shot out so he immediately uh, called for a switch of roles i sent him up uh, to about a thousand feet to get him out of the fire uh, i came in at night, um, it was dark. There wasn't any fire support really going on that first day for these guys because, again, um, for whatever reason, this had not been as high a priority as I believe it should have been to kind of the command structure because that the Green Berets were going in there. I don't think they expected the hornet's nest that they were about to really kick over. Um, and... So as we came in, we parked, uh, I landed the helicopter um, in between the, uh, which was actually, it was Green Berets, but there were also tw uh, 20 SEALs holding the southeast corner. Um, individual had been hit in the stomach. We landed the helicopter in between the, the line and where the enemy was. We dropped off supplies. Uh, because the other thing I forgot to mention about this was these guys knew they were going in for four days. There's Green Beret SEALs. There were uh, two FBI, I believe, a DEA, and one drug dog that went in to the, for this mission, uh, and about 120 Green Berets. Um, they had gone in with eight days of supplies. And as you know from deployment, you're taking fire, um, and the firefight was so intense that at the end of the first day, they were out of water. And they were running low on ammunition already at the end of the first day, having taken eight days worth of supplies down into this firefight. Uh, so we had 
again, through the relationship we had built and listening to the radio and hearing what was going on down there, we had taken supplies from the, the Green Beret headquarters back up at Bastion. So we unloaded the supplies, uh, picked up the individual who was wounded and were able to, to extricate him and get him back and he recovered fine also. Um, the following day, we went down for the third time. Uh, so I think this is kind of what, what garnered it. Um, by now, there was fire support on hand. Uh, we got the call that uh, individual, an Air Force individual, actually, um, it was one of the uh, uh, thrown attack controllers, had taken a round in the neck. And um, they were having trouble finding a pulse. Uh, we rushed out immediately, got into the aircraft, picked up out of Bastion. Marja, and in particular, the bazaar was 20 miles to the south. And as soon as we picked up and turned the helicopters to the south, you could already see the smoke and the coming up from the ordnance that was hitting in the area around there. Um, the the uh, towering uh, amount of ordnance that the uh, Air Force was now trying to put on to, to stamp down the uh, attack from the Taliban. Um, individual was on the roof again. Um, we went into there. They were able to get him off the roof. Um, we took RPG fire. Uh, we took mortars under the helicopters, knocking the helicopters sideways in the air. Um, my wingman in a new helicopter at this point in time was able to land um, and uh, pick the individual up while I uh, basically ran over the top of the enemy uh, areas and drew fire for him as he went into the LZ. Um, Again, can't say enough about the, the pararescue that got out. They were talking about, you know, the fact that they were seeing, you, you could see the rounds ricocheting off the buildings, um, et cetera, or around this as these guys were going in there. So well, you kind of casually just say you're taking on fire for them, but can you describe what that was like? I mean, at, at the time, you were so focused yeah. on. Uh, just getting the job done that um, you, you just kind of notice it. Mm -hmm. you, you notice that it's going on. Um, you notice that there are, you notice rounds going off the buildings, you notice tracers, you notice uh, the fact that things are knocking the helicopter around, but you don't um, you don't process it to be hundred percent honest. It was so focused and again, these are individuals that we knew. And we knew pretty well, and it was, we were very passionate about getting these guys out of there. I can't say enough about my crews. The, I mean, these guys were the highest trained individuals flying H-60s in the Air Force. I mean, there's, the, there's really no contestation to that. So um, the professionalism was just spot on the whole time. Thank you so very much for sharing with our listeners your two stories. Um, and you're right, it takes, it takes a team. Absolutely. Thank you so very much for that. You know, the one thing I want to ask you, and, and you, you, you kind of touched upon it, you know, uh, Tony asked you, you know, what was it like? And you really can't process it until it's all said and done. And are you okay with where you are now? I am okay with where I am now, um, and I have been able to process it, but it took time. Uh, I mean, this occurred in 2009, so um, I, I went from uh, immediately being deployed to coming back, doing my change of command, leaving and going to Air War College. And the, the difference in my personal operations uh, tempo at that point in time from going from you know, at some point in time during the deployment, we, we were flying up to 10 missions a day. We flew 100 combat missions, probably 50% of them, you know, that had contact with the enemy uh, in that April to May time frame. We flew more combat missions than the rest of the, of the Central Command Theater put together uh, because Helmand Province was, it just was so hot at that time. 
Um, I, I had issues when I got back. Um, I had, um, the crackle of a radio in Walmart when someone like keyed the mic in Walmart to say, you know, price check on aisle three, that crackle that a radio makes right before, uh, someone speaks into it was the same crackle that we heard on our radios when we were sitting, waiting in the operations center, waiting to launch. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned Keith Altenhoffen. Keith Altenhoffen passed away in 2016. Um, uh, and several other individuals also that we lost in the beginning of 2016 that, uh, essentially succumbed to, um, you know, PTSD, drinking, uh, all the, the things that kind of go along with that. Um, and we've lost some, some individuals, uh, another silver star winner, uh, Tom Cahill, who passed away in March of 2016. Um, uh, and it's the thing that I think has gotten me through, um, was again, the camaraderie it's well, two things, the, the camaraderie, number one, um, I had the great fortune of sitting next to a guy, Scott Brower at Air War College, who was a Green Beret. So this is a guy who had been there, who had done it, and he, had, he wasn't one of the ones that was deployed with me in 2009, but you know, we, you have shared experiences and, and you can feel it with these people. And he, he helped me. And also, uh, of course, my family was, you know, instrumental in understanding you know, just that, you know, there were hard days that, that uh, I went through. I know all my folks have gone through it because they saw, uh, you know, combat rescue, the, they see the pararescue in the back. Again, we're, go, we're not going into necessarily areas where someone's got a sprained ankle. Mm -hmm. um, they were picking up, uh, you know, picking up children that, you know, there was, there was a time where um, children were being wounded to try to draw us in, where the Taliban were hurting children so that we could, they could, they knew we would show up for that and then they would try to ambush us. Yep. Um, and it's hard on, on these guys. And um, back at the time, there wasn't a lot of help, I'll be 100% honest. There really wasn't. I, I think it's improved tremendously, and I'm glad that uh, the military has taken the steps it has to really improve how it deals with this and to you know view it as the problem that it is. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think that there's a lot of individuals in that first 10 years since uh, after 9-11 occurred that never really got the help that they needed. And you're right. Um, the military is getting better, but it, there's still a long road. Thank you so very much for, for spending time with us today and, sh and sharing your journey, your incredible stories, um, your story of valor. Thank you. And thank you for everything that you're doing, too, for that and for, you know, mental health awareness. I mean, it, it is such a it's such a big deal in taking care of our folks when they get back. And to our listeners. Continue to stay tuned in, continue to plug in, because we've got more incredible stories coming at you of stories from downrange, stories of men and women who have been there. So check back every week for new episodes posted on www.moaa.org slash podcast. The Never Stop Serving podcast is the official podcast of the Military Officers Association.
Hog zero one has the white smoke in sight. Force confirmed that that's the enemy. My targeting pod is set to infrared at the time, so everything is white hot. And I see a large flash, like a really bright flash in it, which typically means something very, very hot, like an explosion or something like that. And I immediately hover over the mic button on the on the throttle, expecting to hear somebody's about to start talking. We see your shape. I see your shape. Breathe it. Breathe it. copy. We're still taking fire. Smoke is being puffed. The JTAC comes on. He's like, hey, we got our front element. The troops in contact right now. A barricaded shooter that just shot an RPG at him. Hog, be advised, we are still taking fire. Turned out what I saw, that bright flash I saw, was the, the motor from the rocket propelled grenade coming out of that. Okay, do you see the building due south of the smoke, about 100 meters? That is our target. And so when he dis when he says that, uh, I just come back with something to the effect of like, copy, you know, I just saw a bright flash in the vicinity of building 151. And he comes back and he was like, yes, that's it. That's where they are. Problem was, is their explosive ordnance technician that's with the ground team uh, was injured in the blast, and they and at the time they were thinking it was bad. And now we have a U.S. casualty. So now my whole job in life is like protect the friendlies that are over there, protect the helicopters to get them there, and then take care of the initial threat. We're able to get the helicopter in, basically no issues. They get to a, get to a landing zone, and then as the uh, as the team basically gets outside of that danger close range from the target, we're able to employ on the building. Boxer one is in hot. It, it, it is, I mean, th this young man, and again, I'm, I'm going to stay live for about uh, about 10 minutes, uh, but Pete Reed served uh, in 3rd Battalion, 8th Marines, you know, joined the Marines. He didn't have to do it, uh, but he joins the Marines. You know, he becomes, you know, an 03, you know, 0311, if you will, in the infantry. And, um, and hopefully I got that right. Let me make sure. Let me make sure I got it right. Double check. Make sure you know I got his actual um, MOS right. So I want to make sure I got. It. I don't want to do him wrong. Yeah, no, he was an automatic rifleman. Yep, and um, joins the Marines. gets gets assigned eventually to Third Battalion, Eighth Marines. Deploys to Afghanistan. Uh, matter of fact, two Everyone, welcome back to Unarmored Talk Podcast. Two weeks have gone by that fast, and I am still your host, Mario P. Fields. And we have another guest today. Uh, be, be, but before I bring him on, you guys know what I'm going to do. Thank you so much. As we rapidly approach year three, the downloads in the cities and countries around the world just keep growing every episode. And the views on the playlist on the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, just keeps growing weekly not no daily so thank you so much and remember your views on the youtube channel generate funds that are donated to still serving incorporated my nonprofit that helps high schoolers in underserved communities and creates opportunities that they would not have because they don't have the funding the next check ceremony will be in april so every time you click or share any video on the youtube channel you're making an impact for this generation and tomorrow's professionals all right i'm done you guys know the deal done with all that stuff let's get to the real deal ladies and gentlemen gentlemen we got colonel rico i like his last name too player <laughs> i love it man that we could build a business concept around it he is a retired united states marine corps colonel 33 years i didn't say 23 i didn't say three 33 years serving our wonderful nation in the United States Marines. He's the executive producer of Robinson Player Films, and he's a 2019 Emmy Award recipient. You know, I don't got those special tools, so I'm a clap. <laughs> Colonel, you mind if I call you Colonel Rico? You call me whatever you like, Mario. Anything but late for dinner, brother. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for inviting me onto your, your show. 
Um, it's just tremendous the work you're doing for those still serving and especially for those in the veteran community. So thank you for allowing me to be here today. No, my pleasure. And thank you so much for being on the show and giving us some time to give us some wisdom from your most recent journey uh, uh, transitioning out of the United States Marines. Can you please tell the listeners and viewers just a little bit about yourself, uh, Rico? Um, a, a little bit about me. Like you said, 33 years of, of service. Uh, no two tours were the same. Raised my right hand and, and, uh, and said, hey, I, I will defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Um, have a legacy of, of aunts and uncles who served in the Navy, the Air Force, um, and the Army, but, but none of them, you know, wore the cloth of the Marines. Uh, I wanted a challenge, definitely got that. Um, thought it would be a few years after graduating from college and it turned in, you know, went from three to 33. So I've been blessed, uh, you know, touched several continents and, uh, and, and, and every adventure was, was definitely what the, um, not quite what the recruiter said, but, but it was an adventure nonetheless. <laughs> right, right. We got to love our recruiters, right? And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, that's cool too. You got, you, know, you got joint forces in the, you know, in the player family, joint forces. And, but they were missing one component. I believe people's kind of a little nervous and scared to go, go try to earn a title Marine. And here comes, here comes Rico, my friend. Absolutely. So, you know, it, I, I, I salute everyone who serves. Uh, my daughter is serving now. Uh, wow. She's uh, aboard Abilene Air Force Base. She's in security forces. And my middle son, he's a United States Marine. Um, he's a hard charger Lance Cooley, uh, Lance Corporal. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, and uh, my other two children are, are seeking, you know, chasing uh, music and and computers. So um, well rounded. And and the, for the two that serve, uh, good good for them. Uh, I would support whatever they whatever their choices were, as long as they were happy. And uh, that that was good for me. Man, that is cool. And my hats off to your your children uh, who you. are serving and following. You know, kind of establish their own new legacy and keeping that line of service going. Well, hey, let's get right into the topic. You know, a lot of times, just just what I've experienced, a lot of times you hear the, the testimonies and, and things from the, the, the younger folks who are transitioning out of the military. But it's you don't, I don't see too much content on the executive level folks, right? The, in the private sector, the C-suite leaders who are transitioning and what, what is their experience? So let's talk about it. You just transitioned out. What, what, walk me through your journey. Well, uh, Mario, in looking back and reflecting on the journey, um, I wish I had started the journey earlier in the sense that, you know, everyone is, is prayerful and focused on uh, hopefully getting that next rank. Right. That doesn't always come to fruition. It, it is what it is. And you have to, you know, uh, do a reality check, look in the mirror and say, okay, what is the next plan? What's the next chapter? How am I going to um, to to guide that chapter left, right, center? And and in doing that, I attended the, um, the transition class aboard Paris Island. Right. Extremely informative. Uh, a fire hose is an understatement because there were just so much great information. And you know, if if you if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So in in, in in realizing, okay, this journey is complete. What am I going to do next? Um, it was it was a harsh uh, a harsh tonic to 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 take a sip and say, okay, all right, this this Marine Corps stuff, day on, stay on, is done. Now what? Um, the, your schedule is yours. The commitments are yours. The decisions are yours. And and it's it's uh, it's a heavy weight. So in all of that process, Mario. Uh, the transition class provided a lot of information, right. and and a lot of my peers, um, I, I've witnessed that they stick around. They'll retire on Friday in Charlie's, Alpha's, Bravo, whatever uniform, and they come to work aboard an installation, a base, or the you know the Puzzle Palace of the Pentagon in a suit that following Monday. Mm. No time off, no decompress, none of that. They just you know, hang up the uniform and put on a suit and keep grinding, keep rowing. That, that wasn't my plan. Uh, and, and Hollywood is a whole, we could do a whole session on Hollywood. That's a whole nother oh, thing which you're oh, oh, very we, familiar with. We will. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I, I did, I did a, a pivot, uh, not necessarily retired, but retired from being in uniform, right. you know, uh, every day, day on, stay on with zero to three, you know. And, and I had some facial hair before, 
and you know clean that up for you <laughs> <laughs> and, here, and, here, for and Rico and here I am with a nice gold tee I've, <laughs> I've been rocking it for about four years <laughs> And doing it well. I doing appreciate it. it. You, you know, I got to keep it the Marine Corps standards. <laughs> Absolutely. Inspection ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, you know, and, and, and what was there any struggles? And in, in other words, what I mean is, was when you got out, was there a, oh, man, this is real. Like, this, whoa. What, what was that question. moment or moments for you? It was, you know, in, in the class, the tonic in the class was, uh, like I said, I was aboard Paris Island and in a class with, you know, 30 other folks transitioning in various flavors. Um, what what kind of made me uncomfortable was that as a commander, um, you can affect people's lives. And some of those folks that because of their own doing and the, you know, non-judicial punishment, they were in there because of me. So oh. we're in the same transition class. Wow. Exactly. And, and we're getting the same information. And it was extremely uncomfortable. And I, and I requested to say, hey, I, I have to participate, but can I do it virtually because of these reasons? And, and you know, nobody thinks about that. Who, who said you, you're going to, you know, give someone office hours and then you're going to be in the transition class with them? I would have never. Wow. And you, you, you can't know, make it up, and you know, ladies and gentlemen, for for those who are who who are not in the military, this is equivalent to a judge giving a sentence to to someone on trial and finding them guilty for their actions. For their actions, it, and then the judge is going through to professional training, sitting with the person he just or she just gave a, a, a you know sentence to. Absolutely. So it was um, it was awkward. Um, the, the professionals aboard Paris Island handled it with, with grace and they completely understood they hadn't uh, experienced anything like that before. So there was nothing in the guidebook to say, Hey, um, this is what you do. We, we figured it out and, and got through it. Um, but, but, but the, the training was tremendous. And, and as they're given all this information, it's like, okay, um, what am I going to do? And how do these tools that they presented help me during that transition? Mm. Um, fast and furious. It, it's as much or as little as you want, but it's, it's, it's more than the average bear can can withstand sometimes. Um, and, and if there was any uh, lesson learned, it would be, you know, once you know the writings on the wall for you to bail, start doing the transition. Hammer out your plan, write out your plan, type your plan, whatever, but have that plan in place um, because it, it gets fast and furious as that a, a retirement date approaches. Yeah, you, you know, Rico, and, and, and great points. And and I, you know, again, I see, and we, we briefly talked about Hollywood and some of the film, right, entertainment industry initiatives you got. Well, well trust me, I, I I don't care if I got seen my, my debit card. We'll, we'll pay for you to come back on the show to talk about some of that stuff. But since since you've transitioned out, have you have you noticed that some of the leadership behaviors and skills and management skills as a commanding officer in your 33 years in the Marine Corps, have you noticed you have kind of a competitive advantage as you're transferring those skills over to the private sector? Well, Mario, I don't know if there's a, a competitive advantage, but, you know, service members, I think, across the board have a different work ethic. Um, service members across the board, um, you know, especially the closer you are to taking the uniform off, there's still some of that that uh, active duty stink on you um, that, that it, it doesn't, you know, it takes months and years for that to, to wear your battle rhythm. It's you've been doing it for years. No, right. um, and, you know, a lot of times we, we say what we mean, we mean what we say. And for civilians, it's not always like that. So um, I've gotten away from acronyms. Um, I think I've, you know, gotten away from a lot of the Marines speak, the jargon of, of what makes us Marines. Um, but the, the work ethic is the same. Um, you know, being a straight shooter is the same. And, you know, um, over promise and under deliver has not changed. Not quite the same in Hollywood from what I've experienced. <laughs> hey, would you say my definition of over promising and under delivering is not a shared uh, belief system uh, over there in uh, Hollywood area? It's sometimes it's just words. Sometimes, sometimes it's just yeah. words. Right, yeah. right. It, it, you know, I saw this, uh, you, you did a LinkedIn post about uh, about a year ago, and it was wonderful. 
Um, it was when you, you know, you posted about your new journey. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. What, what inspired that? You know, what, what inspired that journey? You know, LinkedIn was one of the things I was introduced to in the transition class. Uh, because uh, when I was the director of public affairs at the Pentagon for the Marine Corps, um, LinkedIn, it was a no-go. Uh, there was the, the, the site was hacked and several of our generals and colonels, their sites were hacked by um, a, a hostile foe. Right. Okay. So we were given, hey, no-go, stay away from it, leave it alone. That has, of course, changed. And I was reintroduced to it in the, in the transition class. And I was just kind of blown away by all the information that's on there, the, the no kidding connections, not just Marine Corps, but, but across all industry. And it's a, an invaluable tool. And maximizing that tool was my intent. And you know, you're in production, timing is everything. And, right. and if you can get the most bang out of your tools, then I think you're, you're you know, being a smart producer. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was just timely. I was leaving the Marine Corps. My son was joining the Marine Corps. All the visual elements came together. And, 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 it, and you know, truth be told, I got to salute LinkedIn because that's driven probably 85% of the work and the consulting that I've been doing since hanging up the uniform. Wow. Ma maximizing resources. You guys just heard it from Rico, maximizing resources. If you, if you had to give a tip right now uh, to, to anyone serving, you know, in any branch of service that's kind of gone over that 10 year mark and, and they're considering going, you know, right to 20 and longer, um, what could you give, what would you tell them? Wow, Mario, I, I think I would tell them, um, you know, keep it in threes like, like we do. And, and, you know, both Marines who, that's it's ingrained in us you know do, do those threes for me the three was you know you've mentioned it before linkedin was was one of them for me the second one was uh veterati and that are you familiar with veterati no it's um uh it's a platform where there are mentors and mentees usually with the, with a military background but say you know they're podcast specialists on there you and i could be mentors for young troops looking to get into the podcast game. Oh, wow. There's someone, you know, seeking something in Hollywood and in distribution and whatever. I mean, if, if you served, then you can be a mentor for someone in your specialty. And they, they keep it really simple. Um, and then the last one would be some type of um, military organization, sort of like the VFW. Um, and, and the VFW has been getting thumped on because it's not our parents' VFW. You know, right. they're going through transition. They're trying to get, you know, millennials to be interested. It's just not resonating, un right. unfortunately. I mean, you know, it, it is what it is. But organizations like that, I think, bring value to the table because there's an outlet where we all speak the same language from serving in the military, whatever the branch. You'll find brothers and sisters that, that speak that language. And I think that's important. So for me, it was military veterans and journalism. And the and it's just, you know, for, for pencil pushers and, and folks who are always on behind the computer, it's a it's a great geek out network where, you know, it leads to jobs, it leads to collaboration, it leads to, you know, that creative, the creative juices continually flowing and, and iron sharpening iron. Right. Um, so for me, those three are what worked. But you know, if there was a, a lesson learned or recommendation for anyone transitioning, have that plan. And, and support it with the, with the right tools that'll take you to the next level or however you want to write your own, your next chapter. Cause you're writing the chapter. That's the scariest part. <laughs> yeah, and, and I totally agree with you. And I love how you brought up too the, 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 the importance of getting a mentor, getting coaches, right? Mentors and coaches to help you with that plan in your transition uh, process because it is an, an emotional of, of, of emotions of nervousness and scary because it's you on you you know Absolutely. it is you on you well I know you're busy and um I won't say busy I would say I know you're having fun and, <laughs> you know this is on our talk right we, we, this is accurate accurate we're trying to help you develop an accurate way of thinking so Absolutely. I know you're having fun I just asked before I let you go um, when you see Oprah in Hollywood, tell her I say hello. 
<laughs> hey, Rico, before I let you go, how can people find you and how can people find the things that you use to make you successful? Well, Mario, again, I can't thank you enough for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Um, to find me, LinkedIn is the best. I, I can't say it enough. Um, creatively, my mentor, Spencer Proffer, he runs Meteor 17, and I'm his military advisor. So you go to military or uh, meteor17.com, and you'll find all the content that we're working on creatively. Nice. Um, and, 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 you know, don't Google Rico Player. Whatever, don't do that because <laughs> only probably 3% of what pops up is accurate. <laughs> um, but but the, the best way is, is through LinkedIn. That's where, uh, like I said, a majority of my content and my work uh, is driven, and, and it's a great place to connect. Um, uh, yeah. So the, the, those, those are the best ways to, to reach out. Oh, Rico, I salute you. Thank you, sir. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I'll make sure the, the links are in the show notes. But again, thank you for coming on Unarmored Talk podcast. Truly, truly appreciate you, and be safe. All right, Rico? Thank you. Simple Fidelis. Stay healthy, Thanks. brother. Simper fire. Well, ladies and gentlemen, another couple of weeks, we'll do another episode. But until then, you guys know the deal. Be safe and God. And and I'm going to show everything that the the A-10 can do. We're going to show us. My targeting pod is set to infrared at the time. So everything is white hot. And I see a large flash, like a really bright flash in it, which typically means something very, very hot, like an explosion or something like that. And I immediately hover over the mic button on the on the throttle, expecting to hear somebody's about to start talking. What's now? We see your safe. I see your safe. Bring it in. Bring it in. Good copy. We're still taking fire. Smoke is being popped. The JTAC comes on. He's like, hey, we got our front element. of troops in contact right now. A barricaded shooter that just shot an RPG at him. Hog, be advised, we are still taking fire. Turned out what I saw, that bright flash I saw, was the, the motor from the rocket propelled grenade coming out of that. Okay, do you see the building due south of the smoke, about 100 meters? That is our target. And so when he dis- when he says that, uh, I just come back with something to the effect of like, copy, you know, I just saw a bright flash in the vicinity of building 151. And he comes back and he was like, yes, that's it. That's where they are. Problem was, is their explosive ordnance technician that's with the ground team uh, was injured in the blast, and they and at the time they were thinking it was bad. And now we have a U.S. casualty. So now my whole job in life is like protect the friendlies that are over there, protect the helicopters to get them there, and then take care of the initial threat. We're able to get the helicopter in, basically no issues. They get to a, get to a landing zone, and then as the uh, as the team basically gets outside of that danger close range from the target, we're able to employ on the building. Dog zero one is in hot. My name's uh, Major Hayden Fulham. Uh, I go by Gator. I'm uh, right now. I'm the the commander and the pilot for U.S. Air Force's A-10 demonstration team. Major Fulham is now positioning the A-10 for a pass down the show line. Five, four, three, feet. Heavy personnel in the open. At show center, no mark. Press. So there's a deep, rich heritage of aviation uh, with our family, and it's something that, that carries over to me and my younger brother, and some something that makes us uh, very proud to continue serving today. So some of my earliest memories as as a child were listening to stories about Wayne and Roger, my two grandfathers, who were both fighter pilots in the Air Force and both served during Vietnam. Wayne was ultimately shot down and killed uh, during the Vietnam War, and Roger was shot down a few months later and spent the remaining five years as a prisoner of war before he, before he returned home. 
My biological grandfather, Wayne Fulham, was his name. He was also an F-105 pilot during Vietnam and was a good friend of Rogers, of who became my grandfather. Uh, and in November 1967, he was shot down and killed uh, just north of Hanoi flying an F-105. I believe it was his 34th, uh, 34th mission. Um, they were doing one of the Iron Hand missions as far as surface to air threats. That was some of the most heavily defended territory in the world uh, at the time. So some of the most dangerous flying you could possibly do. He gets hit when they're over, uh, over Kep. Uh, he tries to make it to the Gulf of Tonkin to punch out over the water because he knows that's the best chance of survival is if he can get out over the water, there's naval assets out there. Um, basically, he's not able to make it out to the water uh, and he, he ejects, gets out of the airplane and uh, that's basically the last anyone's ever heard or seen from him. The other folks that are flying with him, they see him, they see he has good parachute, they see his parachute go into the trees uh, and the story kind of stops there uh, for a number of years. So then. You fast forward, so once the Vietnamese was letting U.S. officials into the country uh, to find the remains of service members, my grandfather Wayne, uh, he, he was some of the earliest from remains that were identified. They identified his remains in, uh, in 1987, and his funeral was back home in January of 1988. So my mom was pregnant with me uh, at his funeral that they did at the National Cemetery in, in Chattanooga. Probably my dad and his brothers may have a very different outlook and, and, and view on it, but to me it was, um, I, I shouldn't say celebrate, it wasn't like something that was celebrated, but it was something that, that we were very proud of, you know, and something that, um, that they, it was something that they both believed heavily in, uh, and that meant a lot, and that certainly carried over, over to us as well. Uh, even as a young kid, I loved everything about the A-10. Kind of a goofy airplane, an ugly airplane that carries a big gun in the front of it. Like I thought that, that kind of spoke to me and appealed to me. Uh, and so I was fortunate enough to get selected to fly the A-10 out of pilot training. I went to my first assignment in uh, Moody Air Force Base, flying in the 75th Fighter Squadron, uh, which is the A-10s of the 23rd Fighter Group that had the shark teeth on the front of them uh, and have all the lineage back to the American Volunteer Group flying P-40s with the shark teeth on them. So uh, a lot of really cool uh, squadron heritage there uh, and getting to fly A-10s with teeth on them doesn't get much cooler than that. Within about a month of showing up to the squadron, we deployed to southern Turkey and for Operation Inherent Resolve and we're fighting ISIS in northern Iraq and northern Syria uh, for six months. Once we got there, we didn't waste any time. I think uh, between getting in country and my first combat sortie, I, was, I think I was only there two days or something like that, and I started flying uh, pretty much right away. Uh, it was a really dynamic situation going on over there. ISIS had really taken a stronghold in northern Iraq and northern Syria, and they had claimed Raqqa as their basically their uh, world capital. Turkey at the time was a uh, pretty volatile and dangerous place, uh, but with the, the, the wild thing it was when we first got there, um, folks that were permanently stationed there at Inserlik, uh, the U.S. forces that are that were permanently stationed there still had their families there. So like while we're, you know, in tan flight suits and we're got bombs hanging on our jets every day and full load of guns and all the things that you associate with combat. When we go to the, you know, go to the chow hall on base to eat, well, you see like moms with their double strollers and kids and pushing them around base, uh, which was a really wild experience because we're living on an Air Force base. Like it's got, it's got a commissary, it's got a BX, and it's got families there, and they, you know, you see kids running around riding their scooters down the sidewalk, but we just happen to go to the other side of the base and then go fly combat missions every day. So it was a weird dynamic to be like, to, to have that, that odd shift and think like, within a one hour flight of where we're sitting right now, like you have some of the most evil people on earth doing some of the most grotesque things, and we're here we are, like this is a, it was a really weird, uh, really weird parallel. And in the six months we were there, uh, it went from that to, uh, turning into more of a deployed environment. All the families were sent home, and then you'd go to uh, you'd go to the chow hall, and now there's the big concrete T walls, like block, you know, barricaded around the chow hall, and you'd see, uh, you know, it, it looked a little more like a, a Ford operating location, and less like a uh, stateside uh, military base. You train and you work so hard to get proficient in the airplane so that you can protect the folks on the ground that you're there to protect. And here you are, like here I am getting to do it as a brand spanking new lieutenant uh, in a fighter squadron. Um, so in a lot of ways it was really, really gratifying and really kind of self-fulfilling time. Uh, and I, and I say that, I say that kind of sparingly because there's nothing, there's nothing really that gratifying about like going to combat and dropping bombs on people or anything like that. But, uh, uh, but when you're when you're helping the right people, it feels good at the end of the day for sure. So ended up getting about five about 500 combat hours uh, in that first deployment, and um, 
a little over, I don't remember exactly, a little over 60 combat missions in the six months that I was there. Here they come again! It was an interesting dynamic changing from that first deployment to the second one. Because the first one, like I said, I'm the newest, youngest guy in the squadron. And then in my my next deployment, I'm, you know, I've got, I don't know, at the time, probably 15, 1600 hours in the A-10 and uh, about to be an instructor in the airplane and uh, have one combat deployment under my belt and all that kind of thing. So it was a huge, like a huge shift in mentality uh, and, and a different mission, uh, you know, kind of mission set they were doing. But, but it's interesting to like go back and think about that first one, the first deployment and you know, how green I really was and how much I was learning. Not to say I wasn't continually learning on the second one, but the, the second one I came in with a whole a whole different bag of bag of tricks and bag of experience uh, that, uh, that paid dividends, yeah. One of the most memorable uh, missions from that second deployment, like once we're in Afghanistan, like I said, now I've uh, got a little more experience in the airplane, a little more comfortable and certainly, you know, more comfortable being in a deployed environment. But uh, so my younger brother flies the A-10 as well. We're in the same squadron and we actually deployed together to Afghanistan and I've flown uh, combat missions with my little brother as my wingman, which is pretty, uh, pretty unique, pretty remarkable. And at the time, his wife also flies the A-10. All three of us were in the same squadron at the time and we all three deployed to Afghanistan together in the same squadron, which was uh, which is pretty remarkable time. I hadn't heard anybody tell me of other times I knew of that happening. And so we ended up we ended up flying together uh, a handful of times, and I was pretty nervous the first time we flew together because I was like, man, this you know, not only am I keeping, not only am I responsible for you know my wingman now, because I'm the flight lead out there. It's like not only am I responsible for whoever's out here flying on my wing and keeping them safe and making sure we don't get ourselves any, you know, any, anything silly, uh, but now it's my brother, so it's like man, it's a little bit of added dynamic there. Uh, and so the first time I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it. the first time we flew together. We'd flown together before uh, home station, but but of course, like first time flying in combat together. After the first time flying together, I was like, okay, no, we're good. I'm, I'm okay with this for sure. Well, we ended up flying together, I don't know, five, six, seven times uh, through the course of, of that first portion, portion of the deployment. Uh, and I got I was his flight lead the first time he dropped a bomb in combat, the first time he shot the gun in combat. So uh, pretty pretty remarkable thing to get to experience with, with your brother for sure. Um, and, and an exciting thing to be a part of too. Uh, but yeah, one, one of the more memorable ones was the first bomb he dropped in combat was uh, was uh, was a pretty pretty push it up like pretty push it up sorty. We were supporting some folks just north of Kandahar, supporting a team from the 2nd Ranger Battalion, and they're going to be clearing through this village. And so we were there for uh, just after they had been infilled by the helicopters. Uh, they, had already, they were already on the ground by the time we show up. The way these Afghan villages are built up, it's just a complex, just mess down there. And all the buildings look exactly the same. And, you know, so it can be kind of difficult to keep track of where everyone's at. And then early on in the sortie, they, uh, they no joke, start taking fire from this big tree line. A controller on the ground uh, speaks to us, gives us all the information we need to prosecute an attack on a target. Uh, the way that kind of our tactics were set up and the way I had briefed that the game plan was going to be was uh, my brother, you know, he was my number two and he was going to be our primary bomb dropper. So my, my job was to dope out whatever the situation was going to be and then he's my hired gun. I'm going to translate all the information that he needs to put it in his jet so he can effectively put the weapon where it needs to go. I said something to the effect of like, all right, man, here's your time to shine because I'm the one using like the trucker comm, uh, not using very good brevity in the airplane. He just comes back with a real sharp toot, which is the response I would expect from him. So I was like, okay, good. He's got his mind in the right place. We have eyes on this tree line uh, really, really quick. Um, we can't see any of the muzzle, muzzle flashes or anything like that. This is during the daytime. Uh, so we can't see anything, but uh, we're, you know, I described the tree line that they talked me onto. I say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. And they confirm really quick. Yeah, if you're on the right spot, what we want to put is to, we want to put, uh, put two bombs on each side of, the, of each side of that tree line. And so he rolls in, puts two bombs exactly where they needed to be. Uh, and the shooting immediately stops and and uh we know hey like we did you know we took care of the guys out here we've done some good work i can't speak for him and his airplane but i, I imagine he got those kind of like pre-game jitters out a little bit and he's like okay yeah here we are now we're, we're ready to work 
and then uh, and then we fast forward a couple hours. We've been to the tanker, I know, at least once by this time. We're back overhead. I just happen to be looking at what I think is, you know, very front friendly element. And I'm doing this in my targeting pod, which I have set to infrared at the time. So everything white in it is hot. And I see a large flash, like a really bright flash in it, which typically means something very, very hot, like an explosion or something like that. And I immediately hover over the mic button on the on the throttle, expecting to hear somebody's about to start talking. Because I, I don't know, is that a good flash? Is that a bad flash? Was that a breaching charge for them to get into a building? And it felt like a really long time, but I bet if I go back, if I were to hear it again, it's probably like three seconds, you know, it's probably a very short amount of time. And Rise, I'm about to key the mic to, to ask them. The JTAC comes on. He's like, hey, we got our front element. Their troops in contact right now. Good copy. We're still taking fire. Smoke is being tossed. A barricaded shooter that just shot an RPG at him. Turned out what I saw, that bright flash I saw was the the motor from the rocket propelled grenade. And so when he dis when he says that, uh, I just come back with, you know, I just saw a bright flash in the vicinity of building 151. And he comes back and he was like, yes, that's it. That's where they are. And I know this is probably going to, this thing may pick up a little bit. So immediately I tell uh, my brother, I tell him like, hey, you need to call the tanker, go get gas now. Because what I don't want to happen is for both of us to be low on fuel and we both have to leave them. And now we're leaving these guys high and dry. So I send him immediately. My objective is like, I'm going to dope out this whole scenario for him. I'm going to send him all the information. Okay, do you see the building due south of the smoke about 100 meters? That is our target. So the second he's overhead, he's ready to roll in at a moment's notice or he can employ weapons. Basically, we execute that exact plan. He's overhead. He's ready. Uh, I head uh, to the tanker. Problem was, is their uh, EOD technician, the explosive ordnance technician that's with the ground team, uh, was injured in the blast. And, they, and at the time, they were thinking it was bad. But now we have a U.S. casualty. So now my whole job in life is like, now we need to keep the helicopter safe. Like we... We, we don't want to turn one injured person into a lot of injured people or uh, into a downed aircraft. So now it's securing the landing zones where they plan on going and, in, and then the route for to get the friendlies to the helicopter. That's all I'm worried about now. We're able to get the helicopter in basically with no issues. They get to a, get to a landing zone. And then as the, uh, as the team basically gets outside of that danger close range from the target, we're able to employ on the building. Dogs are one is dead hot. That's clear, you're clear high, go high. eventually get the uh get the EOD tech onto onto the helicopter but by that night he was in Germany and was in surgery uh in a hospital in Germany and we ultimately got the word a couple days later that he you know he he made it and he was he was going to recover fine I think it was the next day me and my brother both were sitting there like at the ops in our in our ops building uh and the phone rings in the intel shop where our intelligence folks work uh and it's the JTAC we were working with the day prior and uh, he just wanted to know, hey, is, you know, whatever call sign, Hog 5-3, is Hog 5-3 around from yesterday? And they look on the schedule and they see that was us. And down he's like, hey, guys, just want to let you know, like, if you guys weren't there, like, we may not have made it back. So just want to thank you guys kind of thing. And that was like the pinnacle. Like, that was the absolute peak of my time in the A-10. It was like, that's, that's, that right there is what it's all about. That's all I told him. It was like, hey, you know, you're the whole reason we exist. You're the whole, the whole reason we do what we do. You'll see an, you see an old saying at a lot of A-10 squadrons. It says the, the mission is the 18-year-old on the ground with a rifle. Everything else is support, and we view, you know, view ourselves that way. Um, so, but that was a that was a, a full circle moment for sure. And then the fact that I got to do that with my younger brother on my wing that was pretty uh, that was a pretty wild time. How I ended up. Uh, getting hired on to be the demonstration pilot, uh, like a lot of, like a lot of things in the military, a little bit, of, you know, dumb luck and timing. I knew it existed, but I didn't know a whole lot about the demonstration team and really what the mission is. Because flying in air shows and flying in the military uh, are extremely different things. Like I said, you know, from a young age, I always had a passion for airplanes and passion for military history and passion for service, passion for this jet and a passion for our mission. So I was like, man, this would be a cool way to kind of share a lot of that stuff. And so I kind of threw my hat in the ring and I applied for the job and ended up getting selected to, to do it. And and so I'm, it's a two year assignment. I'm going into my second year uh, right now. My job is to travel around, recruit, retain, and inspire, and take the A-10 around, show it off to, to crowds all over the country and uh, get to have a lot of fun with the airplane. So we're, everybody on the team, we're uh, all active duty, stationed out of Davis-Monthan, 
and I'm the only permanently assigned pilot to the team. And then we've got nine maintainers that take care of our airplanes, and uh, we get to travel all over the, all over the U.S. And, and get to show off the capabilities of the A-10. So today we're here to, uh, in Tyler, Texas, Tyler Pounds Regional Airport, uh, and we're flying the Rose City Air Fest. Uh, and the whole idea is we're going to go out there uh, this afternoon, this evening, and I'm going to show everything that the, the A-10 can do. We're going to show as fast as it'll go, as slow as it'll go, as tight as it'll turn, as fast as it'll roll, and, and take it out there and run it through its paces and hopefully get really get people really excited about, uh, about seeing some jets flying. Wayne and Roger, my two grandfathers, they're they're with me and I feel it every single time I go up the ladder of that airplane. Every time I walk up to it and I see that thing, it's pretty powerful, it's pretty impactful. And today I'm gonna get to go out and I'm gonna get to go up the ladder and I get to fly the A-10. And that's a that's a remarkable thing and I don't take it for granted. Uh, in my book, doesn't get much cooler than that. So, so I take a lot of pride in being able to do that and a lot of pride in the family, being able to kind of carry on a little bit of that Air Force heritage and that lineage, which is a pretty exciting thing to do.
right, all right, all right. Hey, Benny, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, all right, man. Jesus Christ, man. Like, it's 5 o'clock in the morning. We up podcast, and they can't say we ain't committed. They Amen. can't, hey, hey, they can't say we ain't committed. Amen. But with that being said, what's going on, everybody? I'm Demetrius Thigpen, also known as Meech Speaks. And today, what we got today, uh, ah, today, who we have here is Douglas Benjamin. No, I'm just playing. Hey, it's Douglas <laughs> Bennett for some, for some time. <laughs> Go ahead, bro. Introduce yourself. They don't know who we are. Can you, can you hear me well? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. All right, awesome. Well, hey, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on. I appreciate the ability to be on a platform like this. Um, right. And, you know, so my name is Benny. Uh, my, my real name, government name, is Douglas Bennett. I'm currently a staff sergeant in the United States Marine Corps. I am currently reserve. Um, and that's it, man. I run my own podcast. I got a family, three kids, wife, and, uh, you know, just doing the thing, right? Living life. So, I hear that, man. I hear that, man. You no, know, since we're doing introductions, man, what's going on, everybody? Once again, my name is Demetrius Thigpen, also known as Meech Speaks. I'm also the host and creator of the podcast, Meech Speaks, a podcast dedicated to helping us become a better version of ourselves. Now, I don't know what version that is, but I do know that we deal with things such as motivation. I know we deal, at, deal with things such as mindset, and I also know that we struggle with issues such as being human. So as we navigate through the trenches of personal development, I share my practical thoughts and my personal experiences on those three pillars as we become that better version of ourselves. So with that being said, man, once again, it's five o'clock in the morning. It's on a Saturday. You know what I mean? Like, hey, how was your morning getting up? How was your morning getting up? Yo, so um, so my th thank God I have a son who's teething because right? he, he woke me up at 3.30. Um, and spent the past hour just trying to get him back to sleep. So I got myself a cup of coffee and, and, mm -hmm. and sat here and got ready for this, man. So so here we are, yo. Man, I came downstairs, man. I looked at my phone. First off, I looked at my phone and I was like, I know, I know it ain't four o'clock in the morning. I know it ain't four o'clock in the morning. Not on a Saturday. You know what I mean? Like, not on a Saturday. I, I, I roll out of bed. You feel me? Like, I roll out of bed, you know, brush my teeth, come downstairs. You know what I mean? Little, 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 little bit hungover from yesterday. I ain't about to lie to you. You know, I ain't gonna lie to you. You know, but, 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 got myself together. Pour me a cup of coffee. Here we are, man. And here we are. You know, uh, speaking of podcasting in the morning, I know we got a couple of topics. Yeah. 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 All right, man. And one of the first topics that we that we talked about, and I feel like this is something that I've been dealing with, or I just been seeing a lot of, essentially, just on on online and in real life, and that's just the changing of times. You know what I mean? Like as far as the change in climate, the change in, you know, the change in personnel, the change in the generation. Now, how many times have you heard, you feel me, where it's like, oh, well, this old, you know, I'm from the old generation or, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm from the old core, you know, or or back in my day, Lord Jesus Christ, as soon as, hey, hey, as soon as you hear somebody say back in my day, just know some heinous shit about to come out of their mouth. Like something heinous about to come out. But, but, but. The biggest thing is, is that there has definitely been a change and how do you say, um, it's a change, it's, it's essentially just a change in time or essentially just a change with leadership or a new adaptation that we have to accomplish. Yeah. So what's your, what's your take on that? Well, th this is the thing, man, this is, um, change is inevitable. It's mm -hmm. going to happen. Right. And, and I think, I think that due to the way that we live in society and the way that everything is social media and everything things move quicker in today's society than they did back in the day because change isn't a new thing it's always been there. but in when we're talking about like the military and stuff back in the day change happened but you didn't see it yeah People, you gotta understand man like you know, like now we're in the uh, when we're talking about change in the Marine Corps, or the military, where we're seeing things happen across the world in a second. Yeah. When back in the day, like it traveled through letters, through email, through text, like it wasn't something where like something happened in Japan and we saw it real time right now because this dude's on live talking about yeah. what 
happened, right? So, so we are in a different way of light because change happened so quickly in today's in today's society. So the reason why I say that is because I want people to remember that like change has always been there. Mm -hmm. But the problem that we have is that there's people that are, one, are afraid to change. There's people that believe that change isn't okay. There's people that believe that change isn't something that could happen or should happen, right? Because there's people, and when you get into new jobs, you know, or you get into a new unit, or you get into a new recruiting office, or wherever you go, even in the civilian world, you know, when you get into these new places, and you ask like, hey, well, why do we do this this way? And people say, well, hey, that's just that's just how we've always done it. And and then you're like, wait a minute, but does it make sense to do it like that? Like, is it don't you think there could be a better way? You know, so I think um I think it's important to embrace change. I think it's important to discuss change. Um and be able to, you know, not all change is good, but not all change is bad. And I think that's you know what we're here to talk about today and this is why we chose it as a topic of discussion you know i think one of the biggest things is is that especially because of this topic you know i always and i, and I and one of the biggest things is that i always reverted back to being in the fleet and i always will revert it back to being online you feel me and one of the biggest things that i've always heard is is that oh well you know back in my you know back in my generation like and it's like bro like you you speak of this generation as if it's fit, like there's a 50 year difference between you and i you, yeah. you feel me like like you know what i mean like you you speak of this generation like there's a 50 year difference between you and i you think you speak of this generation like there's a different war between you and i you know what i mean when we both we both did you know um endure, uh, operation enduring freedom we both were on that deployment you you, you yeah. get where i'm going and it's it's most of the time at most a 10 year uh at least a 10 year difference or a 20 year difference that is the most that you that i usually encounter and and my biggest my biggest irritation with it is is that that's what they said about your generation. They yeah. said your generation was soft too. The same generation that you calling soft too. Your predecessors used to call you soft or say that your generation was X Y and Z. You know what I mean? Or this generation of of who's coming in is is completely different. And I would sit back and I'd be like this: like, why do we continue to repeat the exact same thing? And just like what you had said, change is not bad. You know, look at today's society and just look where we're at right now. The climate has changed in general. But the thing is, is that we'll sit back and we'll talk about like, you know, you can't lead a horse to water. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But the thing is, is that a lot of us have become that horse getting led to water. Everything is changing around you, but you don't want to adapt to that change. And essentially, you don't want to drink. So now you're sitting in this dang on water while everybody else is essentially quenching their thirst and adapting to the situation that's currently around us or adapting to the new environment that is currently around us. And you're the only one still disgruntled. And that's yeah. the biggest issue right there is that when you don't want to change, right? Like when you decide like, oh shit, I don't want to change. I can't wait to, you know, I'm going to retire or I'm going to get out or, you know, I'm going to stick to the old ways. You have to understand that there's not that many of y'all that are sticking to these quote unquote old ways. You see what I'm saying? And I'm not necessarily talking about the mission because the mission will always adapt depending on who the enemy is. I'm not going to sit back and I'm not going to say about like our camis because our camis are always going to change essentially as well. I'm talking about the personnel and how you interact both with them and, and how you are able to receive information as well. You know, that is one of the biggest things is that, you know, they'll look at us and they'll see us on podcasting and they'll say to themselves like, oh, well, they're just podcasters. I bet they're not like this in their jobs. No, 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 no. Ten years ago, y'all just didn't have this opportunity. We we still we're still the top tier. We're still the top performers in our MOSs. You know, it's just where we have now learned to manage and, you know, allow ourselves to be in different places now. Yeah. Yeah, that's important, man, is that, you know, especially with us, you know, both of us still being staff sergeants and still being Marine Corps, like, you know, people ask me a question all the time. And, and it's the same thing, man, like, you know, when, when you have a platform or, you know, and I still don't see myself as having a platform. I really don't like even though I have listeners. Really? And yeah, because I really don't because I, I know that I'm growing and stuff like that. But like, I, I, I hate I don't want to put myself on a pedestal or I want to put myself on a platform like, yo, I'm just I'm just me talking about life. And and that's just the way that I like to think about it. But, you know, but at the same time, I have to remind myself that there are people who are listening to me 
and that what I have, what I'm saying does hold value. So it's very important that I watch what I say, because what I say on here is going to be remembered offline. So, you know, like I've got, I've gotten caught up, you know, with my Marines, like I'm talking with my Marines and, you know, they're like, oh, hey, like, you know, I, I caught that episode or, you know, talking with my company first sergeant or I'm talking to this Master Guns or, you know, like one day I was at drill and this Master Guns came up to me and he was like, yo, I saw you at the concert with the Marine rapper. And I was like, oh, crap, like I didn't even know you followed him and, and stuff like that. So, like, it's crazy because we forget how vital we are in many ways and we forget how everything is integral and how it all kind of comes together. But, you know, back to your point on the changing piece, the, the thing is, man, is that, you know, when we talk about leadership and we talk about people who say, oh, back in my day, the, the thing is, is that there's people that are stuck living in the past when they were important and they, when they were the one who was doing the work. And when, because now when, as we move up in rank, right? We we're doing the work, but we're it, we're not we're on the sidelines. We're kind of behind it, right? We're not the working bee anymore. So now we're looking at it in a different sight. So when people talk, and I'll find like myself, like you know, I, I talk about recruiting duty a lot, and I'll bring it up. I'll be like, oh yeah, back in my day, but I'll catch myself, and I'll be like, bro, why am I doing that? Because I hated that when Matt Sergeant so and so used to say, oh, back in Buffalo, like I had mm-hmm. Matt Sergeant on recruiting duty. And every time this dude would say back in Buffalo, we'd all sit back and be like, all right, we're about to be here. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, we'd be like, all right, here we go. Another Buffalo story from mm-hmm. seven years ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and the thing is, though, is that, like, here's the problem, though. His peers never called him out. His yeah. peers never said, hey, what is the value of this conversation that you're having right now? And is it bringing value? Because, bro, listen, if you bring up the back of my day and it's bringing value to the conversation and we are and, and we need to find a new way of saying it, we don't got to say back in my day. We just got to bring it up because there is value in history, right? There is value in where we've been. There's value. 100%, yeah. in what we're doing. So but the problem is the way that we we perceive it, the way that we bring it up. So I'm saying, and the reason why I'm bringing this up about this mass art was because the guy was very intellectual, the, the intellectual, the guy, everything he said was amazing. But the moment he said back in Buffalo, you lost, you, you stopped listening, you stopped listening. So it's important that as peers, we, and we tell our peers, Hey, listen, man, you know what? I know you got something to say. And I know what you have, what you're saying has value, but maybe we need to say it a different way because these young Marines, they don't want to hear about 20 years ago, Marine Corps, bro. They, they want to hear about the Marine Corps here and now, and they want to hear about how you're going to impact them right now today. You know, I, 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 I love that. And essentially, you know, there's two things that you said that I really wanted to just say something about, but I'll say the first thing of uh, the value in what you say. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we've always heard, you know, there's power in the tongue. And a lot of times, like, you know, you come across so many leadership or, you know, you just come across so many people, you know, from different times and they have experience, you know, because just like what we both, you know, we both mentioned, history is such a major teacher. You know what I mean? Like history is such a big teacher. You know, I feel like we're learning so much from history. History will teach you a lot of things, you know, as far as, you know, what to do, what not to do, what worked, what didn't work. You know what I mean? Like if that's not the case and we wouldn't study martial cultures, if that wasn't the case, then, you know, we wouldn't learn about other, you know, it's so many things in history that will help us propel ourselves in the future. It, 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 it's so much things. However, the biggest thing when you talk about value, when you bring in value, right, is that if you don't and how do i say this in the best way possible when you choose to not adapt you know what i mean like when you choose to not adapt to the environment like everybody treats themselves like they're a fucking shark you know what i mean and we both know that sharks never really had to evolve because of how overpowered they were in the very beginning you know what i mean everything else around them was evolving except for the shark and everybody has this shark mentality where it's like i don't need to evolve this worked but you also have to take into consideration what was going on during your time and why it was able to work in that fashion. You know what I mean? Like a lot of our predecessors, you see what I'm saying? Me and you came in at the very end of the war. You know what I mean? 
they well essentially i wouldn't say the very end but we still had about like five more years they were in when it first started you know what i mean and going through the the initial push and you got to understand the mindset behind that and how the mission was able to be accomplished and how we were interacting with each other back in garrison also taking into consideration that technology had not advanced in that way yet so there were certain things that they just weren't even pervious to so now here we are with that information and have the opportunity to have that information. We have to be able to take it in and adapt. And then when you come across a newer generation, you got to think about it. Like you're not going to be the first time. Um, and I don't want to say fossil. I'm not, I mean, because once again, like we treat each other like we're so old in the military. But reality is, is that most of us are either like five years or 10 years older than the other person. You get where I'm going? Like hey, you got to think about it, like. You know what I mean? Like, it, like we, we just age in dog years. You know what I mean? So, like, we treat each other like you see a gunny in the Marine Corps and you're thinking that he's probably like, oh, man, he probably is like 40 or 50. No, he's not. He's 30. Oh, German Shepherd he's, right there, bro. You know what I mean? Like, he's 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 in his late 20s, you know, for yeah. some, you know, for some. But the value is, is that when, the moment that you open your mouth, man, you got to ask yourself, like, is the is the people that you're talking to, are you are, are they're not better than you? I mean, you're not better than them. You see what I'm saying? They just came in at a different time. These are going to be your replacements. How can you impact your replacement? Because that's really what it what it, what it boils down to is that yeah. is what you're saying going to positively affect your replacement? Or is it going to be a negative or is it going to put a negative taste in their mouth when you yeah. leave? So, for example, when you hear somebody say like, oh, well, back in my day and somebody's rolling their eyes, they already know that the last time that you said back in your day, you said some bullshit. You know what I mean? Or 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 you said something that that made everybody else feel as if like, oh, well, they're just not good enough. Like I, I just had a conversation with one of my predecessors, you know, one of my men, my mentors. And he was telling me like, oh, thick pen, you know, I don't like the way that you're talking to the Marines now. And, you know, it's it, it's not like how corporal thick pen was. And I'm just like, that person doesn't even exist to me no more. Yo, can I say something about that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yo, if you tell me that I don't act like Corporal Bennett anymore. Thank you. Because I shouldn't act like Corporal Bennett anymore. God, yes. I shouldn't act like PFC Bennett no more. I yes. shouldn't act like Private Bennett no more. I yes. shouldn't act like Sergeant Bennett. Because <laughs> God, the, yes. The whole point of the Marine Corps and the whole point of life, like put the Marine Corps aside, the whole yeah. point of life yeah. is for us to grow as as men as fathers as husbands as children like bro i hope i'm not like i was yesterday bro mm -hmm. now i understand where this person may have come from yeah. but that's where people get messed up man is that people forget that we are supposed to grow in our position of authority and that we're supposed to be able to speak on different levels to different people and that's like what we're talking about right now is that there's people who don't understand that you can say the same thing, but say it differently to somebody else. Like I can have the same exact conversation with the junior Marine, with a, with a senior enlisted Marine, but it has to be in a different way. It has to be in a different I'm way. Saying, yeah. And that's what people don't understand. And, you know, and I think talking about like the generational and the change and the adapting. And I think the huge thing with today, you know, I didn't, and I didn't live, you know, in the old core, Right. I've been in the Marine Corps 14 years. But like before us, I think in the past like five, maybe Same. I think in like the past five years, a big change has become why, you know, when we grew up in the Marine Corps and someone said, hey, go do this. You never said why you just went and did it. Right. And it was mm -hmm. the same way with our parents Like our yeah. parents. Like my dad said, hey, go do this. And I said, got it. Dad, I got it now growing up even watching children and the generational and the, and the society now there's a huge push for why which again it's not wrong because if we truly are leaders and we exhibit the why and we explain to people hey this is why we're doing this then you're going to get i hate using the term buy-in because I think that if you buy into something, you can you can get rid of it. You can you can you can stop it. You can return it. So I hate that that term. I use it loosely. But if I truly get you to understand the why behind it, then I can really get you to understand why we're doing this. And now your level of work ethic, your level of understanding, is going to be exponentially more because you actually 
have the same understanding as I do. And now we're working towards a collective mission. And I think, like, to be honest with you, man, like, when we talk about why, like, there's somebody right now, I'm pretty sure, you feel me? Somebody is sitting back like this. Why are you even telling the Marines the why? Why are you know, I just see that's yep. exactly what I'm talking about. This new generation of leadership is always explaining. You know what I mean? And the reality is, is that think about it when our, we can even go outside of the military, right? Think about it when our parents were telling us things and we didn't understand the reasoning behind it. We were just doing things. So now we're, yeah, we're, 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 we're accomplishing the task, but we have no idea what this task was, what's the importance of this task and why am I even doing this task? It's yeah. just do as I, t I do as I say. And, you know, even in the military, you know, like I grew up in that generation where it was like, hey, you know, and excuse my language, but it was more so like, hey, bitch, go do this. And it's just like, oh, my God, man, like, you know, you ain't got to talk to me like that, but whatever, you know, I'll accomplish it, corporal, I'll accomplish this arm. And I understand the environment that we currently were in. You see what I'm saying? And I understand the difference between democratic and autocratic leadership styles where it's this this firm, firm leadership style where it's like, you know, I can't explain to you the why. Just understand that we have to do it. But at the exact same time, if you can't explain the why, then you don't understand why we're doing it. And that, yeah. and, and that's. You about to you about to take it or. Yeah. So go ahead, on, take it on to the point that you're saying. Right. I, I think that it's 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 also it, it's also, we have to be able to explain to our Marines and, and to people, right? Even just using the civilian aspect, right? Because I'm, I'm a civilian as well. I, I work in civilian work. There, there has to come <coughs> to people understand that a why isn't always needed. You, yeah. if, if, but now listen, this is what I'm saying. If I understand you as a leader, if I understand your why from the beginning, then I'm going to follow you. And then when those times come where we don't have time to talk about the why, I'm not going to need to know the why because I believe in your why. I believe in our why. So, but can I just interject for one second? Yeah. Just one second because it just hit me. You see what I'm saying? Because a lot of times like when we assume like, you know, like when we're explaining the why, I think we take the organic idea of what communication actually is. You feel me? Yeah. Like a lot of people always assume that, you know, hey, Bennett, you know, I need you to go take care of this situation because of this. Or, hey, we have this going on, so, hey, I need you to go over there with so-and-so to go take care of this. Organically, I've already explained the why to you. You know what yeah. I mean? And I've already given you the buy-in. I think a lot of times people hear, like, oh, the why is, is that, hey, Ben, and I need you to go take care of this tasker. And then now you're looking at me, why? That actually does not happen. Yeah. That part, I mean, unless it has happened to you, but I've never gotten that where it's this. Yeah, exactly. And I'm a maintainer by trade where I have to task Marines out on the floor, on runs, you know, different locations. And never has it been this moment where it's, hey, so, hey, Andreas, I need you to take, you and Arias are going to second maintenance battalion to go take care of this situation. They don't look at me and say, why? I'm already leading with the fact that, A, y'all are already tracking. We got this piece of gear down over at Second Maintenance. Andreas and Arias, y'all are leading the front on this. So y'all need to, y'all are going to be team one. You know what I mean? I think, like, that's the part right there, Dad. There's always that gray area of what organic and non-organic communication is. When you're organic and you're, you're transparent with your Marines, you're going to have that why already. Exactly. And that's where people fail, right? It, it, it's yeah. that what you're talking about already is that you've already labeled out your expectations for your Marines. Your Marines already know. And that's again, why we have in briefs and we have out briefs and Marines are already tracking on who staff Sergeant Thigpen is and what mm -hmm. he expects. They already know your expectations, right? Mm -hmm. But that's why it's important though, when we bring, you know, begin with the end in mind, right? That's, that's what um, Simon Sinek talks about. And, and it's an important, thing because people need to understand that from the jump right so when we get our new junior marines and we explain to them the bigger purpose of the why and yeah. and, and because that's the thing too is you gotta think about it man like when you were a junior marine a lot of times you didn't know what the hell you were doing for five for like for three four years you were like yo why do we do this all you're well, doing is just receiving commands and executing. Yeah, and, and it's yeah. like, well, we do it because I was told to. And, and it's like, well, but why do we do it, though? And then even like, you know, in Motor T, right? And the, when we talk about preventative maintenance and we talk about checks and balances, you know, there's people that just don't understand the why behind why we do it. And, and especially in a climate where now we're not going off to war and we're not doing things and we're in a peacetime Marine Corps. If we don't explain to these Marines, hey, this is why we do these checks. Hey, this is why we do 
you know, fives and 25s. Hey, this is why we do this. Then they're not going to take the training as serious because they don't understand the why of the, and they've never needed to see the why, right? Yeah. And, and that's, that's the biggest the, one right there is that a lot of us, a lot of, a lot of the people that we're having right now, they don't, they have not seen the why. You know exactly. what I mean? We can only tell them, we can only tell them so many stories. You know what I mean? And I remember my, my mentors used to do that. Hey, you know, this is what's going on. This is why y'all need to do it. And be like, this. all right, man. I mean, once again, we're maintainers. What happened to you ain't going to happen to me. And then sure enough, when I deployed, it happened to me. And I'm like this. Oh, my God. He was right. You know, so like preparing them for it, you know, preparing them for something that may or may not happen is always going to be that biggest challenge. Yeah. And, you know, as we come to a close on this part of the conversation, you know, I just really feel like, you know, one of the biggest things is that as we sit back and adapt to this new this new environment of leadership and this new environment or new generation of Marines, you know, one of the biggest things that you have to realize is that the information is always going to be out there. You know what I mean? Like and the Marines are tracking that this information is also out there as well. And if you choose to not adapt, even if you do have a great opinion towards something. Because it's 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 a generation behind, three generations behind, and you're not making any you're not making any strides to to adjust. Every time you give an opinion, it's going to come out almost ignorant because yeah. you're not tracking the environment and you're not reading the room that you're no longer in. You think the room's the same when the room has already changed in front of you. Now, the other thing that you had said, you know, or what what, what was brought up was about platform. And it's weird, man. You know what I mean? Like, because you know what's so crazy, bro, is that I've I've accepted the fact that I have a platform. I've I've already accepted because coming into the situation, I was like this. I don't want to be a social media influencer. I don't want to be a military influencer. I ain't like that. You you know what I mean? I'm in the trenches with y'all. But but the reality is, is that we were influencers before we even got on social media. Amen. So why is it that we're not, you know, why why don't we just accept the fact that we're influencers now? So for me, it's like, I know that I am, right? I know that yeah. I have influence, right? And I think it's because we put the word influence in, in, in a higher bracket of what it really is, right? Because no matter where we go in life, we're always influencing something, right? Ourselves, yeah. people, you know, people that we don't even meet, you know, people that we don't even know or speak to are influenced by what we wear, the way we dress, the way we walk, everything, right? So we're constantly yeah. big influencers. My thing is, is that like, I just want to make sure that people understand that like, the reason why go ahead and say it. The, the the reason why the reason why because I get a lot of hate, bro. I get a lot of hate for my content, for the conversations that I have, especially like on my recruiting duty podcast. So a lot of people got stuff to say, and and I'm always just like, bro, like I don't get paid to do this. This is complete. Like I, I don't got a subscription fee. Like I don't got nothing. Like this is just my thoughts on everything. So like that's why I always want to people to understand that like. I am who I am. And when you meet me in person, that is who I am. And, and a lot of people, and that's why I say that because there's a lot of influencers out there who are not who they are in person. And, yeah. and, when you, and, and especially when it comes to military influencers, like mm -hmm. you have these people who have this huge persona about being, you know, this person or this leader, or they'll talk about leadership in this, all this altruistic way. And then all of a sudden you'll meet them and you'll be like, bro, that's not my gunny. Like, that's not him. Like, that wasn't you this morning at 11 a.m. Like, that wasn't you <coughs> at the creation. And, you know, and that's why for me it's like, you know, I'll be honest. Like, bro, I'm, I, I don't have – I've never ran a first class PLP, you know. But that's why on my Instagram I'm knocking out pull-ups every day. I'm knocking out push-ups every day because I know that I need to grow and I need to be better. So I'm like, you know what? Why not? Why not just show people that you know what I'm moving towards something better, and I'm reminding myself of that, you know. So that's really what I'm saying is that like I just I hate being put into a box. I hate being identified as anything. Like I hate being like <coughs> I'm with me and that's it. So that's why I hate like I know that I have a platform, and I have to remind myself of that and what I say and how I say it. Um, but that's what it is: is that with a, with a platform comes responsibility and you have to watch what you say and, and pay attention because things can always be misconstrued i agree i agree i think one of the biggest things man and i'm just not even about to lie to you you know it took me a minute to accept the fact of being a military influencer or essentially even having a platform on social media is because look at the way that we talk about military influencers you know look at the perception that's, that is associated with it 
You know, we can say whatever we want, but when we think about like social media influencers, man, it's always this negative and uh, um, this negative um, aspect to them. You know that a lot of the, like a lot of people uh, perceive like, oh, well, he's just he's he's just leading like that for likes. You know what yeah. I mean? He's just yeah. leading like that for views. He's just saying that for views. But you know, once again, both parties, both of us. You know what I mean? Like, well, we're not doing this shit for for any like. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not getting paid to do this. You know, Bro. and on top of that, you know, like think about before I even talk about us, think about the people who have used this platform to essentially, you know, propel themselves or finesse the people around them. You know, like you 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 hear about people that's like this, hey, you know, I'm so and so, come buy my fucking um my meal plan or come buy my workout plan, use my code, you know what I mean? Here's how to um here's a workout plan so that way you can crush boot camp. And you're essentially taking a van. You know who I'm talking about. You know exactly who I'm talking about, too. Woo. You know what I mean? The beast. And, um, oh, you know, bro. yeah, I'm tracking. You tracking and I'm tracking. Bro. But but look how many people gravitated towards him. And look how many people essentially, you know, bought that plan. We both knew that it was bullshit. We knew it was bullshit. Every Marine in the fleet knew that it was bullshit. You know, you know what I mean? Oh, 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 I'm going to say on that, not mentioning no names. But you know what the worst part about that whole situation was, because I have this conversation all the time, is the Marine Corps Recruiting Command was pushing it. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. Like, they were literally pushing it. They were literally, yeah. like, poolies were all about it. And they were like, oh, I'm going to go. And then this dude, like, skyrocketed. It, and it was like, bro. And that's yeah. where the and – that's, and that's the thing, man, is that, like, listen – in today's day and age, is very. I was having this conversation about somebody else the other day. The other day, somebody, an older Marine, was like, "You know what I find crazy?" He's like, "I see all these Marines on social media, and they're, you know, redcon, first form, you know, all these different things, get my code and all this stuff." And he's like, "You know, I'm not gonna knock the hustle." He is. He's like, "It's it is what it is." He was like, "You know," but a, a big part of it is that, you know, and I agree with him is that we forget that. Especially if you have a whether or not, and people may a lot of people are going to disagree with me on this. If you have one post in uniform on your Instagram, no matter what branch you're in, you are now an influencer for that military branch. Yeah, the moment you have one post in uniform, you're that is no longer your personal Instagram because now everything you do, say positive, negative, is going to be. Bring light towards that organization, whether you want to believe it like that or not. And 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 that's the, and I say this because even myself, I've been convicted lately of what I post. And I'm like, hey, does this bring light to the Marine Corps? Should I really post that? Should I really post this? Because in, in a society in which we live in where, you know, the military is hurting. Right. And everybody wants to constantly look at, hey, the right and the wrong. I'm like, okay, you know what? I don't want to give people a reason to not enjoy the Marine Corps or whatever. And I don't want to put my push my views on this position and it's not right for me to do so. So that's why I'm, I'm very careful with what I, I'm posting and stuff. Because again, like we are a representation of the Marine Corps. And I think one of the biggest, you know, I don't mean to interject on that, but it's just, you know, like when, and I think that's one of the biggest reasons why, like, a lot of people tend to hate military influencers. You, you see what I'm saying? Or why, like, a lot of military influencers will receive a lot of hate from, especially their own. Like, that's that's who really is, bro. It's it's always us. It's always us hating us. You know what I mean? Like, and 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 that's the crazy part about it. Before I even go and say what my 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 statement is. It ain't some kid in fucking college. You know what I mean? It ain't some random guy like in Wisconsin fucking sending me like these like angry. It, it's it's somebody that probably has seen me on a base before, walked by me. You know what I mean? Like we both stood on the same yellow footprints just at different points in our lives. You know what I mean? It's our own that have that that say the words. And I understand, you know, and I understand the frustration because imagine somebody else representing you. Or imagine having somebody else represent you. You feel me? Imagine like, you know, somebody and that's exactly how it, it, it ends up getting taken, especially if you do it in uniform. You know what yeah. I mean? Now you re you represent the entire, you know, military and some posts are cringy. I'm not about to hold you up. You know, I'm not, I'm not about to sit here and lie. 
Everybody ain't speaking that good stuff like we speaking it on a regular basis. Ain't nobody serving our community a purpose. A lot of people get on here and they, you know, they do like a little quick little TikTok dance. I ain't going to knock you. You know what I mean? You 6'2", 200 pounds of bodybuilder pop locking on the internet. I ain't going to hold you. I ain't going to hold you. You know what I mean? But at the exact same time, you know, that represents me now. Now people assume that that's me. That's what we be doing. You know what I mean? And now, yeah. like, you know, the public has this perception, and that's very frustrating for a lot of people. So yeah. then when they see us, you know, and we could be talking about, you know, a conversation just like this, yeah. and you will look up on it. Just recently, I got a comment up under mine, and it said, it, it was about, uh, you remember that video that I post about uh, take care of the top tier performers? Yeah. I'm speaking from a perspective, like, and a lot of people, and that's another thing is, is that as a military uh as a military influencer, you have to choose how you're utilizing your platform and, and, and how you are serving your community. You know, I chose to share my practical experiences and my personal, my practical thoughts and my personal experiences. But I also am sharing a lot of other people's personal experiences that won't hop online and say it. So I'm sharing theirs as well through my own words. So I'm telling a story through my words, but it's, it's not I'm telling it. I'm telling someone else's story through my words. And somebody is like this. I bet you he's S1 or supply. And I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, man, man, that's the furthest thing from the truth. That's the furthest thing from the truth. But it's just like, bro, what 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 makes you say something like that? You know, it, what is you know, the problem? Is too, you know, what the problem is, too, is that, that that conversation comes up and it's like, oh, OK, you know what? So that S1 Marine, that S3 Marine, that admin Marine, that supply Marine. Oh, yeah. He, he doesn't matter because he's the he's that MOS because he chose that because the Marine Corps did. He don't write. Yeah, he doesn't so rate. You get, like, yeah, he doesn't rate. Like, bro, it's like, stop with that. And that's what we're talking about this whole entire thing, bro. Yeah. It, it's like, all of a sudden, because of your job title, you don't matter, right? Yeah. And it's like, bro, if we look at this at, like from a civilian perspective, do you think that people sit around the table and they say, oh, you know what? Hey, hold on. That guy works in... So- that guy works in the administration part department. We're not going to take what he has to say for granted. Like, what? No, people. Like, stop. And you and that's I mean? everybody. Everybody has something to say in value. But it's like what you're talking about too is that how our own people kind of come at us, bro. I had um, we were doing a training at my unit, and I walk into the room. I was. I'll be honest. I was five minutes late, and the reason why I was late was because I had just told someone just said, "Hey, get upstairs." So I didn't know I had to be there. So like, last hey, minute. Up- yeah, they're like, hey, get upstairs, all staff and officers. I'm like, all right, tight. So I walk into the room, and the person who's given the period of instruction turns around, and he's a mass sergeant, and he's like, oh, he goes, the famous recruiters in the room. And I sit down, and I'm like, I don't know who this man is, and I don't know what he's – I'm like – and I clearly he's talking about my podcast or whatever. And I'm like – and I'm in my head, I'm like, why is this dude coming at me like this? I don't even know who he is. Mm-hmm. And then – Lo, lo and behold, he comes up to me at the end of the, at the end of the presentation, and he's like, "Yo, you don't remember me, but me and you talked over at Facebook like a two, a year and a half ago about this, this, and the third. And I was like, "Okay," and I was like, "What was the purpose of you like doing that? Like, what did that do for anybody?" And he goes, "Now I got people looking at me like, what, like what?" And and the reason why I bring this up though is because like me and this dude had this conversation, and I and I don't even remember or recall it, and but this guy felt the need to bring to highlight me in front of 45 different of my peers because yeah. I have a podcast and because I'm trying to better the Marine Corps, I'm trying to better the duty. And it's like, that's the thing about it is that, and now mind you, you know, and I know you've had this experience when you invite those people on the podcast, you're like, all right, Hey, you know what? You let's, let's talk about it. Like you, you have an issue with what I'm posting. Like, let's talk about it. Like, let's, let's, why don't you hop on and we can get your opinion out there. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm good, bro. And it's like, but that's the thing, man, is that like me and you where we, we, we saw a need and we're filling a need and we're having the hard conversations that other people don't want to have. And and like you said, speaking for a lot of people because there's a lot of people who who have a voice but they don't feel their voice matters or they're not ready to speak up. And and now the conversations that you're having, like oh bro, I find myself, I'll be real, man, like I find myself listening to your reels like over and over again because I get I get convicted personally by a lot of the stuff that you say. And and a lot of the stuff that you say, when I think about it and I look at my social media and I look at myself and I'm like, hey, 
You know, am I am I really living what I'm saying? Am mm-hmm. I am I living intentionally? Am I am am I being the staff sergeant that my Marines need me to be? Am I yeah. am I, and then I'm like, am I a Marine twenty four seven? Like all these different things. So what you say is a has a huge impact on other people, and that's why I think a lot of times too is it it also bro some of this stuff comes from a place of jealousy. A lot of people. Yeah. And I was going to talk about that. A lot of people would love to be able to get in front of camera and would be love to be able to be charismatic and would be able to love to do this, but they don't understand that. Right. And, you know, all in all, man, I think a a lot of what we're talking about, though, is personal growth. And when we from the beginning to the end where we're at now, a lot of people just don't understand that age old thing that's called corrective criticism. People Mm -hmm. are afraid of being criticized. And they don't welcome criticism. And and that's a huge, and especially, you know, some people that have been in the Marine Corps for a long time, you know, mm-hmm. or even people that are just, you know, just elders, even like elders in the church or whatever the yeah. case may be. Like there's people who just don't want to hear about, hey, you know what, the way you said that shouldn't have been said like that. And you could have said it this way. And, and that's the thing is that people do not want feedback. Right. People do not want positive feedback, reinforcement. People don't want that. And that's the problem is that we need that. And I think like just to go back to, you know, and I'll hit on two two things that you said, but just to go back to what you had said in the very beginning about what you say must have value. You know what I mean? And a lot of times, like, you know, like especially like the up and coming person who does have a brand or does have a podcast or does, you know, he may have something the moment that he puts it out there. Right. You know, he's he's already making a step that a lot of people do not want to make, because just like what you had said, you know what I mean, is that that's hard. You know, it is very hard to get on because you you have to admit that you're going to be vulnerable. You're going to be judged. You feel me like to share something that is to be transparent on a platform where a lot of people are not fucking transparent. They're very fake on this platform. You know what I mean? And to should be authentic is a very hard thing. And then now you're opening yourself up to criticism from all these other type of people. Now I'm going to speak it from two different perspectives. The first one I'm going to speak it from is the, is the criticizer. You know what I mean? You got to ask yourself, bro, like, are you bringing any fucking value to, to, to this conversation when you say what, whatever you want to say? You know what I mean? Like I, 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 one of my biggest pet peeve, and I'm just going to go ahead and just, Benny, I'm going to, I'm going to just keep be honest. I'm going to keep it a hundred with you. You know what I mean? My biggest pet peeve, is a old person on social media. 40 and over on social media is a bad, like that's a recipe for disaster with me. You know what I mean? Uh, now, now you add in prior service, you fit, you add in prior service. Now, now it's really about to be a recipe for disaster because what they're about to say for say to me is either going to go two ways. Either A, it's going to be something real sage and old and it's going to be good, or it's going to be some sage old and it's very bad. You know, and it's some heinous shit that they about to say to me. And and just recently, man, like I just had somebody get on there and they're like, Does you call yourself a staff and CO? <coughs> you call yourself a staff and CO. And I and once again, I'm 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 doing the best I can to paraphrase because what he wrote was at a third grade reading level. You know, so I'm already so, so I'm already doing him a you know a solid by right. adjusting his words. But he was like this, you know, me being in the Navy, you know, you will be on the beach while I'm sitting on my boat drinking my coffee in the Indian Ocean. And I'm like this, like, I don't know how this was supposed to make sense or how this was supposed to be like an insult to me, man. But I can already tell that your phone is very far from your face and you type that message with your index finger. I can tell. I can tell. You know, you, you, you know what I'm talking about when they, you know what I mean? Like, like, come on, get off the of social media, get off of social media. You know, and, and, and I say that because there's a lot of people that they just say things just for the sake of saying things or saying things because now they feel like they can be heard because either A, at their units, they were never heard or B, maybe they were heard while they were in the military. And when they transitioned out, now they have realized that society does not fucking hear them. And oh, now they constantly. Listen, yeah. Hey, yeah. careful, because people don't want to hear that, bro. People yeah. are ready for that. People are not you know ready. You know what I mean? Bro. People, I, I'll never forget, man. I heard, I heard this from a buddy of mine. This friend, but one of my really good friends, Frank. He worked, he worked on Wall Street, and um, his boss is the CEO of the company. Was a retired general, and he was an infantryman, and he literally very successful man, retired. And my boy Frank would say all the time that when they would have meetings at zero nine, if one person was late, 
he would stand up and be like, why are you late? And he would start scolding them. And, and finally someone was like, was like, sir, like we're not in the Marine Corps. Like, that's not like this isn't the marine corps anymore and 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 these people these civilians didn't care that he was a retired general they didn't care that he was a retired marine and that's the thing that people don't understand bro is that again value you have to have value in what you're saying and when you do not have value added no one cares your reputation no one cares where you came from no one cares Mm -hmm. where you serve no one cares when you serve People are going to thank you for your service because that's what the, that's what we're told to do. But how many times do people say thank you for your service just to shut you up and get you moving, bro? Like, bro, nobody cares that you served. Now, are we thankful? Of course. But, bro, that's it. It's dead and gone. Like, stop living in that age because, again, there's so many people that take the rank for granted and they take it and they use it to abuse their authority. And they say, and, and they, 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 they're not coming from a place of love. And they say, Oh, you're going to do this because I said, you're going to do this. And people don't understand that when you get out of, that's why I love the reserve program so much is because you're able to marry up life and you see how it's very drastically different between the two. And, and there's, excuse me, there's a lot of people that when they get out they don't understand that like bro in the civilian world no one's gonna do what you tell them to do just because you're this person like no that's not how it works like bro at five o'clock bro I, I, at 501 like you're bob like i don't care at 501 i'm walking out the door like we're good and i think and- like the biggest thing to it and I'm, i apologize for cutting you off man like I, I think like one of the biggest things is that echoes throughout this episode is the fact that you have to be able to adapt in different climes you know what i mean like you have to be able to adapt when you transition out man like you have to take into consideration that you you know like you spent 20 years you spent 10 years you spent 18 years you spent a, a big chunk of your life in one organization surrounded by like-minded individuals and you are either going to excel in one field or you are going to sink when you get out there if you do not know how to properly adapt. And that's one of the biggest things that, you know, like, and I feel like when we go back to the social media aspect of it, you know, my heart goes out to the people that drop the negative comments on, under my post because I know that it comes from a place of insecurity. I know that it comes from a place of feeling unheard. I know that it comes from a place of, damn, man, like, I got to get this off my chest because I can't say this in real life. I can't say it because I know for a fact you can't say it in real life. You know what I mean? Like, think about it. Like, you know, like if you ever look at a negative comment, ask, read it out loud. Read it out loud. You know what I mean? You know for a fact that he he wouldn't he wouldn't be able to say that out loud. You know what I mean? And it's because, one, he's not heard out there. He's not heard anymore. You know what I mean? And when they come online and they surround themselves around, they're like this. Oh, man, I'm back here. This is how we should be able to do it. Pack it up, Bob. You, you, you've been out for almost three years. You've been, all, been out almost 10 years. Adapt into your life. You know yeah. what I mean? So well, my, my heart always goes. Oh, go ahead. My biggest thing when it comes to stuff like that, man, is when people with comments like that about, especially when they talk about leadership in the Marine Corps currently, my biggest thing is, okay, so then why'd you get out? If you have so much to say about the Marine Corps, why did you get out? Why are you out? Well, I'm out because leaders like you. No, 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 no. Stop that. No, No, you're not. No, No, you're not. You you bro, stop. Stop blaming your leadership because of why you got out the Marine Corps. Because me and me and Meech can say the exact same reason why. Oh, I got out because of Gunny so and so. No, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. And the biggest thing, man. You got out because you you chose to. There's so many disgruntled people out there that were hurt by somebody, and it's like, bro, listen, at the end of the day, like, stop coming to people's comment section just because there's you. No one recognized you the rest of the day, and no one spoke to you all day. So now you're like, you know what? I gotta say something so I get somebody to fire back at me. You know, and I and think one of the biggest. Oh, my bad, my bad. Go ahead, go ahead, bro. Bro, I'm just like, I think, man, this this the biggest thing with all of this is again. Being able to understand, am I, when you speak, when you do, am I bringing value to the situation? Am I bringing value to my listeners, to the people that I influence? Am I bringing value to my family? Whatever whatever instance it is, ask yourself, am I of value? And how can I bring more value? And that's it. And if what you're going to do or going to say does not bring value, then don't even bring it to the table. 
You know, and that's a hard thing to swallow right there because a lot of people believe that they bring value no matter where they go. Even if they even if they know that they about to say some bullshit. You know, or let me rephrase that, even if everyone around them knows that they're about to say some bullshit, they may believe that. And I I will speak to the person who believes that, you know, we ain't doing our job. I'm I'm gonna speak to that person real quick because I feel like a lot of times, like, you know, when you created your podcast, you felt like there was a niche that needed to be filled. Yeah. When I created my podcast, I felt like, you know, we're talking about personal development, but none of this shit ever applies to the military member or the service member or the veteran. It never really applies to us. You know, it's always this general term that's like, oh, well, you know, think positive or here's some self-care tips. How does that apply to me? You know what I mean? Like, hey, talk about why, like my stressors in being in the military. So I created that for myself. And I will say to the person who feels like they're not being properly represented, I mean, ah, I will say this to the person who feels like they are not being properly represented. I will say this to the person who feels like, you know, these people on social media ain't talking about anything and I could do it better. If you think that you can do it better, if you feel like there is a void that needs to be filled and create it, you know, Maybe. so as we transition over into that, 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 you, I told you, man, like I'm a top tier podcaster. No, all right. I'm a top tier. That's a good transition. No, if you think that you can do it, then let's go do it, boy. Like, that's it. like if you listen, like if you, and that's it. Like, and that's like when I talk about like the specific things that I talk about on my podcast. Like, a lot of people get upset about my recruiting duty podcast. A lot of people get upset, and and I'm the only one. I am the only recruiting duty podcast out there. There's one other one that's made by a chief warrant officer. He got like 12 episodes. Not to throw shade at him, he's an active duty marine. I could totally understand it, but that's hard. Yeah. A lot of people see things differently than I do, and they like my perspective. But I will tell you that a lot of people that do not enjoy my content, and it's because a lot of it is pointing at them. And it's mm -hmm. saying, hey, we need to be better as a whole. And people don't want to hear that. The moment you start saying that we need to be better, people are like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. So. And I say that the biggest thing about that is, is that when, when you say that we need to be a better, be, be better, you know, it's always going to be accountability aspect. You know, everybody wants to hold everybody accountable, but nobody wants to hold themselves accountable mm -hmm. because self accountability is a hard pill to swallow. You feel me? Because you got to look into yourself in the mirror and say that you, you suck. You know what I mean? And, and we treat the word suck as if it's a period at the end of a sentence. Like that's, that, that's the end of it. That's not necessarily the end. There's still so much growth. Like you suck right now. You can grow. You feel me? So once you swallow that pill, then you have to be able to understand that you can grow. But when we talk about branding and we talk about just creating a platform or creating something for your community, especially if you feel like there is a void there, the military provides you with so many opportunities to be able to do that. Think about it. You know what I mean? Like how many times do you hear about somebody who is working at a job to fund what their hobby or to fund their dream or to fund or fund their niche? You know what I mean? Like, like, we're already in that position. You know, we're already in that position. We're already around the people who would, would essentially, we're already in that community. A lot of people have to build that community. A lot of people have to find that community. You're already in that community. Now, the biggest thing is, is that you have to realize is that this is always going to be a secondary. It's never going to be a primary until you actually transition out. And that is the reason why a lot of people hate a lot of military influencers. It's because we, military influencers treat, treat most, let me rephrase that. Not all, because me and you are both that, but most or the ones that a lot of people tend to see, it seems as if they treat social media, they treat the gym codes, they treat their workout plans, they treat their meal plans, they treat their, their hell, I even say it, their YouTube channel or podcast as if this is a primary, like this is their fucking MOS, you know, MOS 066666. You feel me? Like, you know, like, hey, you know, I'm about to go ahead and go do this, but that's not necessarily the case. You are still an active duty, active duty service member or a reservist. You know what I mean? Like you still have responsibilities. Yeah, man. And that's like, you know, me and you had that conversation, you know, a while back, you know, when, when you thought like, oh, I wasn't, you weren't dropping enough or you weren't doing enough. And I was like, bro, like you got to put it in perspective. Like you're an active duty Marine running, running McMap courses and running, you know, all this you're doing at, you're up at zero four in the morning doing all these crazy, you know, things and mm -hmm. tech. And, and, and you're doing all this stuff and you're leading from the front and you're leading Marines and you're doing all this. So it's very important that you got to remember that, you know, and, and, and the same thing for me, you know, I'm a reservist, but you know, there's other things that I got to do. I have a civilian job. I got a family. So I think it's all about perspective, man. It's all about perspective. It's all about, 
you know, th looking at yourself and saying, okay, what is the purpose of what I'm doing? What is the purpose of my brand? Where am I going with it? Where am I taking it? And, and how do I better those around me? Um, how do I bring value to those around me? Mm -hmm. How do I, you know, and, and am I representing, especially if you're in the Marine Corps, I don't, I'm not going to talk about other branches, I don't know it, but if you are currently serving in the Marine Corps, then you have to ensure that what you're doing represents the Marine Corps to the best and to the fullest, to the fullest, because a lot of people aren't doing that. And a lot of people are more focused on, oh, how many shares did I get? Or, oh, how many this did I get? And, oh, how many this did I get? You know, and it's and it's like, you know, there's an influencer that I'm that I'm not going to say his name, but this guy was on recruiting duty and he failed the duty, got off the duty. But <coughs> his Instagram went viral like this dude went crazy on Instagram. And and then all of a sudden people were like, OK, but what did you add towards recruiting duty? Like, did you mm -hmm. help the mission? Did you do better? Like you have this positive mental attitude on your Instagram, but in the office, you were like, what weighs me? Oh, this day sucks. And it's like, bro, so like, which one is it, man? And, and that's a big part of it, man, is like, if you're going to be one way on social media, be that way in real life. I cannot, you know, I, I couldn't stress that enough, man. Like, if you're going to be one way, are... I'm sorry, what, what what's that poster in the background right there? What poster uh, is that? This was made by it's a uh, it's called First. So the guy he was in, in the Marine Corps. He's now in the National Guard. Um, this is by First American Manga. Mm. Um, it is from the day that um, everything happened in Afghan, the withdrawal. So he yeah. saw this on the news, and he 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 makes anime, and he has anime comic books about the Marine Corps and stuff like that. So he saw this on the news, and he just made it and drew it up, and then I bought it from him when I got to meet him. That's so real nice, bro. Yeah, he, it's it's so amazing. Um, but yeah, he's on Instagram at First American Manga um, on Instagram. First American manga. I'm gonna track. I'm gonna check him out. And I, you know, going back to what it is, is that you know when we talk about value, bro. Like I think value is just echoing out throughout this episode. Is the fact that you have to realize that you bring you you have to bring value both online and offline. You know what I mean? Like I think that's one of the biggest things is that you have to bring value online and offline. So the same amount of value that you think that you're bringing online, you have to be able to switch gears and still be able to bring that at your shop. Ain't nothing worse than being one persona online and then people know you in real life and know that you're lying. You know what I mean? Like, ain't that is like when you take a step back and and, and once again, self-accountability is a hard pill to swallow because there's some people right now that be like this. I'm that guy both on and offline. No, you're not. No, you're not. I know you. I know you. I know how you yeah. are. You know what I mean? But when it happened to me, it happened to me as we come so close to this episode, you know, it happened to me at one point where I felt like the person that I was online and the person that I was showing up to in real life were not the exact same person. And when I realized that I stepped away from social media until I got my person back together, until I was good in real life. And I feel like that's the biggest thing is, is that knowing what's real and what's not real. This social media shit is not as... It, it's not, I will say that it is real because you still have the ability to affect somebody and to impact somebody, but also know that the other real, the real is the reality that you're currently in right now when you turn your phone off. If that person does not align with who you are when you log onto your Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn account, then you're already doing it bad. You can't fake it till you make it on here. There are people that will know, they do know who you are. There are people that will expose you. And not to mention, when you look yourself in the mirror, you know you you're lying your your, your reflection is looking back at you like this come on bro i see you dropping that motivational video but you you come on bro that's not who you are you know what i mean i see that you're making that recruiting uh podcast but we know how you were on that duty come on bro like like you can't lie to yourself and I feel like that's one of the biggest things. And that's what separates a lot of people from the good and the bad as we wrap up this episode is, is that the good ones know what's real and what's fake. And they know exactly who they are online and offline. And they tend to align. Yes, sir. But with that being said, as we come to a close of this episode, they don't know who we, they still don't even know who we are, man. So how can they find you, Benny? Like, where can they find you? What's the links? What's the podcast? Where, where go ahead. Let's close. Let's, let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Um, yeah. So you can find me, uh, I got a website, Semper Sometimes. <coughs> 
Semper Sometimes LLC.com. And then I'm on all platforms, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, uh, and it's just Semper Sometimes. And that's it. Okay. And once again, you can follow, you can find me at Meech Speaks, Meech Speaks on Instagram. Uh, me speaks on TikTok. Me speaks on YouTube. Me speaks is actually just my like. You can find me everywhere. You know what I mean? Like just by typing in Meech and speaks, and, and I'll be. A, <laughs> go to Google, type in Meech speaks, and all the links will uh, uh will pop up. We're both available on Spotify and iTunes. We're both available on Instagram. And just once again, please understand that me and Benny are on two different shows. Benny has his own show. Simper sometimes. Go ahead, show him the shirt. Go ahead, show them the shirt. Simple sometimes, you know what I mean? And and I also have my own show, Meech Speaks. Thank you for tuning in. We greatly appreciate y'all.